ladies, Hi. ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. We are your hosts, the MCs, for this wonderful event. Can we give a round of applause to get the energy going? Yes. Woo! Yes. So my name is Lani Olazaba. I'm a senior manager of talent acquisition here at LinkedIn. And in LinkedIn fashion, we always say something that's not on our LinkedIn profile. So I am one of six sisters raised by a single mama. So I'm used to being around strong women, but not this many strong women. Yes. That got me a little intimidated yeah. and excited at the same time. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Amanda Green. I am a client solutions manager in the marketing solutions business here at LinkedIn. So great to have you guys all here today. So great to be here. Something that's not on my LinkedIn profile. So I went to a HBCU. Any HBCU grads in here? I need ya. Awesome. Um, well, I went to college and I actually competed and won a pageant when I was in school. So something that's not, I might need to put that on my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> yeah, now that I think about but it. I have I that. <laughs> great to have you guys here today. We have a few housekeeping items. Also, we have employee resource groups here at LinkedIn, and I am grateful to be also co-chair of our Latino ERG group. Hola, is any holas in the house? Yeah. Hola! Gusto verte, gusto verte. <laughs> All right, and she's bilingual, y'all, make note of it. <laughs> so the event is being live streamed on the web, so stand up, sit up straight, smile. <laughs> um, we also have a hashtag. The hashtag is transform her capital H-E-R, 2019. And we're gonna go through the agenda in a moment. Restrooms are located in the outside. You can go out on both sides here, okay? And then Wi-Fi, for those that are looking for Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi password is LinkedIn Guest. Amazing, so just to run through our agenda really quickly, we have a welcome by Ms. Ty Heath. Um, we're gonna have a keynote by our very own, LinkedIn's very own, Rosanna Deruthi. Um, we have a keynote by Ms. Brittany Oliver. We will have um, Karen here, who's gonna be talking about some LinkedIn product and features. Uh, we will have a break. I know you guys are probably looking at the agenda like, ooh, it's kind of a long day. But it's going to be <laughs> valuable. You're gonna enjoy yourself, but we will you give you guys a break. Um, we'll have a fireside chat. We have a couple awesome panel discussions. Um, and then Lonnie and I actually will be giving you guys some tips for building your brand on LinkedIn, so wait for it, sugar. Um, we have another fireside chat. Um, and then we're gonna be ending the day with another panel discussion and a great ending keynote speech. And make sure you guys stay to the end because we will be having network networking on the third floor. There will be a DJ, drinks, and food. So I expect to see everybody there. Um, and make sure during the breaks you guys meet people, shake people's hand, you know, make a new friend, and connect on LinkedIn. Yes, awesome. So without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing our welcome speaker. She is the co-founder of Transform Her. She is the former head of the Black Inclusion Group here at LinkedIn. She was there when I started, so I got a real good intro. She was named one of the top 25 influential women in digital marketing. She's a world record holder, y'all. She used to run track for Nike. Very snatched. She, um, <laughs> very snatched. She recently spoke at the Ghana Tech Summit, which I think is awesome. So she's not just confined to the US, she's very international. Okay. <laughs> I love her, I need her, and I gotta have her. Please welcome Miss Ty Heath, y'all. Come on up, girl. Love you back, and I need to hire her, right? She is like my personal advocate over here. I love you, and thank you so much. So. As you heard, I am one of the co-founders of Transform Her, global lead of market development for LinkedIn Marketing Solutions, and had the honor of being one of the presidents of LinkedIn's Black Inclusion Group. And it was such, thank you so much. It was a real honor. So I wanna share a few things with you. I was talking with these two lovely women, Lonnie and Amanda, yesterday, and they asked me, why did we found Transform Her? What, why did I, take a step forward to put on this event. And it really boils down to two things. So first, I'm a teacher at heart. I believe that information is a catalyst for transformation, in particular for communities that don't have access to information that results in people and those communities being left behind. So I'm all about that, passionate about education. Secondly, because we can, right? 
I, I'm not just speaking for myself, I'm speaking for the entire Transform Her team when I say we have a sense of responsibility to give back. We have an amazing space, we have the platform, we have the resources, why not direct that energy into this important conversation? How do we advance women of color and allies? So that's what it's all about. And I also wanna start by expressing my gratitude. All of you showed all the way up. If anyone had any doubt about the interest in this conversation of advancing women of color and allies, I think the room here answers that question. They just need to look at the room and also the live stream. So welcome to those of you on the live stream as well. My co-founder Ezra Zimbler is on there and I'm excited uh, with him and our Transformer team to bring you an amazing event today. So, if I can get my slides to cooperate. Okay, what will you create? All of us have the power to create, and the question is, what will you do with that power? As women of color, we face a lot of different obstacles. I know, happen, happen to be one. And we, we ain't got time to talk about all of those challenges, but what we can, right? But what we can do is acknowledge them and look forward and ask ourselves the question, what's possible? And how do we get in action around the solution? So I wanna invite all of you to do that today, to commit to doing something different as a result of having been here that will change the trajectory of your life. So if this stage is an impact meter, and over here is you do nothing after having come here, this is not where I want you to be, I need you to be over here on 1000, right? You're gonna do all of the things to change your life uh, and take it to a new level after the event. So I'm gonna go on a limb and say, everyone in this room accepts the premise that being inclusive is the right thing to do. But diversity is also beneficial to business bottom lines. Businesses that invest in diversity are 35% more likely to have returns above the national average, they are 20% more innovative, and there's 30% less risk. So put differently, it's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Does anyone wanna get this money, right? <laughs> I'm trying to get this money. And so the path to equity for women of color is not a simple one, but we're gonna invest in two paths at Transform Her. One, I wanna first start by talking to allies. Allies, we can't do this alone, we need you. Allies are leaders of the future that recognize that leadership means being able to invest and unlock the potential of diverse teams. Allies also recognize that overcoming bias is not a one-time thing. It takes repeated and concerted effort. You have to work at it, you have to go to the gym like Serena, right? Like you're trying to win the Grand Slam. That's how you have to go after overcoming bias. And I also wanna acknowledge that our allies are also on a journey of their own, one that's often an uncomfortable one. But those allies who choose to take that journey on, you are building the future that is much brighter, right? And so thank you so much for joining us in this conversation today. We really appreciate you, allies. I wanna also talk to my women of color. Women of color in the room. <laughs> yes, you are, we are here, we are here. And so I wanna point out research shows that one of the fastest paths to equity is to have people of color and women of color in positions that make decisions, positions of power. When we are in those positions, we invest in more inclusive spaces. So we can no longer wait to be invited to sit at the table. We have to create our own tables, tables where everyone can belong. So I'm inviting you to invest in that today with everyone in the room. And we have an amazing set of speakers to help us with that today. I'm so excited to hear from Carolyn Clark, our keynote speaker. She is the Chief Brand Officer of Black Enterprises Women of Power Summit. So can't wait to hear what she's sharing. And we're also at LinkedIn, where LinkedIn, we have a mission to invest in opportunity for all professionals. One of the most powerful things you'll take away from your time here is the powerful connections you'll make with each other as you go forward on that journey. And we'll also be sharing some tips on how you can take advantage of the platform to accelerate that. So with that, 
last year, we did not come to play. So this is year two of Transform Her. People invested in themselves. They created new partnerships. They started new businesses. They left their jobs, went to new jobs. They followed their passions. I expect the same for this audience, and in fact, I expect more. So let's get into it. Now with that, I want to introduce someone who I adore, someone who's an inspiration to myself and many others, our head of diversity, inclusion, and belonging, Rosanna Dorothy. Hold on to that. Good afternoon, amazing women. Good afternoon. And our allies. So I'm Rosanna Duruthi. It's a real pleasure to have this space, this very brave space, to speak to you from. And I call it a brave space because as women, we understand the context of resiliency. We've been dealing with the no's that the world offers us when we endeavor to be greater, when we endeavor to take on something that others may, may believe isn't for us. But, as we think about up-leveling ourselves and up-leveling society and our communities, this is a little bit of an invocation for how we're going to be braver when we leave here today. Um, I have the good fortune to work with this amazing woman, Ty Heath, and we get to have these little conversations about what we're going to create. And I'm proud of what is Transform Her, because Transform Her is transforming all of us. To cause our communities to be bigger bolder, more present, more alive, more vibrant, particularly in times when we sometimes feel like we're being a little suppressed, like all the work that we've done is being pulled back, like opportunity might be a little further out of reach. And yet it's not. I want you to consider for a moment that at one point there was a little girl who had a dream, and whatever that dream was, whether that dream was to play baseball, as was my dream when I was a little girl, or the dream was to be a doctor, the dream was to be a lawyer, to be a business professional. She took on journeys in education, in being a daughter or a sister or a friend or that person in the family who takes on a little more responsibility to make life easier for the family, became that individual who pursued her education and sometimes was challenged by how would you continue that journey? Would there be enough money? Would there be enough time? Would there be enough support? Would there be opportunity? And yet, when we think about it, it's a story that we all experience. It's not a story that is beholden to how much money we have or don't have. It's a story beholden to what's expected of us or what we want for ourselves. And there was a moment when you stepped out and took that next step and you did something that perhaps others didn't expect of you. Was there a program that you decided you would go for? Or that job that you really dreamed of taking on? Was there a school you wanted to apply to or an industry that you wanted to be a part of? And we all come here to this experience bringing those hopes and dreams, some fulfilled, some still waiting in abeyance. And I, my expectation, I was gonna say my hope, but hope's not a strategy. <laughs> my expectation is that together we're gonna to cause something that really is a new space for your greatness. So I want you to summon that dream, whatever that dream has been, and have it sit right on your lap as we have this conversation. Because this is a conversation about not only the bravery you've had, and the bravery you will have, but what you expect to create for yourselves, not what you hope to create. There's tremendous power in language, and sometimes we think bravery looks like the person who runs into a fire to rescue a child. Or bravery is the work of first responders when things are really rough. But bravery is sometimes just the power to wake up one morning after a great disappointment has occurred. You know, that disappointment may have been you lost your job the day before. That disappointment may have been 
that you have to take on a new obligation or responsibility for the family that you are anticipating. That disappointment may be the disappointment of feeling like, where is my community? Why do I feel so alone in this journey and in this path? And I think for many of us who are here in Silicon Valley, as often as the case is women, and as women of color, sometimes the disappointment is a disappointment of onlyness. Why am I the only one? The only one in the room, the only one on my team, the only one in the department, and sometimes the only one in the building who looks like me, who possibly feels this way. And in reality, I think what we recognize is we're not the only ones. There are many of us here, and many more who continue to enter today. And the power of being the first, the power of being only, is that you're now creating the space for another. So brave spaces create room for others to come and be themselves too. Brave spaces are also about finding your authentic voice when you walk into that room. To not have this conversation in your head where you're second guessing whether you sound confident enough, whether people want to hear what you have to say, whether they're really listening to what you said, and whether they'll act on it. It's not just to have a voice, but to have a voice that actually inspires others to act as well. And we all have these conversations. Some people may call it imposter syndrome, where we think, did I say it well enough? Was it clear enough? Did it impact enough? Does it resonate? And there are times when we may feel like what we're saying isn't making a difference. But I think much like the butterfly effect, each and every one of us and each and every one of our intended actions and the actualization of those actions are making a difference. Sometimes you don't see it in the immediate moment. Bravery is about taking the action even if there isn't immediate proof that that action made a difference. Because the actions you take are not for yourself. The actions you take are for the community of us who together are making change happen. Bravery is sometimes standing in the face of no at work when you have a dream of the job or the role you'd like to take on and you don't quite know how to get to it. Anyone ever have the experience of going to school, studying really hard, getting a great job, but thinking this isn't what, quite what I signed up for and not knowing how to get to the next step. How many of you by a show of hands? That's a powerful journey. Because somewhere along the line, someone told us, if you study hard and you work hard, you're going to get a good job and everything's going to turn out all right. And sometimes, even though we're really grateful for everything we've got, it feels a little bit like this isn't quite what I thought it would be, and it's not quite what I want. And that's OK. This journey of bravery is about learning. It's to not be afraid to change, to not be afraid to allow your experiences to transform what you think and what you want. It's to be willing to own your feelings about it. Don't let anyone tell you it's right or wrong or not. You are who you are, and you feel what you feel. But the power of bravery is also to own those feelings, not to let those feelings get in the way of who you really see yourself as, not to let those feelings get in the way of what you really want for yourself. And I think as women, we often come together and we not only support each other, every now and then we do have our pity parties. I certainly rely on my girlfriends for pity parties. Most of all, I rely on my wife for my pity party. And she is ruthless. She doesn't let me have one for very long. She literally <laughs> times it. Um, and it's actually probably a real gift that she does. Because we're so powerful that the same way we can summon up all of the frustrations and all of the emotions that come when things don't turn out as we expect, we have the ability to take that energy and channel it into the things that we really want. And we've learned through this journey that bravery requires inviting others along for the ride. We were probably told as we were growing up, you're really smart. You can figure it out for yourself. No one needs to know about your business and never let them see you sweat. 
That was great advice when we were children. But as grown women, it doesn't work so well. I do sweat a lot. And people see it. I am smart, but I'm not smart enough. Not smart enough to deal with the things that life throws at you that you don't have the experience for. And certainly, when people don't know who I am, what I've learned is they make up all sorts of stories about me. And most of it isn't even close to being true. <laughs> don't let anyone own your story. Or worse yet, make up a story about you that's not true. Be that brave spirit who defines the space you walk, the conversations you have, and guards your words because your words become reality. Describe for yourself in conversations with others who you are. Because if they don't know, you're brave enough to tell them. Allow for yourself the possibility that being brave doesn't mean you'll have all of the answers. But as you share with others, what you create is the community that supports you, that stands strong for you when you feel weak, that holds you up when you feel like you're going to fall, and at a minimum, will make you laugh in moments when laughter needs to be found. Because this isn't all so serious. And we sometimes convince ourselves that we can't laugh because people will think we're not taking, our, taking the world seriously. The world's serious enough without us. It's OK if we laugh and have a good time while we're doing what we're doing. Life is too short for suffering. And it takes a brave woman to not suffer. I think it's important for us to consider that we walk in places as the first. And when we own that space, we have the ability to invite others. And sometimes we don't think we can. Certainly, when we come into a new company or a new experience, the greatest power we can operate from, the greatest bravery we can show, is to invite someone else and help them figure it out. And it doesn't mean that we figured it all out for ourselves. It means that we're willing to give to others because we've been given to along the way. And as I think a little bit about what it is to have gifts, um, I've been with LinkedIn for a year and a half. And in this work of diversity, inclusion, and belonging, we have traveled a road in that year and a half. Much of it has been about how we define what diversity is so that it empowers not just women and people of color, but so that it empowers white men too. Because in the lives that we live, it's big enough for all of us. It isn't a zero-sum game where one person's gain is going to be someone else's loss. And yet, all too frequently, we may find ourselves in conversations where we feel like the opportunity we seek is, is considered an opportunity someone else will not have. No, it's OK, because you as a leader create the space for someone else to win too. You as a leader are committed not only to your success, but the success that others can have for themselves. And there's a particular story in, in the Bible. Some of you may be familiar with the parable of the talents. And with talent as the number one operating priority of LinkedIn, I always like to summon this conversation. The idea that we have a gift, or in this case, a talent, which is a form of currency, is one where we get rewarded not for burying that currency, but for doing something with it for operating that currency, for actually putting it to work. So what's your talent? What's your keen ability? And rather than dreaming about it, how are you putting it to work? Sometimes it doesn't matter whether you're doing it for free or not. You know, maybe you're that trusted advisor to friends who's a particularly keen listener. How do you bring that into your work environment? Maybe you're a powerful writer but your role isn't one that requires your writing. How are you utilizing those skills after work hours? How are you utilizing those skills to teach others the power of conveying a message through writing? Or perhaps you're a brilliant mathematician. And how are you utilizing that skill not just for yourself, but to enable others 
to have access to overcoming their own fear of mathematics. And I say that because we often live a life of when I have, then I can be happy or free or glorious and generous with others. And yet all of those gifts exist in abundance right here, right now with each of you. There is no when I get there. Consider that you are each amazingly successful. I know that because you're here right now. I know that your success is not given by where you are, but by where you want to go. And I know that because you came to invest in yourselves this afternoon, invest in conversations that will enable you to create possibilities for yourselves. And I also know that who you are is a woman who leads in your community. Whether you're a woman of color or not, whether you're a woman who is a baby boomer like me, or actually at the very beginning of your career, you each have that gift of providing a space for someone else to see themselves, to see their potential, to see their greatness, and to put that greatness to work in the business environment, in the social settings, and in the communities that we come from. Now, bravery isn't something you get a badge for. Bravery is something that you get to see yourself and be yourself for. Bravery is that step that you take when the little voice inside your head says, no, no, no. And for some of us, bravery may be the step you take when your voice says yes all the time and isn't guarded in being able to reserve for yourself. I've been practicing a little bravery for myself of late. A bit of a people pleaser. That's my challenge in life. So saying no is really hard for me. People ask, and my immediate inclination is, sure, when? And I've learned that that sometimes doesn't allow the space or the time for the powerful me to take care of myself. And some of you may have a similar experience. We've been trained to say yes and please and take care of others, but we leave ourselves depleted at the end. Sometimes bravery is about saying no. Because if you don't take care of yourself, it makes it really hard for the people you want to contribute to and provide to and to give to, to realize the full you. So think about bravery in three ways. What am I afraid of that I stop myself from doing? And step over and take the first step towards doing it. I'm not saying complete it, I'm saying take the first step. Second form of bravery, who am I afraid of having a conversation with? You know, some of us fangirl people, and we love to talk to them because we think we could learn so much from them or because they have insights they can provide us with, and we are waiting for that perfect opportunity. That perfect opportunity is the moment when you're in the same space with that person or when you can drop them a message on LinkedIn, or when you have the ability to you know, text or call. You determine that moment, and that moment is always a now. Be brave to reach out to someone that you've been meaning to talk to, want to talk to, feel that it's important for you to talk to. And the third way I want you to think about bravery and how you exercise your bravery is to take time each day at the very beginning to write with intention what you're going to create and at the end of the day to conclude with what you accomplished. We often stop ourselves and say, I didn't get much done today. But you'd be surprised by how much you accomplish every day that goes unacknowledged by you. And it takes a brave woman to stop and acknowledge herself for her greatness, for everything she does and everything she doesn't do in every day that we live because it's a gift to wake up the next day and start all over again. So I'm looking forward to meeting some of you amazingly brave women. And I want you to take this afternoon and enjoy the brave souls who are going to come up here and share their wisdom, their insights, their knowledge, because I think they too are committed to the greatest you can be and you have the power to summon that person and create that powerful being. 
So have an amazing afternoon. Thank you so much. So next. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I just want to take a second to reflect on a few things that uh, Rosanna said that resonated with me and I'm sure a lot of you guys when she talked about, you know, your parents tell you get a good job, make good money and you'll be successful and then you get into the workforce and it's like, okay team, this was not what I planned for. I mean, I still have moments like that and I'm still pretty young in my career. So thank you for sharing that, Rosanna. Um, I also love her three considerations for being brave. As women, women of color, um, being brave is an everyday struggle. So I reinforced that challenge to make sure that you take, a, take time at the end of your day to ask yourself, like, what have I accomplished? Give yourself some credit because we don't give ourselves enough credit. And remember that be courageous is not something that we just say that we actually have to live. So thank you, Rosanna, for sharing that. Um, so I would say her keynote is a, it's perfect timing because who I'm about to introduce next is the founder of Lemons to Lemonade. Has anyone heard of online publication Le Lemons to Lemonade? Well, Lemons to Lemonade is an online platform where tips and um, techniques are shared with millennials to help us, because I'm a millennial myself and it is a struggle. <laughs> um, she provides tips and resources to help us move through some of life's challenges, which I very much appreciate. Um, she's also a contributing writer for Forbes magazine as well as Essence magazine. Um, she'll be here to speak to us today about becoming an expert in your field. So without further ado, please help me welcome Miss Brittany Oliver. Hi everyone. <laughs> Are you enjoying yourself today? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm Brittany Oliver, and I am the founder of Lemons to Lemonade. I create content and events to help millennials, specifically millennials of color, um, turn their career obstacles into lemonade. So I'm really excited to be here. This is my second year participating with Transform Her. Thank you, Ty. Thank you, Isra. Um, for inviting me back. And so today, we're going to talk about building your expertise. But before we get started, I want to get social with you all. Um, so you can follow me on Twitter, Brit underscore S underscore O, Instagram at BS Oliver, and LinkedIn, of course, Brittany Oliver. So we're going to talk about building your expertise. And for us women of color, it's so important right now. Why? Because we need more women of color in the C-suite, right? We need to get paid what we deserve. And of course, when corporate America lets us down sometimes, we need to be able to pay our rent, right? <laughs> So we're going to talk about building your expertise, how to hone into that, and how to share it and build your brand. So some interesting facts about me. The reason why I started Lemons to Lemonade was because when I graduated um, from college in 2011, I moved to New York City, aspiring to be this PR guru, right? And little did I know that when I took my sixth internship, that after that internship would end, in an eight month period, I would go on over 100 interviews to try to get a PR job. That's 100 times someone told me no and rejected me. That was 100 times that I was made to feel like I wasn't good enough. And that was 100 times that a job role missed out on me, right? <laughs> they missed out on my talent, all the, the good you know, it's ideas and goodness that I have in me. They missed out on that. So I knew then that I was going to have to create my own opportunities. I knew that my trajectory wouldn't be like everyone else's. You know, I read all the magazines and articles. I listened to alumni from my school, and they said, get your internships, network. But my career trajectory wasn't going to have an easy route. I wasn't going to, my plan A wasn't working out for me. 
So I had to create something else for me. And that was how I honed into my expertise. And that's how I'm standing in front of you right now. So one of my favorite PR um, gurus, uh, brand strategist, Amanda Littlejohn, she shared with me that women of color, we cannot afford to be modest. We cannot afford to hide in plain sight. We have to get out in front with our branding because other people are able to earn more by doing the same work as us. So we need to at least try to level the playing field by making more noise about what we are capable, capable of and what we have already done and therefore what we can do. So why build your expertise? So as I told you before, I was in a hard road, you know, my career wasn't going anywhere and I had to create that for myself. How many of you have experienced a layoff, right? I'm not afraid to say it. In May, I was laid off from my email marketing job. And guess what saved me? My expertise. I was able to keep money in my pockets because I used my writing ability. That's my skill set. I was able to get press in the media for knowing how to be a freelancer, knowing how to share tips on pitching yourself and getting your job and getting different jobs for writing. I was able to use my social media strategy skill set to work at conferences like the National Urban League and run their social media during their national conference. So those were ways that I was able to use my expertise to keep money in my pocket, right? Right now, the government shut down, right? People weren't able to pay their rent. Media right now, last week, a thousand, over a thousand people lost their jobs. Buzzfeed, HuffPost. And for women of color, people of color, they're gonna have a harder time bouncing back. I was on LinkedIn a couple of years ago, and a woman, you need to follow her, her name is Ify Walker. And her brand is Dear Black Women. And one day she wrote, Dear Black Women, your job search will be longer than just. And it spoke to me. Don't you just love when people write posts and they just speak to you? You're like, how do you know my life right now? <laughs> like, stop, you're yelling at me. <laughs> but that was what she did. And she broke that down. And it was so inspiring. I followed her and I sent her a nice note and I told her about my experience. And you know, she was able to take LinkedIn and create a, a brand, Dear Black Women, right? And she's using her expertise as a career consultant to help other women on that platform. So she's sharing that story and she's getting press and she's getting speaking engagements. And those things are important for building your expertise. So one thing that I want you to do today, either now, you can start doing it now, by the end of the day is I want you to hone into your expertise and I broke it down. So first, your expertise is your, pretty much your resume, your skill set. So for me, I'm a writer, I'm a social media strategist, I'm an ev event producer. I can do all of these things well, digital marketer. I can do all of these things well, right? So that's my expertise. Then I go into my demo. I'm a black, I'm a woman, I'm from the South, <laughs> um, I'm a millennial. So I'm breaking that down, right? And then next is your life experience. So my experience in my job search, going on 100 interviews, that's my experience and I'm willing and able to share that. You know, any experience that you have, you know, from me moving from Clarksville, Tennessee to New York and utilizing that, ex that experience and utilizing my expertise in writing, you know, how do you, how do you get a job when you move to another city? Or how do you network when you move to another city? Like just different things like that where you can highlight your expertise, your knowledge. 
And then lastly, your passion. What's your ultimate goal? For Lemons to Lemonade, my goal with Lemons to Lemonade was to provide content for other millennials of color. I don't want anyone to have to go through what I went through, right? So I'm sharing my expertise with, in writing, networking, to help other people. Also, Lemons to Lemonade has a component, L to L Mixer, so it's, it's, it's an event series. And last year, I was able to travel to different cities, and it was a really great experience. But it's a platform to, one, allow other people of color to see that on the stage, because a lot of conferences shut us out, right? So now, people of color, they can sit on stage and they can share their expertise. It's also a safe space for you all to communicate, you know, collaborate, talk about your career journey. Um, and get insight and tips. So that was my passion. And as a writer, you know, I write for Fast Company and Essence. I'm able to use my relationship with Essence and Fast Company to help elevate entrepreneurs who are women of color and give them opportunities to talk about their business and what they do. You know, so I'm paying it forward. I'm using my expertise to give someone else a seat at the table. And so think about your intent, think about your passion and your ultimate goal. And those are ways that you can help elevate your brand and your expertise. So the way you share your expertise. One thing is blogging, right? So you can create your own blog. You can use LinkedIn and share your post on there. I do that often. I don't know if you, when you go to my page, you'll see one of my most recent post, and it's doing really well. It's about um, social clout and money moves. So make sure you check it out. <laughs> but um, you can share on there. Um, you can also um, use Medium. And that, um, that corresponds with Twitter. From there, community building. You know, how are you involved at work? You know, are you involved with your ERG? Are you involved with different um, activities at your work? What about out, outside of work? Are you a part of association? There's Slack communities like MEM, uh, Minorities in Media, that I'm uh, involved with. And I'm there, I'm on there, and I'm able to share my content. I'm able to participate. And just being on those communities, you know, committees, anything, helps to elevate your expertise and your brand. Next, social media. A lot of people really, you know, it's so much more than followers, right? A lot of people aren't utilizing social media the right way. Um, last month, in less than two weeks, I was able to be featured in Refinery29 twice because I use social Twitter. Journalists are on Twitter, and they're, they're following the conversation. So join the conversations. Follow the right people so that you can engage and have opportunities. And that also is the same way for speaking engagements and press. Being part of the online conversations, what's trending, how does your expertise involve what's trending? Are you someone who's social media savvy and you have your spin on what went wrong or went right with the Fire Festival? It's trending now, right? It's the time right now to write about it, blog about it, talk about it. And the benefits of it. You know, you become a thought leader in your industry. You also make way to have leadership opportunities. If you write, for example, for your company newsletter or for your company blog, this has, the C-suite has eyes on this on your content. Now you have people talking about your work at work, right? And what you have to offer. You can create allies. You can create sponsors within the workplace. So when you're not in rooms, people can talk about you. And you also can use what you're doing online, outside of work and in work, to promote yourself during your review, to get the money that's on the table. Say, look, this is what I can do. Um, and to also get your promotion, right?
So just to conclude, remember that you can create your own opportunities. Little did I know that in 2011, I would go through 100 interviews. Because of that, I was able to create a brand from it. I learned so much from that experience. I networked my way to Essence, where I was around so many black women who were unapologetic about their past, their future, and their present. It inspired me. And I cre because of that inspiration, I wanted to create BrittanyOliver.com. I wanted to create the Lemon to Lemonade blog. And then I wanted to create the L2L -L Mixer. And I shared, um, two years ago, I shared my 100 interview story on LinkedIn. And it's received over 45,000 reviews. And now today, I sit here before you and I'm keynoting. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry. But that's truly limits to lemonade. So I just want you all to know that you can create your own opportunities. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Brittany, another round of applause. Very transparent, appreciate her sharing. Um, I, love, I love what you said, Brittany, about creating your own brand, finding your expertise, demographic, life experience, and passion. And I feel like that's particularly important for women of color because working in you know, corporate or tech, your day-to-day -day can be very discouraging. So I encourage you guys, keep the energy up and own your brand because sometimes you need it to keep you going, okay? Um, so next on the agenda, we are going to talk about features on LinkedIn, which I'm a little biased to because I'm a LinkedIner. Um, our next speaker is a Columbia University graduate. Any Columbia, any, is New York in the building? Yeah. All right now, <laughs> Columbia grad, um, she has three publications and one patent on her pedigree, and she also speaks Spanish. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the senior product manager here at LinkedIn, Ms. Karen Baruch. Hi. Uh, one little known fact about me is that if somebody else cries, I immediately cry, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> for a good start. Um, <laughs> so, uh, hi, I'm Karen. I'm a senior product manager at LinkedIn. Uh, I, uh, I lead LinkedIn salary, uh, and uh, I also work on job seeker growth, so making sure that people who are looking for jobs are able to find them on LinkedIn. Um, this is my personal mission statement. This is what I care about. This is what drives me, and this is why I ultimately chose to come to LinkedIn. Um, because I want to provide access to economic empowerment at scale uh, through data and technology. How did I get there? Uh, I started in New Jersey tap dancing and playing the cello, not at the same time. Uh, I then went to Barnard, uh, where I fell in love with economics. Uh, I was in a leadership program where I learned how to become a leader. Um, I worked at a tech startup where I realized that technology was cool when I was in college. I then moved out to San Francisco, where I learned what kale was, ate it for the first time. <laughs> I now have it with coconut oil. It's very good. <laughs> uh, I then, uh, I was working at Yahoo as a marketer and then made the switch into product management. If anyone wants to talk about that switch, please let me know. Um, and there I became a total data nerd and experimentalist, which will come into play later into the presentation. So from there, um, I then moved to LinkedIn, where I'm working on salary transparency and helping people to get jobs. So I feel like I, I made it, my mission statement, I'm there. <laughs> Um, so what do product managers do for people who aren't as familiar with product management? Um, one is uh, they understand the needs of the user and make sure that they figure out how to solve those needs in order to drive business decisions. Um, they also reduce friction in what the users are kind of going through to get them towards a goal. And then my most important part of this is that the product managers should always act with integrity in building products when those products are persuasive. So I know that's not everyone, but that's something that is very important to me in product management. So I work at LinkedIn, uh, and uh, I love LinkedIn, and I want to actually roll back the clock to 2004, 
um, when Reed Hoffman, this is Reed Hoffman's original Series B pitch deck for LinkedIn. Yeah, he's posted this online publicly um, and where he outlined the problem that LinkedIn went to solve, which is that there was no effective, trusted way for professionals to find and interact with each other online. So what he said is, I'm going to take something that happens offline and I'm going to I'm going to help it to become online. And what the way I view this is what he did is basically LinkedIn brought networking out of the shadows and it democratized access to opportunity. So things that you could only do if you had an inside knowledge. Now you are able to basically find and interact with other professionals on the Internet. But we need to have a little bit of real talk just because you bring a community offline to online means that that community still says the same and operates under the same principles as it did when it was offline. So when you come online, you know, there's still rich get richer. So people who have historically had access to opportunity will still continue to have access to that opportunity. People who have friction and interacting with other people or who have, you know, difficulty getting into particular jobs or professions will still continue to have that friction, even though there are tools now to help to mitigate that. So um, basically, even though the tool exists does not mean that equity is created. But the tool does exist, and you can use that tool to your benefit. So what I would like us to do is to create our own layer that operates by our own rules. So we're going to create our own network layer today. We're going to do a little experiment live, and it'll be my first time doing th this experiment, so please bear with me. Um, so let's first talk about how to create a strong community layer. Yes, I know this is gross. So. <laughs> Uh, so these are fire ants. Um, so a, a single fire ant is just an ant. Um, but when fire ants come together, they operate under a different set of rules, their community, and they be basically become this extremely flexible, extremely strong layer that scientists actually study because it replicates building materials. So it went from being an ant into something that's extremely strong and flexible. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, so the three principles of a strong network are one, density. Uh, so density of connections, how connected is each person to one another. Second is the volume of interactions and how much those interactions lead to mutual benefit. How much can you help one another? How much are those two-way interactions happening? And then the third is, does each person in that community have a shared desire for the success of the whole community? Okay, let's get this one. So we're going to do a little experiment. Bear with me. I think you guys know me now. <laughs> uh, so uh, this, is, this is me. I'm a senior product manager on the careers team. Yay. But little known fact, another little known fact, is that I'm also the world's best wedding guest. <laughs> Uh, which means that I am a master at the cha-cha slide. Do people like the cha-cha slide? Yes? Okay, great, because we are going to do a cha-cha slide-themed network building experiment live in this room. Okay, so I want everyone to open up their phones right now, and I want them, you guys to open up your LinkedIn app. I want you to turn on your Bluetooth. Where are my instructions? There we are. Um, so enable your Bluetooth. Open up the LinkedIn app, go to the Network tab, select Find Nearby, and switch to On. Maybe give me a little, like, Yelp if it worked. Yep. OK, so you're seeing your community showing up right in front of you on your app. I'll wait a couple more seconds. OK, and if you don't have the app, there's a way to do this without the app, so don't worry. But would love to see if everyone can start to see faces popping up, people in the room. OK, great. All right, we're going to keep going. So um, when I'm building my own communities, what I find personally is that it's easier for me to offer help than to ask for help. Does anyone agree with that? Yeah, and there's two really good things about offering to help. One is that it shows other people uh, and yourself that you have skills. Sometimes you need to like give yourself a little bit of, yeah, I actually do have that skill. Um, and number two is that it makes it a lot easier in the future for you to then ask that same person for help. So that's why I love offering help, and I do it a lot. And hello to all of my mentors and mentees in the room <laughs> who, who 
get this all the time. Okay, so this is us. Let's go to work. This is our cha-cha slide theme experiment. <laughs> Uh, so this is us. We are these red dots, these little red fire ants. And when I say go, um, what I want everyone to do is I want you to turn to the person to your left. I want you to ask their name, find them on LinkedIn, connect to them if you're not connected, and send them this message I'm offering to help. Don't worry about anything else about them. Don't worry about what you're gonna help them with in the future. All you're gonna do, I'm reducing friction here, I'm a product manager, is say, I'm offering to help, and that's it. Okay, you ready? Let's go to work. <laughs> to the left. Okay. <laughs> here we go, 15 seconds. <laughs> it's okay if you already know each other. You're still going to offer help. I know it's fun to chat to, but we're about to move to the next round. Okay. Five, four, three. Two, one. Take it back now, y'all. Okay, let's go. Now turn to the person back to you. <laughs> you guys are doing great. Love it, love the energy. All right, five, four, three, two, one. One hop this time. Okay, <laughs> this one's a little more complicated, but <laughs> we now have diagonal. So the person behind you, this way. Yep. All right, we got, we got 15 seconds. And you guys can also finish this exercise when I leave the stage, but. All right, ready? Five, four, three, two, one. All right, reverse. <laughs> You guys are going to have to give me feedback on this one. It's going to be pretty hard. OK. I'm going to bring the attention back here. Thank you. OK. How does everybody feel? Do you feel a little bit more like fire ants? Yeah? OK, so the point here is that We've all now connected to help one another. We've all connected to help one another. And even though we haven't done that right now in this moment, please let me know how it went. This is my first time running this experiment. And uh, thank you very much. Yes, girl. Let me pull up my coat. How fun was that? Okay, so a couple of things. <laughs> I'm so glad Rosanna mentioned sweating is okay and people seeing it was okay too. 
I have one of these, y'all. Does anybody else have one of these? 40 year old hot flashes, I'll get you this, okay? World market, world market. <laughs> Another fun feature, you guys, if you wanna look on LinkedIn and you weren't able to connect through the find nearby, we also have a barcode. So if you go to the top of your name there and you click it, you can also see the barcode and you can just scan the barcode of the person next to you. We're gonna take a quick break. Um, we have some snacks in the foyer. So please take five minutes and then we'll come back for some more fun. Actually four minutes, because we run a little bit over. So come back at 2.04. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> this Black History Month, I want to share how proud I am of the education I've earned so far in my life. My education has given me the professional confidence to know that I deserve to be heard, even if I'm the only Black woman in the room, which is usually the case. I'm a Black woman with a Wharton MBA. That's this one right here. And just knowing that and reminding myself of that gives me the strength and motivation to do whatever I can to pull other Black people up the ladder with me, so hopefully, I'm not the only one in the room in the near future. Also, special thanks to my parents for all the financial support for these diplomas. This Black History Month, I've been reflecting a lot about Black excellence and what that really means to me. It's something that truly inspires me to wake up every day and be an active leader in my community. I came from Trent, New Jersey, and I fought tooth and nail to get out and to be where I am today. So. I wake up every morning with the intention to help at least one other person do that very same thing. My passion comes in where I want to help people find their power and harness that to create their own reality. So this Black History Month, I want to reflect more on that, reflect on the principles of Sankofa and bring our past to the forefront so we can use that to propel our future moving forward. The currency that's now most important is the relationship currency. And relationship currency is worth about 225. It never experiences any diminishing marginal returns. And relationship currency is the currency that is generated by the investments that you make in the people in your environment. The investments that you make in the people in your environment. None of us work in a silo anymore. So at a minimum, you must have a relationship with every seat that touches your seat. If the only person that knows that you're doing a great job is your boss, then your ability to ascend in any environment will be vulnerable. Why? That person may leave the organization. They may lose their seat at the decision-making table, or they may lose their juice. So it's your job to make sure as many people as possible in that environment is aware of your outsized contribution. Here's two reasons why relationship currency is so important. Your ability to ascend will be a function of somebody's judgment. Judgment about whether or not you're ready. Judgment about whether or not the team will follow you. And judgment about whether or not you will ultimately be successful. And ladies and gentlemen, judgments are directly influenced by relationships. And if you aren't with me yet, let me give you my last piece of evidence. Everybody in this room has power. Everybody has power. Hard earned, personal, influential currency. But I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, how many people in this room will use their hard earned, personal, influential currency on somebody that they do not know? Mm-hmm, exactly. So remind yourself that your inability to ascend will rarely, if ever, be a function of whether or not somebody likes you, but it absolutely will be a function of whether or not somebody knows you. While your performance currency may get your name on the short list that's being discussed behind closed doors, when your name is called, if no one in that room can speak on your behalf, they simply go to the next name, and it has nothing to do with your ability to do the job. The reality is you are capable of everything. And sometimes we get a life that's smaller than we want because we haven't dreamt big enough. I'm convinced you guys can do it. I know we can do it with you. So let's get at it. Let's play this game and let's win powerfully because the world's counting on us. And there's a whole generation of young women coming right behind us. They want to see us win because that for them is the embodiment of what's possible for them as well.
I did want to mention um, this morning when Rosanna was speaking. Right. And, you know, her title at LinkedIn, head of diversity, inclusion, and belonging, right? We all know diversity. People stop hearing these words. Inclusion then was added to amp up diversity. We stopped hearing the word, you know? And what is inclusion? It sounds kind of antiseptic. Belonging is something else, right? Mm -hmm. Belonging is something deeper. It's something everybody can understand. It's really organic. It's not just about having a seat at the table, it's about deserving to be right. at the table and having it broadly understood that you deserve that seat. Um, and it's not something you can give yourself. Rosanna actually said that to me privately this morning. You can't give yourself a sense of belonging. You can show up, you can be a badass, you can be bold, you can be brave, you can do all the things Carla said. You can't make yourself belonging. That has to be something that comes from around mm -hmm. you so changing that is right. really, really critical. That's what Transform Her is about. That's what Women of Power is about. A lot of times I think we can get frustrated by the system or by working in a place and then so you kind of withdraw and you're not giving your best. Um, and so, or you look outside of that role and so you say, oh, I'm gonna start this thing on the side, but your focus is gonna be pulled in different directions. Um, and so I, I would highly recommend even if you don't like the job, master it, do the best, you know, give it however much time, is it a year that you're gonna give it, then do it, show up, do it for yourself, don't do it for your boss, don't do it for the company, do it for your integrity and your sense of, I showed up and I gave everything that I could to this, and that attitude, that energy that, that people feel from you is going to shift and I promise you more things will come your way that way than if you're like, oh God, go to work again and then your energy is like this nobody wants to give you more work you know and when you do finish your work you can go start being nosy and seeing what other people are doing what do they need help with where is that value how can I maybe I can make a shift over to this department because I have been having lunch with this person for a couple of months um, you know thinking of those things thinking long term and relationship build versus like I hate this today because that's circumstance and circumstances always change
Once again, please be seated. The program is about to begin. Yes, 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 yes for the networking. Yes for the conversations. Yes for the pleasantries. Everybody, did everybody get a little snack? Everybody good? We got the energy high? Wonderful. All right, if I can have everybody take their seats, we are going to be introducing the next round of speakers. And this is gonna be our first fireside chat of the day. Um, is it me or does fireside chat make you feel all snuggly and cozy? It's like, ooh, I really want to listen to what they got to say. Um, we have two amazing speakers coming up. So the first young lady that we have, she passed the state bar exam. Does anybody know how hard that is? Because I don't, but I know it's a big deal. So <laughs> shout out to her. Um, her name is Natalia Merluzzi. She just told me how to pronounce her last name. And she is the director of policy for experiences at Airbnb. And then we also have a gentleman here today who is my father's namesake. And uh, he received the US Department of Justice's highest award, the Edmund J. Randolph Award. And he's an, a former Associate Attorney General of the United States. And his name is Tony West, and he is the Chief Legal Officer at Uber. Please give them a round of applause. Come on up, y'all. Yes. Hey everybody, how's it going? See, can you guys hear me? Yes. Wonderful, so thank you so much for being here. It's really wonderful to look out at so many powerful and talented women in this room. My name is Natalia Merluzzi. I'm the Director of Policy for Experiences, a new business at Airbnb. And I'm joined by my mentor, Tony <laughs> West, uh, who is the Chief Legal Officer at Uber. Uh, and I wanted to just start by saying, you know, we, we are going to be talking about uh, trust in the age of Me Too and Time's Up. And going back, I've known Tony for over 10 years now. Long time. Long time. Long time. Um, and we go back to when Tony was a partner at a large law firm here in San Francisco, Morrison and Forrester. And I was actually a summer intern. Um, and when I came back to work as a first year associate at the firm, everyone said, don't work with Tony. <laughs> don't work with Tony, don't work with Tony. And um, it wasn't because Tony's not a good guy, Tony's a great guy, but everyone said, Tony's gonna be gone within the year. And uh, they said, you know, he's off to the Obama administration. If he leaves, all his work is gonna leave and you're gonna have nothing to do. 
And they were right. (laughs) (laughs) Tony did leave, and he did go work for the Obama administration. And as was mentioned, he became the third in charge at the Department of Justice under then Attorney General Eric Holder. And, you know, even though everyone was giving me that advice in my best interest, I am so glad I didn't listen to them. I did work with Tony. We had an amazing rapport. He gave me really good work. And he believed in me at the time more than I believed in myself. And what was so powerful about that is that then uh, Tony actually took me with him to Washington, D.C. when he left. (laughs) So I think we have a bit of a a 10-year challenge photo that we were going to put up on the screen. So this is us. At Tony's um, confirmation hearing back in 2009, so truly a 10-year challenge. Now, the, the, um, the, the photo is fuzzy, so I look exactly, <laughs> in case you were wondering. Um, but it's just to say that, you know, uh, with the mentors, it's, it's really about finding the right fit. And so that kind of leads me um, to my first question, Tony, you know, thinking about... Uh, me, the Me Too movement, and it's had a profoundly positive impact on women in the workplace. Um, but you are hearing, and actually there's some reporting in the New York Times even, from mm-hmm. Silicon Valley to Washington, D.C., uh, to mm-hmm. Wall Street, you know, men are saying that they no longer want to mentor women because it's an unnecessary risk. And I was wondering if you could speak to, you know, not only mentoring across gender lines, uh, but just mentoring across, you know, diverse perspective and experiences generally. Uh, that, that is a great question. Um, f- first, just let me thank you for having me uh, here at, at this conference. I think this is an amazing conference, and I feel honored and privileged to be able to be here with you uh, this afternoon. Um, and, and thank you, Natalia, for agreeing to to do this this fireside chat. Um, I have you know, a great deal of respect for you, and, and, uh, and our friendship goes back a long time. I really, this is the first time we've ever done this, by the way, so I'm <laughs> not exactly sure what she's gonna ask me, but, but, um, but I really do appreciate you taking the time. Um, look, I think um, I saw that article in the New York Times, and, and I have to say, I, this idea that uh, some men are finding it risky to mentor women to me, it's not that complicated. Men should just stop harassing women, and so, and it's fine, right? And so, I, it, 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 and it's 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 an interesting thing because when I actually think about my career, there is no way that I could have gotten to where I've been able and privileged to, to be without the mentorship of women. Um, in fact, the, some of the most important figures in my career have been women. Um, my first mentor in the law was Attorney General Janet Reno. Um, I was a young attorney uh, in the Clinton administration. I was, you know, just barely a year out of law school, and uh, I was. Uh, uh, it was her first year as Attorney General, and 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 somehow, by some luck and fortune, I, I got the opportunity to do uh, work for her at, at Maine Justice. And she took an interest in me, and um, you know, really encouraged me to become a federal prosecutor, which is uh, something I went on uh, to do. And in fact, before I left D.C. to come back here to the Bay Area, where I was an AUSA, a federal prosecutor, um, she asked to see me one-on-one. And in that meeting, she gave me advice, which I have followed my entire career, whether I've been in the public sector or the private sector. Um, and really kind of shapes the way I think about myself as a lawyer. She, you know, she, she showed me this inscription, which is in, carved in the wood walls just outside of the Attorney General's private office. And essentially it, it says, um, the United States wins its case whenever justice is done. And General Reno you know, said to me, now you know, I want you to remember that your job as a federal prosecutor is, is, is not to go out and win as many trials as you possibly can. Um, although you, you know I won all my, my trials. <laughs> not um, um, no, what she said is, you know, your job is actually to, to do justice in every single matter that you handle. Your job is to do the right thing in every single case that you handle. And the reason that was so powerful to me, not only was it coming from the Attorney General of the United States, 
Um, but it really did sort of shape the way that I think about how to be a lawyer. That came from um, a woman. If she felt it was risky to you know, mentor a man, I never would have gotten that kind of, that kind of, of life-changing um, and really professional setting advice. Yeah, and I, I can attest that when you, you know, led the offices at the Department of Justice, that was something that all of us were held accountable to uh, the entire time was this idea of, of serving the principle of justice rather than the individual case. Um, and then thinking about mentorship as being a critical part of ensuring that women do reach uh, representation and leadership, what would you say to somebody who asks you, you know, how do I go about finding mm. a mentor? Yeah, you know, it's um, uh, there are a lot of programs, obviously, that companies have now started to put in place, which try to to, to make this a uh, something that is a part of the regular um, professional development of, of individuals. Um, I, I will tell you that my experience has been that the most uh, fruitful uh, mentorship relationships have been those that have happened organically. Um, and you mentioned a minute ago that you and I developed, you know, a really a great rapport. I mean, the thing, Natalie, uh, I first met Natalie when I interviewed her to be a summer associate at MoFo, and I remember um, before I'd ever met her, I had her resume, and I remember the thing that stood out to me was that she, before you know, even going to law school, had been a published author, and as someone who values good writing and someone who who, who, who really you know, believes in the power of the written word. I was very impressed by the fact that this young woman had, had been a published author even before going to law school. And, and so I remember that was, you know, we talked half of the interview was about, you know, had nothing to do with whether or not you wanted to work at the firm. Um, but, but that was, um, and then we worked together when you, when you did come to the firm. Um, but, but that was, you know, that wasn't a planned kind of relationship. That just sort of happened organically. The more work I gave you, the more you proved that you could uh, more than step up to the challenge. And I think that that kind of trust is really important in a mentorship relationship because then what you find, and again, the, the best, in my, my experience, the best relationships are those that happen organically, is that they extend past the professional setting in the sense that I've tried to be a mentor to you even though you haven't been working, you're not working at Uber and you're not, you know. Um, and the best part of it is that, that if, if it's really working, the mentor learns um, a huge amount, m as much if not more from the mentee over time. And I know that's certainly been my experience in learning things from you. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I I, I encourage people to be open to mentoring relationships that may not be obvious, whether it's across gender lines or across, as you said, across differences, um, whether it's uh, across ethnicities or race. I think the way that you just never know where that, you know, where the, those relationships that will be very enriching for you, your life, your career, um, where they'll come from, but to be as open as you can to finding those wherever they may be. And then just to follow up on that a little bit, I think there are different types of mentorship relationships, yeah. right? And there are people who might be good sounding boards in your current position. And then I think there are people who, like you said, really transcend uh, you know, that work experience and are going to become champions for you throughout your life. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about you know, what that difference is and and you know, the value in having multiple kinds of mentors because it doesn't have to be just one. Yeah, no, that's, that's, it's an excellent point, right? I mean, I think that um, you will find right, that in, in certain instances, someone is, because of the particular position that you find yourself in or role that you find yourself in in, in, a, in a company or a job or, you know, uh, an institution, that there is, there is something that someone is doing that you want to learn right? You want to either emulate what they're doing or you want to uh, learn a particular skill. Maybe you want their job you know, <laughs> um, uh, at some point. And so y that relationship can be a mentorship relationship, but it, but it may be very context specific, right? 
Um, and then there are those relationships which, you know, you know, last outside of that. I mean, you know, Janet Reno, we talked about Janet Reno, you know, when I was nominated to be the assistant attorney general of, uh, for the civil division um, in 2009, uh, I called her for advice. Uh, and I called her before my you know, confirmation hearing. And so uh, um, that is a relationship that, of course, you know, lasted um, in, until her death. And then um, just taking a step back and thinking about what you know, role corporations can play in the Me Too movement, Uber made a lot of news uh, this past year in ending uh, mandatory arbitration agreements uh, for sexual assault and ha sexual harassment claims and also committing to a, a transparency report. And I was wondering if you could take us behind the scenes of those you know, controversial decisions mm. uh, that were made at your company. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, it was not an easy decision. You know, these things, it's funny. It, you know, in mandatory arbitration for individual claims of sexual assault, sexual harassment, you do it, and in the rearview mirror, it seems like it's an obvious decision to make. It's the obvious choice. At the time you're going through it, it's it's not very obvious, right? It's or I should say, it's not very easy. It, it it's a it, it's a decision that does not come without cost. Um, it's a decision that certainly does not come without legal risk. Um, you know, I'm the chief legal officer. Usually I'm the guy in the room that's saying, no, don't do things that are risky. Uh, and so, um, but this was different. You know, um, we, there were some interesting decisions, or I should say discussions that were being had during this time. Um, we, were, we were talking to folks outside of the company getting advice, but I think consequentially, uh, most importantly, the internal discussions we were having, women were at the table, uh, and women were helping to drive this conversation. And um, if you ever needed, like, you know, perfect example of who's in the room matters, this is a good example. This 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 decision, I think, is one example of it matters who's in the room. It matters who's at the table. And so. Um, you know, and it helped me, you know, again, as the chief legal officer, I was actually asking the company to do something that was more risky. Um, but it helped that we, we had uh, folks saying, look, uh, we're a technology company. We engage risk every day, you know, in the name of disruption, in the name of innovation. Surely we can engage a bit of risk in the name of doing the right thing. Um, and I'm proud that that's, that's where we ended up. And you know, Uber is in definitely turnaround mode right now. You yeah. guys have a new CEO, new policies, new values. And I was wondering, you know, if you could speak a little bit about that cultural shift, and you know, who ultimately at the company is responsible for that? Well, everybody. Everybody's responsible for the cultural shift. Um, I would say that. Uh, Dara was interviewed uh, a few Dara weeks ago. I'm sorry, Dara, Dara Khazrashahi is the CEO, and, and Dara what came in in August of 2017. Uh, I was his first executive hire. I came in in November of 2017. And um, he was interviewed um, uh, a few weeks ago, and, and it's the first time I've heard him say this. He said, you know, he, he, he called me a culture carrier hmm. for the company. Uh, and then he made the point that we're all, uh, the, all of the leaders are culture carriers for the company. And... Um, but transforming the culture of that company is everybody's responsibility. And that's a really important point, right? It's not, you don't change, CEOs will tell you that the most important thing about a company is not the P&L. It is not sort of, you know, what the margins look like. The most important thing is the culture of the company. You lose the culture of a company, you lose that company. And you lose the soul of that company. And so... That only happens if everybody is invested. And so it was really important that one of the first things that Dara did was to, was to have a process where cultural norms, new cultural norms for the company, um, and it was a bottoms up process, were identified. And the one that everyone has heard about, and we talk about a lot, is do the right thing, period. Um, but there are actually uh, several of them. And when I have been, uh, when I came in and I talked about what does that mean? How do you, how do the lawyers um, or the compliance and ethics folks that, that I lead or the security folks that I lead, how do they do that? 
How do they put that into practice? I've talked about transparency, integrity, and accountability. Those three things. Everything we do, we have to act with transparency, integrity, and accountability. And I give, I give my team specific examples of what that looks like in action so that, so that as we kind of go through our daily work in, in each of us owning the transformation of the company, we, we, know, we, we know what we need to do. And it sounds like there's still influences of Attorney General Reno's absolutely uh, threaded absolutely. through your, your current work and your current role. Yeah. Um, in thinking about that personal responsibility piece, if, if everyone at the company is responsible, right, and it mm -hmm. really has to be everybody, um, in the age of Me Too and in the age of Time's Up, how can all of us in this room, how can our friends, and how can our colleagues further this movement? And how, what, what role do we have in improving you know, women in, women's empowerment, women's rights in the workplace? Well, I, I think um, one good, good example is what we are doing here um, at this conference, and the fact that all of us are here uh, talking about these issues. And so I think that is an amazing, uh, important step in the process. I think uh, each of us has to be responsible for being voices in whatever you know corners of influence we, we find ourselves um, for inclusive workplaces, for diverse workplaces, um, for fairness. And and you know that is easier said than done sometimes because sometimes it requires you to speak up when it's uncomfortable. Um, but but you know we we can folks can speak up and you know and and we can we can countenance a little bit of discomfort every now and then it's okay because I think it's the only way that you begin to engage these issues in any real way and I think look each of us each of us has influence in whatever circles we're operating we may not think about it um, but I guarantee you that as you think about whatever your daily role is each of us has a sphere of influence in which we can push forward this conversation and push forward these issues. And so for me, right, um, uh, you know, it's important to not simply um, talk the talk, but actually walk the talk, right? And, and that means creating metrics around some of these values we're talking about. So for me, you know, when I, I, I talk about diversity and inclusion, it's an important value. It's a value of the company. I want to see our teams emulate that. But um, I, I, I also say, look, you know, we have five priorities for 2019. One of them is diversity and inclusion. We will measure people um, and their success, uh, you know, on this metric of diversity and inclusion and how that's showing up. Um, I try to demonstrate it in what we do. And I've been at Uber for just over a year. I've uh, hired or promoted uh, 13 people, uh, eight of whom are women. Um, and, and that comes... Not because I'm simply trying to, you know, I'm trying to make a point. It's because the most, my experiences in both the public and the private sector is that the most effective, highest performing teams are diverse teams. And it has been my experience over and over and over again. And so when I said, you know, I wanted to build a world class team, I wanted to get the best of the best, that is, that is how it turned out. Um, and that's not surprising to me at all. So I think it's important to kind of model that you know, over and over and over again and, and, uh, and, 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 and sort of in the work that we, we, each, we each do in our own uh, specific spheres of influence. And, and in thinking about that, because having known you in multiple professional settings now, I know that you really do make an effort not only to get folks in the door, right, um, whether it's women or people of color um, or people with disabilities. I mean, you're incredibly inclusive in the way that you think about hiring uh, but also, people talk about that retention piece yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And I was wondering if you could speak to, I mean, you've been in leadership roles, uh, like you mentioned, both in the private sector and in the public sector. And I think that's where people get caught up sometimes, is not being able to figure out that retention piece. you know. And it's arguably more important. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's... It's harder too, yeah. frankly, right? I mean, it's for a long time people were talking about the pipeline. I've been at the diversity and inclusion stuff for a long time because I'm because I'm old, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but there was like the, the argument used to be about well, the pool isn't diverse enough, right? 
and then it was the pipeline. And so you, you, after you address all of these issues, right, what you find is that it's actually just, it requires just a lot of hard, intentional work. You just have to stay with it. Um, it's not one and done. And, and, and that's OK. And, but you have to invest the time, um, to your point, to make sure that retention is reality. And, and for, for, for those of us who are bringing people in the door and then trying to bring people in, it's important, too, that we are always mindful that we, in making promotion decisions, in making um, certain types of hiring decisions, that we are um, setting people up for success and doing everything we can to make sure they're successful in those roles. And so this is something my wife was, was taught me. Um, she, um, someone that we both know and worked with, um, um, was someone that I wanted to promote into a, a position, a very prominent position of leadership. And, and one of my own, um, uh, I guess, one of my own uh, uh, approaches to talent is that I you know, definitely believe in the importance of experience, but I will um, always, always, always look for potential as well and potential to grow. And that's, a very, that's as important to me. That, and so that means that I will, I will sometimes put people in positions where they may not necessarily think they are, you know, they're ready for it, but I can see they have the potential to grow and that they will be able to, to fill that, that role. Um, and this was one of those situations um, where she wasn't, sh she, the role was big, she wasn't sure. Um, I knew she could do it, and I talked to my wife about it. And she said, no, you know, it's good, you should do that but you better make sure she's successful in that role. You don't put her in that role and let her fail. I mean, she, and, and I said, you know, that, that's absolutely right. And, you know, good story is the end, because she, not only she succeeds, she's now sitting on the bench as a judge. So, <laughs> so she did pretty well. Yeah, um, she is a fantastic individual. Yeah. Um, Ame Frimpong, who yeah. is now uh, on the bench in Los Angeles. So. Um, yeah, it, you know, Tony, I really appreciate all that you've said, and I think that's right, that, you know, it really is about setting people up for success, and I do think that's why mentorship is so important, because I think that people who do seek out mentors and are able to cultivate those relationships can go further, because they find somebody who's that champion who will stretch, you know, their expectations of themselves, but also be right behind them, pushing them forward when they say, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I truly appreciate all that you've done for me and the time that you've, you know, been my mentor throughout my career, and I would not be where I am if it were not for you. Um, so thank I'm you. I'm going to remind you, you said, you said for all <laughs> these people. I'm so I'm usually all not these this people, nice to him. <laughs> Um, but, you know, we're, we do have time for questions, but I, I just needed to ask one, one final question of you, Tony, yeah. uh, which is we are at a women's empowerment conference, and I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> um, and it, it, the national elections are upon us. And I wanted to know. They're not upon us yet. We got I some wanted time. to know <laughs> if you have any predictions about the 2020 election, and are we going to get our first woman president? <laughs> yeah, that's not Talia. All right. Um, well, um, as every, let me just, the, the legal disclaimer is every view I express is my own. <laughs> um, and let me, let me put it this way. You know, I am looking forward to coming back to this conference uh, in 2021, same time, where I can tell you all uh, what a wonderful time I had at the inauguration of President Kamala Harris. <laughs> actually, actually, all, all y'all be, will be there, so I won't have to tell you, because you will all experience it firsthand. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how we're, I'm happy to take the mic. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you to my beautiful wife, Ty, for co-founding the event. Yes. Uh, every time I get on the mic, I always make it a point to shout her out, because she's, <laughs> she's the best part of my life. That is um, very smart. Question, thank you. Good. 
the the question's for Tony. Yes. Uh, and you've you've been working in the private and uh, in the public sector, and we talk about you talked about how men just need to stop harassing women. And I'm curious uh, because I'm pretty young in my career, mm -hmm. and um, I'm constantly in conversations where I have to look away or look down, uh, and I feel like as a man, like you, you don't, you're not always empowered uh, to step up and say, "Hey, stop." So, in, in your experience, uh, your longer experience, not to call you old, <laughs> uh, but it's I, okay. I, Natalia calls me old all the time. Yeah, I, 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 I really want to hear like how you've experienced this, how you've dealt with it, how you've evolved with um, your journey as an ally to women. It's, look, it's, it's a good question. I mean, um, and, and just being totally candid, right, I, I, you know, there is an age difference between us. So in some, in some ways, the experience that you've described is, is just going to be different for me because um, when I was your age, you know, um, the world was a little different. Um, that said, I, I, and, and may, I guess maybe, maybe that's why I have not, I'm about to say what I'm about to say, which is that I have not thought about that as much in the interaction, right? It just, it hasn't been as much of, of a conscience, conscience kind of thought for me because, well, look, I mean, you know, um, I have two younger sisters, um, you know, uh, very strong, uh, I, both my parents, um, you know, were in the home and raising me, but, but a very strong mother. Um, my mother-in-law, particularly strong. Um, <laughs> Uh, and someone who I, you know, had a very close relationship with. Um, um, my wife, my daughter, my sister-in-law. I've just, I've grown up just surrounded by really strong women. So it, there's, there's nothing that has been, in, just in my experience, it just has not been a, a remarkable thing that we, you know, had to think consciously about. Um, I, I guess the other thing I would say um, is that for, for me in these kinds of conversations, I just, I, I feel like it's just really important just to be as authentic and open and honest as you possibly can, even about the discomfort, right? I mean, because I think that's really the only way that we begin to navigate these kinds of issues. I, I you know, I, I used to joke with Natalia and some other folks when we're back at the um, Justice Department, because there were some people who, who were actually older than us at that time, um, and they would just say whatever was on their mind. And we used to joke that, you know, there's a little governor that sits in the head, and sometimes they just fall asleep. And there's that person is supposed to like, you know, say, oh, that thought, that's not going to go to the mouth. We're going to catch that. That person just was like taking the day off, right? Um, but what I find is that when I get older, my governor kind of goes to sleep too. You know, and so I just, so I just, I, I, when I, that's why when I say it's just important to be really candid, I, I'm, I, I feel like it's just really important to be as authentic and candid about even the discomfort as you have been, um, but not to, not to overthink it. I think the thing that also makes me um, impatient about the whole, um, you know, should men stop mentoring women thing and why I say men should just stop harassing women and it's fine, is um, there is a, there's a premise there that women are going to make up stories, right? There's a premise in that whole idea that women are prone to make up something that is not true, that is difficult when, tr when it is true, the vast majority of time, to raise in the first instance. There is no, you know, there is, we can, we have, we are replete with examples of why it does not, it does not seem to, to be of any benefit to women to raise these issues when they occur to them. So to, to buy into a premise that, you know, we should stop mentoring women because they might make something up 
that's not true and then say something bad about it. It's just, it, to me, it's just, it's, it's backwards. It doesn't make any sense. That was not a helpful answer to you. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. And yeah, if, I've been told that if you have uh, other questions, please go to the back where there's a microphone. Hi, um, Tony and Natalie. Am I saying that correct? Uh, I'm Karen Fleshman. I'm the founder of Racy Conversations. And I'd like to ask you to speak a little more explicitly about the importance of employee activism. As I look on the, the landscape, the government isn't holding tech companies accountable, shareholders aren't holding tech companies accountable, and I do believe that really the only entity that is gonna drive culture change is employee activism. Um, uh, not holding uh, companies accountable for? For uh, race and gender discrimination, sexual harassment. Got it. Um, Uh, I definitely think that um, employees can make a difference here. I mean, I think we have we have seen this play begin to play itself out, um, and that's important because what it, it reminds us that um, you know employees not only have a role in changing the culture, but they can actually force culture change. So I've actually I've seen that not only um, at my company, but I've seen that at at, at other companies. Um, you know, I do think it is important for us to sort of remember what the, what the, uh, you know, what it is we're trying to achieve, right? What, what, is, what we're trying to achieve is a workplace that is inclusive, diverse, where people can come and, you know, share their talents, do their best work, be as productive as they can, and to develop as individuals and professionals. Right? And that's, that's what we're trying, that's that environment that we're trying to create. And so I think you know, any efforts by, by employees, certainly by management to set the right tone at the top, I think you know, contributing to that goal uh, is important. Hi, Arlene Mendoza, and this question's for Tony, because so I've, I was in corporate for 12 years, background engineering and MBA, and I was always the woman of color at the table. Mm. So I'm curious, and I've had a variety of mentors, and there's always been this blurred line where when I gain a lot of trust with my male mentors, yeah. there, there's this vulnerability that occurs naturally. Yeah. And when I feel comfortable, there's emotion that comes up. And I'm curious how you'd recommend a young woman in, in a corporate setting who feels alone, isolated, and she's the only one at the table, and as is just catapulted into her career by the support of males, which I've been there, and then you feel this weird nuanced place. Mm. And it's, I think I've balanced that for 12 years, and I'm curious, and I've never had the opportunity to just ask this flat out about what you'd recommend that 30-year-old, you know, Latina going for it and then feeling very uncomfortable, but also she feels that she's going to shatter that ceiling at the same time. Mm -hmm. Wow. A great question. <laughs> I... Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the answer that only I can give you, which is from the perspective of a male who's been a mentor uh, to, to women of color. Uh, and then I'm actually going to ask you, Natalia, to answer that a little bit, um, if you wouldn't mind. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's true that in those... In those uh, mentorship relationships that work, there is a degree of vulnerability that is created uh, on both sides, actually. Um, and I, I think, just like you know, any any important human relationship, um, you know, folks have to navigate that. I, I think the thing that we have, and that for me, not just speaking for me, um, you know, the thing I always try to keep in mind is that, you know, vulnerability is not weakness, right? 
I mean, and in many ways, it's just the opposite, right? And um, in those in those kinds of conversations and in those things, those, those 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 times when you know people are kind of feeling like, you know, you know this this happened to me again in this meeting, or um, I have no idea what you know what no one is telling me what's not working, but something is not working. And it's incredibly frustrating. Um, um, you know, I, I think it's important to be able to have those kinds of conversations with someone that you trust, who who who, who may be able to have a little bit of perspective that can say, you know, maybe think about this or think about that, because they've gone through a similar, not the same, but you know, maybe a similar kind of situation. Um, I, but I wouldn't. Sh I, I, my own, for me, I would not shy away from those types of either conversations or relationships. Yeah, and if I could just, um, I might not look it, but I'm knocking on 40. And so, um, you know, I've, I've been in a similar- I don't see how that can be, because I'm, <laughs> I'm 40. <laughs> um, but just speaking personally, I, I think I just kind of got over that uh, imposter syndrome myself, yeah. right? Um, and getting at your question, you're gonna come like around the side. Um, so I think, you know, that was an incredible hurdle internally that I had to overcome. Um, so I think there's like internal factors, external factors, and time. And, you know, I think the internal piece for a lot of women, a lot of women of color, is that imposter syndrome and being able to be comfortable in who you are and bringing your full self, right? And part of that is being able to recognize uh, what is sometimes critiqued uh, like vulnerability um, as a negative and really understanding the positives that we bring that are unique because we are so thoughtful <laughs> about ourselves and our work and you know every, all of the dynamics that bring us to where we are uh, because none of us got here individually. We all have many people who whether it's mentors or family or whomever, um, had to come before us and really struggle, right, to get us to where we are. And we'd never forget that for a day in our lives. Um, so it's that internal piece of really growing into yourself completely and unapologetically. Um, and then there's the external piece, and you talked about this earlier, of being able to be set up for success. And I am so glad to hear that you are, because I do think that's a key element in all of this, is that you really have to be in a position where you are you know, empowered to really do your best work. And that is stretch, right? And for so many women, we're you know, under-leveled, <laughs> we're underpaid, we're under-titled, and you can't do your best work if you are not, you know, if you're not being valued externally to what you know you should be, right? So then that undermines that first piece. So, and then the last piece of it is time. Because I think in, this goes to, you know, I've seen this before, I've done this before, and you get to that point in your career uh, where, you know, nothing's new. <laughs> Even like the new stuff is interesting because I was like, okay, great. But you've seen it before. So you get to this comfort in your career where you don't really have to, you know, like the little stuff you don't have to think about anymore, right? Um, but anyway, for me, I think it was those three things coming together, finally, really, like just now in my career at almost 40. Right, and actually, just to give a nod to like all of the folks in here who are parents, because I just had a little one too. Like that actually catapulted me into another stratosphere as well, because um, just you know doing the impossible every single day and having a different priority um, really made a difference for me in my confidence. Um, but it's just to say that I, I hope you bring your whole self, and I hope you bring all those vulnerabilities, and I hope you call everyone to task because that's how we're all gonna get better, right? Um, and so I appreciate your question and all that you do, and frankly, everybody here, because it takes a lot just for us to get up and go and do our jobs every day. Um, and you know, just really appreciating the fact that you all make this world better, you make your companies better, you make, you know, it's, it's each one of you believing in yourselves that's gonna get us to a different, different place um, in this country. 
and in this world. So um, I think we're out of time. <laughs> but thank you for that <laughs> question. For being here. All right, let's give another round of applause. Thank you, Natalie and Tony. So as for me, I knocked on 40, I opened the door, I sat down, and I had a glass of wine. <laughs> Hence my handy dandy fan. <laughs> One of the things that really stood out to me in their conversation was talking about looking for a mentor and, and how to identify a mentor. And I've struggled with that throughout my career in life as well. Uh, one of the comments that Tony met, uh, said was focusing on uh, people who demonstrate integrity. And that really sticks to me. I've been at LinkedIn for seven years, and integrity is a culture piece of ours. It's something that we look to, someone who does the right thing. So looking for that quality in someone and actually putting yourself out there as someone who has that quality or whatever principles in life you have. Let that be the foundation of identifying who you want to entrust with your career and your life. That really stood out to me, coupled with Rosanna's mention about being brave and just reaching out to someone who you might feel afraid to reach out to, to want to be a mentor. So I've made up my mind, I'm DMing Obama. Yeah. <laughs> and Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> I know some of you had the same idea, but dibs on first in the inbox, okay? <laughs> dibs on first in the inbox. The other thing that really stood out that I think that um, is really important that I'm taking with me is relationships. And another culture point, not to plug LinkedIn because I bleed blue, but <laughs> relationships matter. And this is another reason why I rooted my career within LinkedIn because this culture point resonates with me so much. So uh, the mention that Tony said was organic relationships and having those organic relationships. And through those organic relationships, people get to know the core of your being, who you are as a person inside and out as a professional professional and beyond. So those are good things that stick out that I put on my notebook. So how many of us are feeling this goodness so far? Woo! All right. So we're going to start this panelist conversation. I'm going to say our moderator is an individual who is going to be my mentor to my soul sister. She comes to us as an HR leader for four and a half years here at LinkedIn, found her way to the Bay Area all the way from Kansas and realized she wasn't in Kansas anymore, Ms. Lori Allen. <laughs> we also have um, our director of marketing at AdRoll Group, Jeanette Jordan. She's a powerful force who holds dual degrees, mathematics, engineering, and holds an MBA. Woo, that hurt my brain just saying that. Smarty. We also have Global Head of Inclusion and Diversity at Stripe, Valerie Williams, which is yep, equally powerful, holds not one but two MBAs. We have a Global Head of Culture and Inclusion at Twilio, LaFawn Davis, Bay Area gal, who spent eight years in, the, in her career at the almighty Google. So she's going to teach us a few things about that world. We also have a global program manager at Airbnb, Simone Harvey. She made it to the land. Yep, she made it to the land of opportunity, AKA the Bay Area, all the way from Switzerland. And she's a scrum master. How many of us love scrum masters in business world? We need you. <laughs> Please welcome panelists. My mic is not on, what? Okay, now you can hear me. My voice is challenged, so it's a baritone today, but normally it's an alto, so we'll work <laughs> with that today. So we are so excited. I want you guys to have a chance to meet our panel up close and personal. So we're gonna let them introduce themselves to you and you can get a little bit more detail about what they're up to. So I will start with you, Jeanette. Hi. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you. It's so exciting to be here and happy Black History Month. This is a great Woo! to kick it off sitting here with a bunch of black girl magic. So I am Jeanette Jordan. I am the director of corporate marketing for AdRoll Group. And what that means for people who might not know, I'm responsible for internal and external comms, public relations, portfolio marketing and employer branding. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Valerie Williams. I'm the current Global Head of Inclusion and Diversity at Stripe. For people that may not know Stripe, we are a fintech company, a payments platform, but we also have lots of other products. Um, I've been there for just about 10 months, and I'm super excited to be here. Ty and I went to school together, so oh, shout out to Ty. Um, really, really excited to be here. Thank you. Cool. Hi, I'm LaFawn Davis. I'm Global Head of Culture and Inclusion at Twilio. And been there almost two years. Uh, and what that means is I do inclusion and diversity, talent and employer brand, and uh, employee experience. 
and Lori and I have actually known each other for <clears throat> decades. Yes, long time. <laughs> um, <laughs> not not because we worked at the same company, but because we went to the same hair shop. Yeah. So, so that's a bond. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I am Simone Harvey. I am the global program manager for Airbnb in Airbnb's customer operations group called Community Support. I have the safety and the uh, legal programs. Doesn't really mean much out of context. Um, but I'm also the chief of staff for the Black Employee Resource Group. And I have two interns here today that are part of my internship program. So I'm really, really happy that they have been able to attend this event. Fantastic. Thank you, ladies. OK. When I do a panel, we just go have a real talk. So, because I work in human resources, as you guys all know here at uh, LinkedIn. But if we're going to talk about microaggressions, we're going to have to let really talk about microaggression. <laughs> so, the first thing I want to raise with the panel is how do you define microaggressions? What does it mean to you? So, the way I define a microaggression is kind of usually a verbal kind of jab. You know it when you feel it, you're like, hmm. That comment didn't sit right with me, right? And, it, and it's really, and I also think about a microaggression as really unintentional because I think if it's intentional, then it's just an aggression. And, and, and we need to call that what it is. Right. But usually when somebody's like, you know, you're pretty for a black girl, you know? Yeah. Oh, your hair is really cute. Like you expected it not to be, you know? The, those kind mm -hmm. of underhanded compliments. Yeah. I'll go to the next one, too. I, I mean... Spot on, right? It's 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 unintentional to your point about uh, that, but I think it is. It's just that movement of like, hmm, wait a minute, that kind of hit me a little bit wrong. So I, I echo what you said. Yeah, I kind of feel like microaggressions are shade disguised as a compliment. Okay, now, now we you said we're going to get real. That's so, the real girl. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, and I and I know that it's it's supposed to be unintentional, but sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's on that line, you know what I mean? So uh, at a company I worked for years and years and years ago, I, I came in with braids. Mm -hmm. And uh, the HR director at the time was like, it's, you're just, it's so urban. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> right? Like, I, I think she was trying to kind of say a compliment, but not really say a compliment. Um, and there definitely wasn't anybody that looked like me in the office, so... I feel like it's it's still a little shady, but disguised as something nice. I think it's a reminder that you're not from this planet. You know, mm. like you're an alien. You don't belong here. Mm. You don't fit. And uh, I think racism is, by and large, uh, unconscious acting out, right? So I think whether it's intentional or not is really irrelevant. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's good. Wow. Okay, we can do that one now. <laughs> okay. So the one thing I wanted to ask, we always think about, we start most of our diversity and inclusion work at a lot of times with unconscious bias training. So is this what you think is also considered a form of bias? A microaggression? I, I think it's, it's kind of born out of the bias. I think the bias exists already. And that compliment is almost like, oh, you're, you're different than I expected, right? Mm -hmm. I often get that about my hair. Your hair is so pretty. And in particular, somebody who has locks, which mm -hmm. in most states it's illegal. I can be fired and people would uphold that yeah. to still have locks today in 2019. You know, those kind of things. Well, what did you expect? Right. You know, so I, I think it's the bias already exists and the microaggression is really just a byproduct. OK. Yeah, I think I think the unconscious bias training is really just acknowledging that we all have bias. Right. It's 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 not useful unless you actually take that and, and put it into action right. and to actually do the work of self-awareness every day to mitigate that bias. So yes, microaggressions are bias, but I think um, if people do the work, the day-to-day -day work of mitigating their biases, then we would have less of those. Okay. Totally, totally agree. Um, when I first started at Twilio, I said, we are not gonna do unconscious bias training. And it was like, ooh, gasp, <gasps> why not? Um, <laughs> because that's what you do, with, especially when you're a tech company right now. You do that, you check the box, you say you've, you've done diversity programs. Mm -hmm. 
And so, um, you know, we'll also like try sensitivity training, which is a lot more compliance driven. And typically if you've had an issue within your function and they bring in this external person who makes you laugh, but also makes you feel bad. <laughs> um, so instead, what I rolled out was called don't be an a-hole. And we actually say the word, but I won't do that since this is probably being recorded. Um, but it, it is, it's, it's, it's talking about all of it, right? So microaggressions, it's talking about mean girls, bro culture. What happens when you are not engaged? So when you're not engaged, you're actually in fight, flight, or freeze mode, right? And kind of the science behind all of it. Why is somebody showing up this way? Why is somebody, you know, saying these microaggressions against me? And, and it, it's kind of helping to unpack all of that inside as opposed to just being like, oh, you just don't know that you're biased because we're all biased and that's what the problem is. No, it's, it's a whole slew of problems um, that I think we have to really dig into. Well, if racism is a system of advantages, right, for some people and disadvantages for, for others, and bias is something that's underlying it, I would look at microaggressions as a, as a symptom of it. And, you know, racism is systemic. It's really like part of American culture, it's very deeply embedded. It's part of like every system or institution that this country has built or conceptualized in some way. And so my issue with, with the bias trainings is also like it seems really watered down, like mm -hmm. I have a problem, you have a problem, we all have a problem. Let's just be <laughs> let's just be nice to each other, right? right. But I think I think if you're saying that you're gonna work on it, that takes some really substantial work around your identity and, and your culture and the things that you assume to be true and the things that you assume to be right. And it's not easy work. And I think oftentimes if we talk about it in this really abstract way, like everybody's a little racist and we're like, yeah, okay, all right. right. But, <laughs> but, but if we're saying like, you know, Carla, this thing that you did mm -hmm. is actually racist, then it's like all hell breaks loose, right? right. So, um, we have to address it on a personal level, with an, on an individual level, in order to make any kind of progress. Excellent. So you gave me a great segue into my next set of questions. Let's assume many of you have worked in an environment that wasn't so great. Not like LinkedIn. LinkedIn is good. <laughs> but let's be real. There's, there's challenges everywhere. So I say that to ask you, how did you deal with it when it was you? So that we can then learn and take actions from when it may be them. Yeah, I, you know, I think probably understanding why the culture is not great, right? And again, intent versus impact, I think is important here because I think if the intent is largely good, then it's probably a culture that you can work with. You can sit down, you can have the conversations, you can start to unpack it with people and work through it and be more of a change agent. You know, if it's intentional and there's really no support there, then get out, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not somebody who believes in staying and suffering. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's good for you. I don't, you know, if there's really no path to change the culture, don't be afraid to make a change. It's not a fit for you. And I think culture fit has kind of gotten this negative term. But like, seriously, if you're not a culture fit, if people are okay being racist. That may not be a culture fit for you. Make a change. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good answer. So give me an example. I'll throw in one other thing because you gave an example about when it was your hair. Yes. Give me an example of a microaggression you've encountered um, yourself and then how you handled it. Absolutely. Um, well, I'll give an example. Um, and then it's an early career example. And I don't think I really started really addressing things until later in my career, like really dealing with the aggressions that have accumulated over time. So I think we underestimate how much we actually deal with. And the longer you are in your career, the harder it weighs on you. So my early example is, um, so I studied engineering, but my degree is collecting dust, so not, not a big deal. But my first shot, my, yours too? Yeah, the look, just. Um, so, <laughs> but I was, my first job, um, and uh, I was with a very senior principal, another woman engineer, and she, I had an office, which was rare, but she came into my office and we were talking about a project and she literally stopped mid-sentence and was like, what's your background? I mean, you have very, like, Caucasian features, but your hair is, it's like a little different. Like, who, who, what are your parents? Like, what are your parents? Wow. 
So like you mentioned, I mean, not, not micro, but very aggression, right? Um, it's aggressive. It was an aggressive. So that was my example. And I'd say that I, I didn't talk to anyone about it for a very long time. I didn't address, again, all the things that happen that accumulate over time until later. So I'm going to be the soapbox person that says, get, your, uh, get yourself a life coach, a therapist, some external help to where you are actually unpacking all of these things that sit on you year after year after year. Um, that would be my tangible advice. Don't be scared of it. I think we don't talk about it enough. We don't talk about therapy enough in communities of color. So that would be my tangible thing. If you don't have someone to talk to, try to get someone. Before I go to LaFon, great advice, great advice. Before I go to LaFon, you mentioned something in the way that you design your training at Twilio, and you wanted to have real conversations about real issues. So you brought up something, Valerie, that made me think about the fact that if you have a nick and the sword never heals, and you start to scab over, but then it gets nicked again, and it gets nicked again, and you talked about this cost of engagement, What's the cost of carrying the nick over and over and over again? I mean, it could cost you everything, right? Because if you think about the, think about the emotional weight exactly. that you start to carry every day. So even if it's not the same nick, right? It's, I, and you all have heard probably a thousand paper cuts, mm -hmm. right? Eventually you're gonna bleed out. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I've experienced it earlier, early, Early in my career, I am I am not old like Tony, but I am seasoned. <laughs> um, <laughs> mature, if you will. Um, and and I, you know, early in my career, it's not something that was talked about. It's not something I understood. There weren't a lot of people that looked like me. I grew up around here. I grew up in San Jose, so I was in the first dot com bubble and burst. And you just didn't talk. It was normal. It felt normal. Um, and what I noticed throughout my career is that it, it was just heavier and heavier, right? So all of that emotional real estate that I had every day, I was spending a good chunk of it on feeling how to, understanding how to, how to relate, understanding how to deal, like why does this hurt? I don't even know what happened, right? Um, and and that's, that's kind of what happens. It, it, it just weighs on you over time. And eventually you're like, why do I feel this way? Why am I not confident right now? Uh, you know, why do I have imposter syndrome and I can't shake it? You know, everybody goes through imposter syndrome, but if you can't shake it, there's something else weighing on you. Um, I love what you said about therapists and coaches and all of that stuff. Yes, get all the things. <laughs> because just like if you are physically sick or you're physically ill, right? And, or, or you're physically in pain, you need someone to help you through that. Um, and that's what happens when you experience microaggressions all the time, all day, every day. I think I had the advantage of growing up in an all-white country. So all that stuff happened really early. You know, that's the kind of stuff that happens. Like you're four or five years old and other kids make you feel like you're from the jungle or something. And, <laughs> and so learning early on that I wasn't going to get the acceptance from people I think has really shaped the way that I think about this stuff or maybe um, has sharpened my reflexes in that way. And so the way that I think about it now is like, are you, are you hurt because it's a reminder that you don't belong? In that case, the only thing that's gonna fix it is connection and finding connection somewhere else. Maybe not on your team, but maybe there's other people in your company, a, a tribe that you can build outside of your immediate team. Or am I just pissed? And, and if I'm pissed, I'm going to make you feel very uncomfortable. So <laughs> tell us how you really feel. So, so people who know me know that I'm very good at this. So, you know, you say some, some crazy stuff to me and I will just look at you <laughs> for as long as I need to until you're uncomfortable. That is a tactic. I like that. That's a strategy. <laughs> So um, thank you, uh, ladies, for uh, sharing some of those examples. A couple of things I wanted to dig into, because um, we want to make sure that all of you leave here with tangible actions of things you could do in case you encounter these things when you go back in real life. So you mentioned some examples of when it happened to you. What did you do? What did you say to the person, if anything? 
Yeah. So I think I'm careful to choose my words. I'm from the East Coast, so I have a quick trigger. And that's not always appropriate for the workplace. So I'm somebody who needs to take a pause and kind of step away and reflect and ask a girl, like, did that hit me wrong? Is it me? You know, because if I fire back, it's not going to be appropriate. So for me, I always implement the pause it is one. But I think kind of two main strategies, and they both came up here when you're hit with a microaggression, right? Self-care and community. You know, and I think you need to implement both, like take care of yourself. I call it my glam squad, right? No, seriously, think about powerful women, Beyonce and whoever you admire. They don't do it alone, right? And so my stylist, my trainer, my chiropractor, I call them my glam squad. Like I show up like this because there is a team of fabulous women behind me. Don't don't be fooled, you know? You, you see these women that you admire, there's a whole team, so get your team, you know? Empower your glam squad so that you can be refreshed and show up great, you know? Do the massages, you know? Take the bat, do whatever makes you feel good and wrap yourself in that. And then also community, and I think you hit on it. Find that community where you do feel safe, where you can talk about it, where you know you can be validated, where somebody's not gonna make you feel like it, you're crazy for feeling these things. And I think lean on that and, and, and be really prescriptive and intentional, especially when things get really difficult. Lean into those things more and wrap yourself in those, and I think that those are really key strategies. Go ahead. I'll tackle the, do I say something or do I not say something? <laughs> I'll try. Feel free to chime in, please. Um, I, I think it's a personal decision. Um, one of the, we mentioned trainings earlier. So beyond unconscious bias, one of the trainings that we've um, implemented or starting to implement is ally skills training. It's a workshop, right? So you workshop some scenarios to say, what would happen if this happened to you? What would you do? Right, and we work through it together, and we actually put people in those scenarios. So as much as you can, um, with your glam squad, with your girls, with whatever, play out a scenario with someone after the microaggression happens, so that you can know how to address that person when the next time you see them. That is one tactic to use. Um, if you're um, someone that wants to address things quickly and you don't want it to fester, then that's fine too. I think it's a personal decision to say. Um, if you want to take a step back and determine if you want to talk to the person or not. But I think you have to know what your, which way you're going to go, right? Like you just have to know, pick a side and use people, try to play out different scenarios so that you know that you can have that confidence to talk to that person about the thing that offended you. So I'll answer from the side of the role that I'm in and then on the personal side, because that's different. <laughs> um, <laughs> So in the role that I'm in, um, when, I, when I see that kind of behavior, sometimes I go to the science of it. Um, exclusion registers in the body as physical pain. So if you think about when you were five years old and you got picked last for the soccer team, or all your friends went out to your favorite bar and they didn't invite you, or your boss is having a conversation about your job and you're not, you're not included in that. Right? There's a reaction that you actually have. There's your, test, your chest tightens, your stomach hurts, something, right? People that observe that behavior also have a physical reaction. So if, if I watch these two ladies have a conversation and Valerie's clearly excited and you know, everybody else is just kind of like, okay, all right, Valerie, okay, whatever, right? You, all of you would have a reaction about that. And so in my role, I try to get d people to dig down into that feeling. Like, this is the way you made that person feel. And try to get them to understand their own experiences, because it's a lot easier to bring them along that way. That's the professional side. <laughs> um, now, the personal side, I, I take after my mother a little bit. Now, she kills people with kindness. So she used to be an operator for a, a, a networking company for years, 15 years. And so she would get all kinds of crazy phone calls. There's this one story she always tells where a gentleman called and was like, I need to talk to you know, Mr. So-and-so. And she says, I'm sorry, sir, he's not here right now. And he's like, I need to speak to this person right now. And who are you? And do you even know how to read? And all of these things. And then called her a, a B. And she said, sir, did you say... B? And he said, yeah. And she goes, well, your mother's not here either, so I'm not quite sure 
why you're calling her. And so sometimes, so sometimes, um, sometimes you can calmly put somebody in their place. I like to call that nice nasty. Mm -hmm. That's what I call it. That's what I call it. But the tone in which you use it, the person often doesn't know that they were just told where to go and where to put it <laughs> until later on. And they're like, ah, something, what happened? Right? And so sometimes on a personal level, I'm really nice about it, but you're going to feel it later. Simone. <laughs> I think I've been blessed with a lot of courage. So I had this lady stick her hand out to try and touch my hair. And I was like, don't touch my hair, don't touch my hair, don't touch my hair. <laughs> she was like, I wasn't gonna, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I was like, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> they always reach first. <laughs> it's always a reach first and then And not ask. even like in a way like, I care. I'm more like, look at this exotic zoo animal. <laughs> that is true though. I wanted to touch your hair too early, but I <laughs> But, but you would have asked me though. No, I just you would have asked me. <laughs> I was looking at it. Was like, cute. It's so cute. I know not to touch it. So, so. On, a, on, on a serious on, note, though. No, I was going to say before we move on. I didn't talk about what I do after I take a pause. Oh. And so I do think this comes back to <laughs> intention versus impact. So if, again, the intention was good, then I can sit down and address it and unpack it. But if it's bad, then I might choose to let it roll off. Or, or to LaFon's point, you might have to figure out how to put them in a situation where they can identify with how you're feeling. So I don't just only take a pause. You do need to address it, and you need to come back. So I did want to close the loop on that. Thank you. You were going to say something else. One thing I wanted to mention I think is important to model the behavior, even though we're, over, we're often on the receiving end of it, if I see that people in my team, in my group, in my session are uncomfortable, I will say something. If I feel like people are being stepped on, I will say something. If anyone dare do anything to my interns or talk to them crazy, we will sit down and you will be very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it is about like also, even though we're at on the receiving end of it, to take opportunities to, to step up and, and advocate for other people and to you know set boundaries when you see other people behaving in that in that way absolutely so number one we got breathe right everybody got breathe so number two was i think you said assess intent and make a real clear decision around is it an intentional act or is it aggression rather or non-intentional was it intentional and then i think the next thing you said was formulate your words next and that's what you're doing while you're breathing. Role play. Yeah, role play. Maybe role play and yeah. so that you can formulate. So that you can formulate what you want to say. And then, unless all else fails, <laughs> we won't follow the stereotype. <laughs> but you also don't have to say anything. You you're can right, literally that's just... You could say nothing. Look at them, you could stare at them, be silent. That's you don't true. have to say anything. You can walk away. The walk you away. Can, like mid-sentence. Yeah. You can, you know. Exactly. Nice. <laughs> or the nice nest, like you said. Um, one of, the reason I call that out, I, I think it's, it's real. We've all had it, right? We've all experienced this. And we've all had an opportunity to think about what's the right way to respond. There is no right way. It's the way to respond in the moment. So one of the things I looked up, there's a... Um, ladder of inference that helps you think about, I'm gonna pause first. What just triggered me? Is this me, like you said, or am I pissed off? Or is this really just happen? The other piece is never be afraid to use your words to ask questions to clarify. Because one of the things that I learned the hard way, um, and I'm not on the panel, but I'm talking, but I'm gonna tell y'all. So <laughs> one of the things I learned the hard way is I realized in my career early on, I spent a lot of time deciding what other people meant and playing the story in my own head and writing a good old book, honey, about what they meant. And I was wrong. <laughs> but the energy, as LaFon said, and the, the pain that I carried unnecessarily and the baggage that it took from job to job, oh, I can't say that, I wish I could do that. Oh, they get to laugh and talk and have fun and I can't do that. And all the conversations I was having with myself, by myself, about myself, about some <laughs> stuff that people said, it wasn't even true. So I decided 
to do it. I'm going to ask some questions for clarification. And I think that's the step that I would tell you is after you breathe, clarify. I had a coaching session with one of the uh, young ladies in the back a while back. Oh, what did you mean by that? Help me understand what made you ask that or just some ways to start the dialogue so that you can get to a deeper discussion about when you said that, I thought you meant this. I was thinking, really, girl? Oh, I can recommend that to me. So you can have a deeper, more connected conversation. But if you don't clarify, you carry. So I choose to clarify versus carry because I got too much stuff going on, honey. I should be worrying about other people's stuff. So now we're going to talk about some of your questions. We want to actually get into, if you feel comfortable going to the mic, raising your situation to this panel, we're here to help you. As the offering on the connection slide said earlier, I'm offering to help. They're offering to help. So we have a question. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this. I needed to hear this, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in the crowd who also just needed to see this being addressed. Uh, my name's Alexis. I am a first-gen high school, college, queer Latinx in tech. Woo! Uh, <laughs> and my question is, do you have any best practices or tips for microaggressions that are being done by other women of color in tech? Um, I, I know, I know. Sorry, sorry, not sorry, actually. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> that just hurt my feelings. I I'm um, pretty sure like my esophagus is just like, um, I say this because I've been in tech for three years. I did a career change. And at my first job, a woman of color, VP of product, stops mid-meeting and looks at me, a contractor, and says, do you know who you remind me of? Dora the Explorer. And, you know, to address your point of like, I've carried that. I can't get rid of that. And each company I go to, I hope it's different or, you know, I hope that by joining as the first Latinx, I won't be the only Latinx when I leave. Not the case. I hope that the next VP of product doesn't take up space and allows other women to be carried up in farther positions. Not the case. So just would love any advice and wisdom that you have around this. <laughs> you take a breath. <laughs> you look at the audience for a minute. Uh, okay, I'll what be brave. Because they got to process. I'll, I'll be brave and I'll try to uh, attempt to address this. First of all, I want to acknowledge that that's a lot, you know. Yes. Um, and I think sometimes when we were talking about the paper cuts, I want to also acknowledge when it's coming within community, those, <laughs> those cuts really actually feel deep because I think that's when you expect to feel safe. Um, and you have let down your guard. So I, I want to, first of all, acknowledge that uh, pain. But I, what I would say is, what I feel hopeful about in the time that we're in now is that we're actually trying to have difficult conversations. And I'm currently reading a book, Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. I'm a super Brene, big Brene Brown fan. And she's talking about how do you have difficult conversations in the workplace and really talking about bringing boundaries to the workplace. And so one of the reasons why I did want to clarify my point, because I didn't close it, to say come back, because I think it's important to set boundaries or else people will come back and continue to do those things. If you almost, not that they shouldn't know, so let's acknowledge that too. But if you don't tell them that wasn't okay, then sometimes people are gonna feel like, oh, I was just joking, and you know, you took it well. So I think it's important to come back, whether you need a pause first or you don't, to kind of say, like, that wasn't okay. You know, can you help me clarify? If I compared you to Goldilocks, how would that make you feel? You know, you're I'm a real person and you're comparing me to an animated character and just really try to break it down and to create analogies so that I think people can start to understand really how deep and hurtful those words are. Yeah, I'll keep my answer short because um, I know we're running out of time, but um, I, I, the strategies don't change. The tactics don't change. It's the same tactics. The cut is deeper. It hurts worse. But your best revenge is success. Keep shining. It, you, you, you asking that question, you're, I mean, you are already so aware of what's happening in your environment. You're, you're going to be just fine. So keep shining, keep doing you, and success is going to be the best revenge. And it always comes back full circle. <laughs> okay, don't burn these bridges. They always come back. I, I took a breath. I had to take a breath. Yeah, like, take <laughs> because a breath. Huh? remember I said it registers. 
as physical pain. And when you said what you said, the majority of the audience went, <gasps> right? Um, it does, it does hurt deeper. And I think you said it's a machete, it's not paper cuts at that point, right? Um, because we, we expect that we are going to lift each other up because nobody else is going to, right? So I would have done the same, I, I would have took a breath, I might have taken a walk. Um, <laughs> But I would have sat down. I would have said, hey, can we, can we just have a chat outside of the meeting that was stopped? In the meeting itself, I, I, don't, I, I probably would have reacted and have been like, oh, that's not really a compliment, but OK. And kept it moving right in the, in the big uh, meeting. But I would ask to meet with her and just say, hey, woman of color to woman of color, I just need you to know how that made me feel. And the fact that you said it in a meeting. You stopped business to tell me this. And I, I need you to understand how that made me feel and then see where she's coming from. Maybe it was just a flippant, ignorant remark. Maybe there's something else going on. But at least you made the effort to make that personal connection to say, hey, like, just in case there's another one of us that comes through the door, this is how it makes somebody feel. And, and hope that she realizes it and it was just a dumb moment because everyone's human and then you, you, you would have a stronger relationship with that person going forward. I doubt that she would do it again. I'm gonna take one more question. Yeah, something you want to add to. I would just say make her feel guilty. <laughs> like, I was so happy to be working with you. I was so excited. I, was, I admire you so much, and that just really disappointed me. <laughs> it's the eyes, y'all. A cup for a cup. It's the stare. It's the stare. Are y'all looking at the eyes it's when she's saying it? Come on up. It's the stare. It's the stare. We got to practice the stare. Okay, so we're going to take one more question from the um, audience, and then we'll be closing out. What's your question, dear? Hi. Um, my name is Tamika Bowman, and um, well, first I'd just like to say thank you so much. Um, I actually specifically owned a... Um, <laughs> say thank you to Valerie because actually um, I was in this position where I was trying to um, find somewhere else to be and find these different things and took a really long time and reached out to so many people, used a lot of LinkedIn. And <laughs> Valerie is one of the people that I was able to contact and through a friend of a friend and you took the time to speak with me and give me advice and really... Um, support me, and I found so many people who did that for me um, that I didn't expect, and I just wanted to take the time to say thank you. <laughs> um, and then my actual question. <laughs> um, so similar to Simone, I grew up in a place that um, allowed me to know my differences really early, so I learned different ways to communicate and figure out how to navigate that. But um, where I struggle is um, advocating with for other people's um, identities and different microaggressions that I see in my face that aren't necessarily towards me or towards my many different identities. Um, and where I struggle is when to speak, when you're speaking up for or acting as an advocate or an ally and when you're speaking over. Um, and not giving that person the space to speak for themselves or maybe like speaking from my own experience, but that's not exactly how they feel or how they would have put it or there's other parts of their background that I'm not considering. Um, and I was wondering if you could help with some advice on how to navigate that and how to do better. <laughs> so. Because we're close to time, I'm going to give it to Valerie because you're her mentor. So I'll let you answer that. I, I think the first thing is actually going to the, the person that was offended, right? I, I do think you have to have that conversation first. Um, if it's in a meeting or a room setting, right? If you, if you see something happening in a meeting setting. Um, so I do think that conversation is critical before you try to address the person that did the offending. Um, and that person may want to use that as an opportunity to address that person by themselves. So sometimes you are not the right person. Um, if you are in a manager position, you are always the right person. 
Okay, so let's just be clear there. Um, but I think the important thing there is just to go to the person first, to have a dialogue with that person, to make sure that you are not um, coming into their space because they may want to address it in a different way. This panel's been real, y'all. <laughs> I enjoyed it, and we hope you did too. Thank you so much. Our exit stage, ladies. Breathe. Get your stare together. All those other tips. Thank you so much, Lori, the panel. I appreciate you guys being so transparent with that discussion. Um, when I looked at the agenda, that was probably the first panel discussion that I was most interested in because we've all experienced the microaggressions. Um, and I like what we talked about in terms of culture fit. And I also wanna point out the fact that it, these conversations are so valuable when we're talking to women that are in leadership positions. Um, I was having a conversation with Ty yesterday when Lonnie and I met with her, and she was like, when you kind of move up the ranks, some people may think it gets easier, but it does not necessarily get easier. Um, and I love Jeanette's comment about the glam squad because I experienced something where I was out at a team event, and this was a macro aggression, y'all, okay? Um, I was talking to a colleague, we were out wine tasting, and she said the N-word, used nappy hair, and referenced her sister's boyfriend being too dark to show up in pictures. Me, by myself, y'all, me. And I'm just like, I was so, I was frozen. And I had to take that breather, I had to take that moment and excuse myself. And I called one of my girls, one of my, my best friends, who I know here from LinkedIn, Afia, she's here today. And I went in the bathroom, I was in the stall, like, sis, this is what just happened. I, I need you to help me make sense of this. And I'm so glad that I took that five, 10 minutes, cause you know how you like picture scenarios in your head and it's like, this is how I normally react. I'm gonna turn up, I'm gonna go off. But <laughs> this is also my job and my livelihood. So I don't have the, the luxury of reacting that way. I spoke to Afia about it. I spoke to some other colleagues and allies. And that Monday morning, her and I were in a conference room and she is very nice, you know, we're, we're cordial, but it, it threw me off. And so these, these conversations are so much appreciated and you know, it's important. And I know that being a black woman, being a woman of color in corporate or tech, you feel very isolated. So if there is a microaggression that comes at you, I know a lot of times I look to my right, look to my left, I don't have somebody, I can be like, <laughs> you know, so you always have to take that five minutes. So I so appreciate the transparency in that discussion and I hope you guys enjoyed that as well. So moving right along, y'all. Um, everybody good? Energy up? Enjoying yourselves? All right, give me some feedback. All right, good, thank you. So next we're gonna be talking a little bit about finding your power and becoming an influencer. So we have one of our very own, Miss Jacqueline Jones, uh, here from LinkedIn. She is a beautiful Harvard brainiac and she is a yogi or a yogalisha, as I would normally call it. <laughs> Um, and we also have, and my apologies in advance if I do not say your last name correctly, Mahima Muralid Haran. Did I say it? Yes, I got it, okay. <laughs> she is the Chief Psychology Officer at Teatros, and she's focused on the science of what makes people tick. She's been working on that since the 90s, y'all. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Jackie and Mahima to the stage. Hey everybody, how are you doing? Excellent, excellent. I saw you all digging my background there. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> Thank you. You got me that. Um, so I'm super excited about this um, discussion, this fireside chat. Um, I'm known and my company is someone who like definitely is about solutions. And this talk is around how to find your power and become an influencer. And there's a lot behind that because um, it's really about claiming who you are and how do you build that process. And it addresses a lot of what we spoke about today, throughout the day. So this session is about digging in in terms of what do we do about it, right? So I want to introduce um, uh, Mahima, who is lovely and smart, Dr. Mohan <laughs> Muralid Haran. 
Did I say that right? Okay, cool. I practiced. Um, <laughs> Uh, she's amazing, a very intelligent, accomplished uh, degrees in, from both the United States and India, uh, practiced, uh, you're a licensed psychologist, you are a co-founder of a company uh, here in Silicon Valley, and also a chief psychology officer of Teatros. And there's, there's just three of her roles, so she's not only accomplished, she's a little bit of a slacker, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome and embracing it. Um, we are so excited that you're here. And um, we had a fabulous chat yesterday, and uh, we'll just kind of like jump in because I asked you um, what is, first of all, how did you hear about Transform Her? And we'll lead into what inspires you to be here. So, how did you hear about Transform Her? Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. I I actually did not know anything about Transform Her until Vivian, who's actually presenting in a few minutes after me, um, connected me to the team that was putting this together. And the way I w met Vivian was um, at Salesforce, so I helped them kind of create a program for um, pregnant moms who were gonna take maternity leave and then return back. Um, and as we all know, that's, that, that can be quite a struggle emotionally. And I kind of felt that there was a big need for that. Um, and Vivian and I worked together on that. But I want to say, I think the, I've had these experiences where I've connected with someone, um, mostly women, and then they think of me for something else that they may might be a part of. And those connections have just felt incredibly powerful. And so when Vivian connected me, I took a look at what this was about, and it was very exciting. The number one reason I'm here is because I wanted to actually put myself intentionally in a space that looks like this, because this is not part of my everyday life. Mm -hmm. And to see so many people who kind of reflect you in some version of who you are, that's a new experience, and I'm absolutely digging it. So <laughs> happy to be here. Um, so that's kind of an answer to Yeah, yeah. Um, you also reminded me of something that I wanted to say when I first came up here, is that um, I really acknowledge you for being here, uh, for creating the space for such honesty and vulnerability, and also, too, just creating a space where we all can learn from each other and just draw strength from each other. So there's like a really special energy in this room that I encourage you to take advantage of and just connect with other people. And this is like a result in terms of you being connected through somebody from Salesforce, right, being pulled into this community. And through our conversation yesterday, like um, one of the things that really grabbed me was, and, and you may want to expand on this a little bit, mm -hmm. You said, I meet incredibly powerful, fierce women that look like a lot of women in this room. Yes. Who show up in my office and what, like, how do they show up? Yes. Well, I, th I think, um, let me kind of set the stage for this. So I've been a practicing psychologist. I've worked with families and children for many years. And then I kind of found myself shifting out of that role. Um, not in an intentional way, but what happened was, as a therapist, uh, particularly someone of color, there aren't that many of us actually yet practicing therapists. So I had a lot of folks of color, women of color, come to see me in my psychotherapy practice. And for a long time, I didn't kind of see this as a pattern, but there was a pattern, which is, I before I would meet some with some of them, the resume would be intimidating to me. I, I would have imposter syndrome times 10, which actually I think for a lot of women of color, when you think about imposter syndrome, it's not just imposter syndrome, it's imposter syndrome on steroids. And then these women would show up and then start talking about their story and somewhere along the way, there would always be disbelief on their part about who they were that this story that was created about them was not true. Um, 
and really kind of crippling anxiety around what to do with that and how to move forward. And then in addition to that, what I started noticing was a lot of these women had also internalized the unconscious biases that were all around them. And so it was getting kind of enacted in a way that just kept that cycle going. Um, so one example of that maybe would be, um, I was at a leadership conference a while back and there was sort of a similar fire chat, a fireside chat and the person interviewing, also a woman of color, introduced one of the presenters and said, um, you know, I, I want to really give a shout out. This is the most badass tech leader that there is, you know, kind of really pumping her up. And we do that all the time, right? I was very excited by that. But uh, what I also realized was this person had a lot of other traits like sensitivity, grace, um, a kind of pace that is actually quite calming to be around. But none of that was actually highlighted as the reason for success. Because this bad acidness, I think, is like a lovely thing. We all, yeah, I want to be you that. Be like I that. totally get that. <laughs> but in doing that, I think we're actually perpetuating sexism, too, um, in a way that's just constantly internalized. And then you take that message in and run with it and don't stop. Right. So in other words, you start believing the stereotypes of what other people say and how you're supposed to be. Yes. So let's get into what you actually do about it. I'm actually going to skip into that. Yeah. Right? Um, we heard a lot about the issues, and we've learned that we're internalizing it in some way. So how do we now take all of this and turn you know, our lemons into lemonade? Mm -hmm. Right? How do we turn this into our strength? Yeah. I kind of think of that in three different ways. Um, and I want to start with the personal, and I've heard this be named a little while ago in some of the other panels. Self-awareness, I think, is self-care. There is no self-care in my mind without self-awareness. Um, and that can come in many different shapes or forms, right? And I'm um, really aware that, for example, going to see a therapist isn't always an option for many of us. There's a lot of stigma attached to it. but Self-awareness is something you actually can start doing right now, this minute, right? You're thinking about what does it feel like to hear me speak? What are some of your thoughts? L really learning to track that, I think, gives you an opportunity to actually change your narrative, which is my sort of second um, takeaway. Narratives are incredibly important, and we've heard the importance of creating your story. But I want to highlight something about that. When you, create, when you don't create a narrative, somebody else creates one for you. And then you realize that even if you do have somewhat of a narrative, the gaps in your narrative gets filled in by somebody else's bias, usually. And so this is critically important, just trying to find a way to take charge of your story. And I, and I don't mean it in writing or, you know, you don't have to broadcast it. But I think it's a sort of a small action that we could all take to really be thoughtful about who you are. So when you have that, I think that gives you a very sturdy foundation. And when then you're in biased situations, you actually know, oh, that's not me. And so the not me gives you a chance to kind of let it bounce off of you. Love that. Um, and the third thing I want to say is just collective, the power of the collective and collective responsibility. And by that, I mean, I think we each as individuals actually have a responsibility towards each other, right? This is how you build community. And so when you see someone automatically putting themselves down in your presence, I think disrupting that process for them is really important. And it's a small action, right? Like you could stop that person and say, I don't see you that way at all. What are you talking about? That is a pretty important moment of reframe for that person. I think that's huge. So I want to dig in more into the community because we heard community, 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 community. Yes. In fact, um, 
that was my one of my biggest takeaways when I went to see Michelle Obama speak. Mm -hmm. She's like, always have your fans. Mm -hmm. Always be surrounded by your fans who just think you're great and who will always reinforce that. Yes. Um, say more about how important that is, that accountability in that community. Yes. Um, you know, it, it's uh, just as we're talking about our face value, it seems like oh, that's easy to do, right? It's not. And the reason it's not is I think in order to really build strong communities, we each have to be working towards a level of self-awareness. And for that, by that I mean really thinking about your intersectional identity, for example. It's a great way to start. Because I think if you think about your identity in multiple different ways, you might actually see that your powerlessness in one identity is compensated somewhat by some amount of power in another part of your identity. So for me, as a cisgender woman, I hold a lot of power that I don't hold as a woman of color, for example. But finding that balance means what happens is when you are in a group of people and you are able to really use the power that you have to either speak on someone else's behalf or confront someone or disrupt a process, I think then you collectively rise together, right? And we, we, we have this going on in different constellations, and I, I think this is what I mean by community and a responsibility towards each other and so, leading with that. So you're saying that we could be each other's advocate? Yes. In a very... Um I love this, in a very forward-leaning, fierce way to just keep each other, in order to recognize each other's greatness at all times. That's right. so, yeah, I mean, yes, and it's also just, there's so much wordless community right here in this space, right? Like, this means something. It's awesome. And I don't feel like sometimes you always have to put that into words, mm -hmm. but put it into action. Love it. Love it. And everyone, please think of questions. I'm going to um, go to the mic pretty soon. Um, but yeah, no, this is great. This is great. So tell me, I love all the stuff that you've been doing, but I want to hear more about your company because you found a really great way to tie together all that you're learning about, you know, how to serve underserved communities. You've learned, you know, how to identify the effect, impacts of some of this internalized um, biases. biases. You've been helping people overcome it. How have you now turned that in into a company in mm -hmm. order to do good for many people? Yeah, um, I think for me the path to that is um, it, ha it's, it hasn't been a linear one. I've done different things to kind of get to this point. But what really strikes me as kind of my motivating force, I believe in democratizing some of the ideas, knowledge, right? Democratizing knowledge. So you could go to a therapist to work on some of the stuff that we've already talked about. But when that's not an option, that information and that knowledge should be still available to you. And I really believe in that. And so any initiative that helps me scale that, I'm really interested in. So some of the ventures I'm working on right now is really how to take um, really basic knowledge about mental health and emotional functioning to take it into communities that actually don't have access to that and will never have access to that because we're not, you know, the catching up is going to happen over a long time. Um, but we have technology, and so I'm very curious about how to use the technologies we have to reach communities that are underserved in that way. So tell me more about Teatros. So Teatros um, was actually founded by a um, veteran. Um, it's based out of San Francisco. And they have created successfully, even before I joined them, um, several programs that kind of rise workplace well-being. Um, and in the healthcare sector, there's a lot of work that we do around um, brain cancer survivors and their caregivers, um, giving them emotional uh, psychoeducation and emotional knowledge um, training, resilience trainings online. Um, we're doing work with schools administrators, um, teachers, um, so there's another pocket of work there. Um, 
And my favorite, which I'm actually working on right now, is really building a course on inclusive leadership um, and how to create resilient leaders um, and all the components that go into that. Awesome, awesome. So um, if there are any questions, um, let us know. We'll, we'll definitely open up to the mic. Um, but I th this has been an amazing discussion just in terms of different tips and tools that we could do in terms of surrounding ourselves with community, making sure that you know we're surrounded by people who will mm -hmm. hold us accountable to yes. how great we are. Uh, also, too, in terms of being self-aware, Yeah. right? Um, definitely things that we need to just keep in mind and also controlling our narrative. Mm -hmm. One of the things I found in, uh, incredibly helpful, actually, um, is that um, controlling your narrative is probably one of the most important mm -hmm. things that you could do. Yes. Like, put it out there, what uh, you want people to say about you, and, yeah. control, and, and have that be... I mean, if there's one thing you have control over exactly. somewhat, it's exactly. that. <laughs> Let's take a question. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Monique Shields, and I am a women's leadership coach. And uh, something you said earlier really resonated with me in terms of your story about um, this badass woman and all of the grace and calming effect, et cetera, et cetera, that also contributed to success. And um, in my work, I'm really curious about how we can shift that narrative. And I just would love your thoughts. Yeah. Um, I want to say I think the most basic way to do that is actually name the things that aren't being named. Right? So if you are in an art, I mean, it's harder to do when it's being enacted on stage, for example. But if you're in a team meeting, for, right, I think I would pay attention to what are those moments when particularly women of color are praised for something. And if you sense any hint of sexism, whether it's from other, you know, other women, in your presence are men, I think gently kind of shifting the conversation to even say, hey, but I also noticed this thing about, right? And that's a reframe, and it's not huge action, but I think if we can do that in micro doses, it can change something. I also want to say that some of those um, actions, those small actions, are not really small actions, but they're just like, they're huge, right? Because they'll make a difference in someone's life. Yeah, and I um, want to share a little example sure. to kind of illustrate that. So I grew up in southern India, and if you're familiar with um, India, patriarchy is kind of entrenched in many pockets, right? But I had this experience as a teenager. I would notice these women in our community post-lunch, it's siesta time, everyone's sleeping, but these group of women would kind of get together secretly walking into someone else's home, like in the community, and it would be a different house each time. And I was puzzled by this. It's just like kind of odd activity, right? And I realized that that was their financial independence. So what was happening was it was an underground banking structure almost, right? And if you're wearing a sari, there aren't that many places you could hide anything. And so they would have money in their blouses and they would go to someone's home. And on a monthly basis, they were creating kind of a chit fund, which was a fund that other women, you know, you could dip into pretty much any time. That's a brilliant example of collective power, yeah. right? It's what, I mean, you could, activism is fantastic and you could fight, fight patriarchy that way, but this is kind of a sneaky, more fun way, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. But that, it's small action, but yeah, you know, it's, it's huge. huge magnitude in terms of impact. Huge. Um, so I think we're at time. Um, thank you so much. If there are not any questions, I don't want to... Did you want to ask something? Please. <laughs> We'll squeeze one in. Hi, my name is LaShonda King, founder of LDK. So my background is as a counselor and as a teacher and educator. And trying to make my way into the tech space, I feel like um, so many companies and so many HR departments and talent acquisition specialists really overlook the skill sets that are transferable between those with the psychology and counseling background, those with a teaching, educating, and facilitation background. Uh, what would you suggest for someone like me trying to bring my niche of mental health and education into this space? Yeah, 
great question. And I think um, my immediate kind of association to that is play up soft skills. I hate that word. They're not soft skills. But I think when you introduce yourself as an expert in that, suddenly people stand up and listen because it's, it's a missing piece, right? And leadership movements in general are becoming really aware of that. And so I think, going back to the narrative, I think it's also a way for you to actually create a narrative that includes that expertise that you can then present more confidently. Thank you, and I'm going to connect with you. Great. <laughs> I'd love to. Um, actually, I have one other question I wanted to touch on. And I may, we, we should if, issue a call to action uh, to, the, yes. to the crowd here, because it's all about Transformers about solutions, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, one thing that you referred to in our conversations I wanted to kind of go back to mm -hmm. was looking at systemic versus individual, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what is this question around fix the woman versus fix the system? Yeah. It's one of the things that kind of came up in our discussion. Yes. I mean, it's one of my uh, favorite topics I could spend the next six <laughs> hours on. Um, I think there are a lot of fix the woman approaches out there. So I'm not going to pay you the same, but you go to a training and learn how to ask for a raise, right? It's a familiar kind of scenario. That's what I mean by fix the, w fix the woman approach. The fix the system approach is that we're all realizing that we're actually part of those systems and we have decision-making capacity in those systems. And so if we don't collectively kind of come together and change policy, for example, we're always going to be in the fix the woman system. Um, again, that's another way to think about collective responsibility. Love it. Love it. So thank you for that. Thank you for sure. that. Um, so one of the, on this theme of creating a new narrative, one of the things that we really wanted to sort of like challenge everyone to do, right, is to just take a minute and turn to the person next to you. This is like church. <laughs> 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 right? But this, I want you to take just literally 10 seconds to create three words, just three words, in terms of what will your narrative be leaving the room today, moving into the future. Yeah. Three words to describe three who words you to are. describe yourself, describe who you are. And don't think, don't judge it, just say it. Lonnie, you can do it. All right, did you have enough time? Lots of energy here, this is good. <laughs> All right, everyone, I'm gonna rein it back. I know. Does everyone have their three words? We're gonna continue during the break, but does everyone have their three words? All right, All right. cool. Anyone wanna shout out their three words? My, go to the mic. <laughs> New narrative. My name three is words. Afia. Oh, this one. My name is Afia Addison, and my three words are passionate, communicator, and personality. Because I like to bring my whole self to any situation. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for having us. This is a great discussion. Please um, join me in thanking Mahima for her great advice and insights. Thank you. It's been lovely to be here. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jackie and Mahima, for that wonderful discussion and sharing those gems. Really appreciate it. Um, I love the conversation about collective responsibility because I feel like it reigns true in this room. That's exactly what we're doing today. Like Ty said, 
we're not waiting for somebody to give us a seat at the table, okay? We're going to take the seat ourselves, okay? So with that being said, I'm going to uh, release us for a break. Please be back in your seats, you know, seat at the table. <laughs> um, 410. It's 405 right now, so if we can have you guys back at 410, that would be ideal. Yes, five minutes. Thanks, guys. And there's snacks in the foyer, too, so get you a snack. For this Black History Month, I decided to come back to where it all began. I grew up in this very building and played on these very steps in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. I came back here because it's really, really important to understand where you came from in order to value and appreciate where you are now and where you're headed in the future. I grew up on this block with other Brown families just like me, whose parents like mine worked and hustled day to day and showed us what true grit was like. Michelle Obama said in her book, and I quote, I grew up in a small house with not much money in a starting to fail neighborhood. And I also grew up surrounded by love and music in a diverse city. I had nothing or I had everything. It depends on which way you want to tell it. I couldn't agree more with our former first lady. This place ain't half bad. Once you get more senior ladies, it's not about the work. There is an assumption of equity once you get more senior. Oh, everybody's about the same. Everybody's pretty good. Now, you know as well as I do, there might be a lot of daylight between you and somebody else. But there's an assumption of equity at that level around experiences and capabilities. So what makes a difference is who knows you well enough to spend some currency on your behalf. And one of the reasons that I wrote about this, and I'm so excited about talking about this and other topics like this as an influencer, is because I kept asking myself the question, why do we have so much trouble getting that critical sponsor relationship that makes the difference? Because it's not about the intelligence and it's not about the work ethic, but why can't we get that relationship where somebody will sponsor us. And I finally got to the conclusion that many of us in this room have trust issues. Mm-hmm. I knew I'd get some amens in here. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And if somebody has done something that has crossed your line, you simply shut down and say, I'm going to do my job. They're not going to maybe say anything about my job, but I'm not going to do all that engaging. I'm just going to do my job. And the problem with that is that you hold back that piece of you that somebody needs in order to get to know you that will give them the comfort in sponsoring you. So I realize that so many people don't have the language, Lauren, and they don't have the tools to maximize their success. They have the intelligence, they have the pedigree, they have the experience, they have the degrees, but they don't have the tools and the language. And that's one of the things that I think is my special gift and I wanna be able to help people so that they can maximize their success either in the seat that they're in or the seat that they aspire to sit in. You create a yes and the world rises to the possibility you've created. And sometimes we don't give ourselves the yes. We walk around with great ideas and we don't share them. Either because we fear that someone will take them, or worse, we fear that someone's going to hold us accountable for it. That they're going to come around and ask, what happened to that idea you had? What are you doing about it? This is the space where ideas are meant to be nurtured, shared. So I want to hear your ideas today. I want you thinking powerfully in your most powerful way of being, what it looks like to stand in the presence of an idea that has become reality. Because what we're doing today is just that. It's an idea that became reality because we knew that you were out there waiting for this opportunity. We knew that at LinkedIn, we create possibilities all the time. And our possibilities are all about powerful relationships that matter. We had a vision of each of you being in the room, growing connected to each other. So any pretense, any make-believe goes out the window. Presume we know each other, and then tell me about yourself. Presume that you've got an idea that I can contribute to and invite people into your world. Presume that everything that happens today is designed to have you realize and fulfill the best self you ever dreamed of being, because that's who you are when you walked in the door. I get impatient with the women of color are having a moment hype because we can't afford for it to be a moment. Mm -hmm. um, if we're due a moment, it's way overdue. 
and we've been at this for a very long time. So, you know, I think it can't be a moment, it's got to be a movement, and it can't be a, a movement that's just here for now and gone tomorrow. It's got to gain momentum, mm -hmm. and we've got to figure out how to sustain it, and we've got to change a mindset, mm -hmm. um, a national mindset, a global mindset, a corporate mindset. Um, it has to shift. It has to right. shift. A few years back, I actually went to the women, um, the Black Women in Power conference that Caroline Clark hosts. And um, I was just so inspired by all of the energy that was in the room. And I remember one of the panelists talked about applying for a position that's slightly out of your reach. And at that point, I was a manager, and I really felt like I'm not, I didn't know, I didn't have the confidence to really to apply for that director level position. But I went ahead and did it, and I got the position. Through my job, I'm able to do the things that I'm passionate about. This might not mean much to anyone, but this means a lot to me. Like, if you can find, when you can like physically feel your soul getting fed and your heart getting fuller when you're doing something, like, it, honestly, everything just like comes to you. Like, I really haven't had to like reach out. It usually, they usually just come to me, and then like, I have to just like take it, and then you have to ask the universe for it. But if you want like a tangible thing, um, I would say um, if you already know what that is. Um, there, because we work in technology, you can kind of find an intersection with any passion right. in technology. Um, and to just really like utilize like the network that you have here and to start asking for it and not be afraid to talk about it. And to, because uh, not everyone knows what to, like how to do it. Like most of us don't know how to do it. You just like pretend and then you go and then everything kind of just like comes to you. Um, so like even with the Smithsonian project, like none of us had the skills to make a 3D installation. Like what? <laughs> like I work in ads. So <laughs> yeah, so, um, but it, it like it comes along the way. And as long as you have like a vision, then I would say um, just like keep talking about it and like don't stop talking about it and someone will finally listen to you.
Hello, everybody. Hello. If we can migrate back to our seats, we can keep this fun going. The energy, the vibe. Everybody's got some snacks. Grab your snacks. Oh, grab your bio coffee. Bio break. Grab your keep water. The going. All right, Miss Amanda, who are you wearing today? Oh, girl, <laughs> I'm featuring a look from Zara with the dress. Okay. And Aldo with the shoes. Okay. Sugar. <laughs> So you got to tell us who you're wearing. Well, jumpsuit. Yep, I got a little bit of Ann Klein on top. Yeah. Little Fashion Nova on the bottom. Yes. <laughs> yes. You see it. We love it. it. <laughs> and, and a little, and a little Marshalls. Yes. <laughs> fashion, girl. You know, fashion. You might go make it all yes. work. Make we got some good, work. good fashions on the audience today too. I must say. Um. So as we're kind of bringing it back in bringing it back to our seats. I do want to remind everybody, I love that you guys are networking and meeting people in between breaks, but there is going to be a network reception on the third floor afterwards. So don't feel rushed to have these conversations with the five minutes that we're giving you guys. Remember that there will be time um, afterwards to network and meet new people. And I think we'll have a number of the speakers um, from today at the networking event. So just keep that in mind. So. Guess who's keynotes next, y'all? Ours. <laughs> Hostess is with the mostest. Yes. We're going to be talking to you about building your brand at LinkedIn and building your brand holistically. You know, something that I've shared with um, many people is, uh, you know, going up in life, I, I can relate to some of the conversations of just kind of people wondering, who are you or what are you? You know, you look mixed. You look like you got something or another. So, but I struggled through that throughout my whole life because I didn't know really who I was from a race perspective, from a person perspective, from a professional perspective. Uh, but when I got to the point where I embraced who I was in my brand and that I did, it's so empowering. And the one thing that I wanna start off with is letting us all know that it's something that's kind of cliche, but you are unique and we all have facets of who we are. And those facets of who we are are unique to just us. There's only one you. And really, when you think about that, there's only one you on this planet. <laughs> so thinking about the intensity of that and your brand and what does that mean for you, right? So how many of us are in social media? Come on now. OK, Facebook. OK, Instagram, Snapchat. OK, so this is all your brand. This is all your yeah. brand. So Facebook for me is my chronicle of my life. My kids, you know, they're in sports, birthdays. My husband tells me I don't cook enough, so I cook a big meal and I snap a picture of it. <laughs> but when I do. <laughs> <laughs> Instagram, Instagram is my five minutes of shame, of fame, y'all. I go through, I follow all the celebrities. I got P. Diddy I click on all the time. DJ Khaled, Beyonce and I are connected, Rihanna. This is just my time to kind of shine and with celebrity syndrome. Those that want to follow me, I let them in a little bit on my life. You know, I got an upgrade for nine years, so I put that on there. I'm like, bling, you see it? Yes, nine Diamonds years. Diamonds are girl's best friend. Yes. <laughs> I'm married for love, y'all. I earn this one. Okay. I'm okay. married for money. I don't care for money. <laughs> and then Snapchat. Snapchat has the best filters. Uh, hands down. Holla if you hear me. Snap, yep. We were using yes. them earlier. Yep. Mm, so if okay. you see one on it, IG. That's right. where it came from. Yep. And it allows you, for me, it's like your ego, my alter ego. You know, all them different pictures and faces to kind of be fun about it. I never imagined myself as an egg. And then I put there, and I am a green-eyed, big-lipped egg. <laughs> it was a fun experience. But then you have LinkedIn. So LinkedIn's platform is your professional identity, is who you are in the world of profession, is your contribution to business and technology, and your blueprint to make that be seen. So that's what we want to talk to you guys about today. And when we think about using LinkedIn to build a presence and realize your potential, there are these areas that we want to you guys to really think about and resonate on. Establishing your profile, establishing not only your profile as it looks on LinkedIn, but establishing your profile within yourself. What does your profile mean to you? And what are you portraying to the world? Thought leadership. Where do you have thoughts that you want to provoke in other people and be brave enough to put that out there? And building your network. Relationships matter. It's not a cliche culture of LinkedIn. It's reality. I've seen it throughout all the beautiful people here today. Some I haven't seen in a while. Some I just met. But building your powerful network is important. And then keep learning. Always strive and look for where LinkedIn is an awesome platform that keeps you in touch with business and technology. So it allows you to keep learning and plugging in. So leveraging our platform to do that is also something that's very important and can add value to your career. So when we're thinking about com compelling and building your network, 
Amanda? Yeah, so building your network, what how that resonates with me is I actually got the job here at LinkedIn by building my network. Um, I used to work at Google and I was leading new hire training, met a friend who worked here at LinkedIn. A couple years later, I was looking for some new opportunities. He knew a hiring manager here um, and he said, connect with him on LinkedIn. Now, fun fact about me, I'll be completely transparent. I didn't have a LinkedIn until I needed a job, which was 2015. I didn't have a profile. I was offline. I've grown, obviously. <laughs> um, so I connected with um, Hector, who was my hiring manager here at LinkedIn. And two days later, I had a message in my inbox saying, hey, Amanda, I see we have a, a really good mutual friend on LinkedIn. I also look at your, looked at your background. You'll be a great fit for this role I'm hiring for. And the rest was history, sugar. OK? <laughs> um, so when we talk about networking, that portion of building your brand on LinkedIn really resonates with me. So we kind of have a few tips on building a powerful network on LinkedIn. Um, there you go. Got you. OK. I'll do the click. Yeah. So we want to talk about why is this relevant. So 70 to 80% of the jobs that are available are not published. How many people in here have ever gotten a job through networking, knowing somebody, friend of a friend? See, that's a lot of people in the room. So it's really important to keep that in mind. It's not always going to be you going on you know, LinkedIn or any other job website and filling out um, an application. It's always going to be a little bit about your network. Um, and building like a win-win ecosystem is critical. And that's not just in your immediate core role, but that's also in your relationships, whether that's personal, friendships, people that you meet here today. Hint, hint. OK. Um, <laughs> also, you also want to make sure you're unlocking the, the knowledge that your network has. I mean, I have a lot of friends who work in a lot of different roles, a lot of different companies, and I can learn so much from them. And just talking to them can help me find and create opportunity for myself. Um, and then. Last but not least, being a connector is powerful. How many people in oh. here have been the person to make the plug for somebody to get a job or an opportunity? Ooh. Referrals, friend of a friend, connecting somebody through email. I think there was a young lady who got up and asked a question earlier, and she said she met Valerie through a friend of a friend. It's powerful and it's huge. And when you think about it, you can really make a positive impact on somebody's life when you do that, whether it's their career or just by building you know, more personal, meaningful personal relationships. So with that being said, make sure you get in, stay connected, which I feel like we did a lot of today. But let's keep the momentum going when you're at the networking um, event after the fact. Just make sure you're connecting with people on LinkedIn and make sure you stay in touch. You know, keep that network um, moving and growing. So we want to make sure that outreach is key. Everybody in here comfortable with people you meet today reaching out to you? That's a yes, OK. We got it on camera. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and um, exactly. After every meeting you have, just make sure that you, know, you send them a personal note, a thank you note. My dad taught me that years ago when I first started. I was new to my career in interviewing. He's like, make sure you send them a thank you card. I'm like, OK, you mean like an email? He's like, no, no. Think about writing them a note, a good old thank you note. I know I, when somebody sends me a thank you card, I feel, you know, I feel really good about that. So make sure you keep that in mind. Um, you want to give and request recommendations. So how many people on here, on their LinkedIn pro profile, somebody's given them a recommendation or you've given somebody a recommendation? That's that huge. Going. And it is, and it's OK to ask for a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Don't hesitate. Um, Lonnie, I'll pass you the clicker, girl. OK. And the other part, oh, it, it's went through, went to the other side. But the other thing to remember is every element of your LinkedIn profile is very important. So as a TA professional, my, um, I've been in the industry for a very long time and we used to look at just skill sets and degree and all of those other things. In this climate, in this day and age, recruiters go a bit beyond that. And we look at kind of key attributes or signs of key attributes that we can see in people. So be encouraged to leverage your LinkedIn platform to express who you are. What are the things that are meaningful to you? as an individual, as a professional, um, as a person. These are the things that are going to stand out to those that are like-minded. And that's where the opportunity for you to fulfill your passion will lie, in those opportunities. Something so small like your summary. How many of you have a summary, fluid slump, summary page on your profile page? Very good. So I didn't know that that was so important until I went into an interview and a manager asked me about what I wrote on my summary. I was like, ooh, uh, did I write that? <laughs> I was like, well, I might want to pay a little bit more attention 
listen to that, but the impact of that. And it was a description of who I was as a professional, as I described it, that lured that individual to want to know more about me. So even your headline, you know, a little ping of what it says, a talent acquisition professional or recruiter, they're going to look for little signals of things that resonate. And so be sure that they are true to you, that they are authentic to who you are as a person, so that those right opportunities where you're going to be able to fulfill your dream and reach your full potential with authenticity will come through those keywords and through the expression of yourself on your LinkedIn profile. So don't look at it as a resume. Look at it as your professional identity on the internet. And what we will do is continue to connect you, the world's professionals, to make us all more productive and successful. Amazing. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on. We have another speaker and a lot of great fun. So I want to thank everybody for coming. The energy here. So many people that I've met. It's been so powerful. I know Amanda can agree. Yes. It's, it's an awesome time to be with all such beautiful people. Audience, for sure. Okay, so we're gonna have a fireside chat. The fireside chat is going to talk about, ooh, this is a topic I understand. <laughs> Winning strategies during pregnancy, maternity leave, and returning to work. How many of us are mamas? Mamas, okay, I got four kids. I've been a mama more than half my life, and, and I she need looks some great. strategies around She looks great, though. Four kids, I <laughs> Thank mean, you. Thank I you need so it. much, yeah. but I need some strategies <laughs> around it. So this powerful human being that's going to come talk to us about this and moderate the conversation, our moderator of this segment is a longtime LinkedIner, y'all. Seven and a half years at LinkedIn, which means 90 to 95% of the employees at LinkedIn started after her. Just put that into perspective. <laughs> this is Ms. Heidi Anderson. Our guest for the time is coming up, attended not one, not two, but three prestigious schools, Oxford, Dartmouth, and Harvard. This is Ms. Vivian Way. There we go. Thank you, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so I'm Heidi. And it's correct, I've been at LinkedIn for quite a while, seven and a half years, I just felt like a dinosaur hearing how long I've been here and how many more have come after me. Um, but it's a true privilege to be here. What an exciting and fantastic event. So thank you to the core team who are putting this on. Also excited because I'm joined by Vivienne, who is an executive at Salesforce. She is also the mom of two beautiful girls, three and 11 months. So the topic of parenthood and how to think about pregnancy, maternity leave, returning to work, you got it right here. Um, not only has she been an accomplished executive, but she also written this, authored this amazing book called Labor Force. So we'll talk a little bit more about her book. And what I like about it is incredibly actionable. Like all those little questions that you're asking yourself or you try to wrap your head around this new life event, job number two, which turns out to be job number one in life. Like, how do you approach that? And so this book really gives some really tactical guidance on it. But before I let Vivian talk a little more about the thinking and inspiration behind the book, I thought I'd give you a quick intro on my own path to parenthood. Um, Vivian and I represent like two different, I think, paths to parenthood and, and lives. Uh, what we have in common is that we executives at, at companies and trying to, again, make this whole thing work. Um, I'm a single mom, and that wasn't initially like the plan. Uh, neither was a pregnancy, the plan. Um, <laughs> and it certainly wasn't planned either that my son was going to arrive three months early in Europe on vacation. And so, <laughs> and as you heard, I'm the dinosaur at LinkedIn. So back when I had my son five years ago, we didn't have the wonderful policies and family first program we have now in place. It was a very different time. And so trying to figure out how to return to the US with no leave available when my son was minus one week, if I had to think of the schedule and being an executive in a job that was building a business at the time with a big team underneath me, um, I had to figure out how to make that work. And as you can hear my accent, I'm from Europe. I'm not from here, so I don't have family around here either. So there are a lot of questions on how to navigate this whole thing of job, becoming a mom, the time schedule of things, the actual event, it was a lot. Um, and I learned a lot from it. And so I'm personally excited to pay forward some of my experiences. I am not going to pretend that I have necessarily winning strategies, but I can share some stories of what 
I've done and what has helped me and what I've learned, hard learnings too, throughout my time. And Vivian, um, I'll let you represent uh, a different type of story, although there are a lot of similarities in our paths too, because coming a parent is becoming a parent. It's a big, it's a big event. Um, but Vivian, if you can start off by telling us a little bit more about the inspiration for your book, because if you just went through, you have two daughters, they're very young, you have a big job, and somehow you're finding time to write this beautiful thing that we can all benefit from. So maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So, you know, when I was pregnant with my first daughter, I had no idea what I was doing. And I was scared. But deep down, I knew I wanted to have a career. So I looked around in the market on Amazon, everywhere, asked people for their recommendations. There was not really a single book that guides women during the transition to motherhood while we're working. So this was something that I had wanted to do since the birth of my first child. And over time, you know, I also started to do more research and talking to different people. And then I discovered that there are so many unconscious biases against pregnant women and women that return to work. So if I don't do something, what is the future going to look like for my daughters? So this is a very, very personal topic. So as you were in the process of thinking through the concept of the book, writing down the tactics, could you tell us a little bit more about the process that you've gone through? Yeah, absolutely. So I did a lot of research online and started to uncover the statistics, shocking statistics, like 40% of men today in America still don't think women should go back to work after they become mothers. And then I followed up with interviews. I reached out to a lot of successful women who are in executive positions and to understand what was their motherhood journeys like and what were some of the best strategies they implemented to become in the position that they're in now. And I also do, did a lot of surveys of mothers from all walks of life. What are the things that corporations and institutions can do to make it easier for women to go back to work? So it, through a combination of things, I put together a set of you know, insights that I hope to benefit you know, many, many women to come. Yeah. I can relate to some of the statistics, I think, that are coming in. I actually never questioned whether or not I wanted to go back to work. I knew that is something that I wanted to do. I also didn't have the option as to whether or not I wanted to stay home. It's, it was a necessity because I'm the, the breadwinner 100% for my son. Um, but what I often got when I was talking to whether friends at work or in my personal life was, well, now you can't be an executive anymore. Or like, you can't pursue like that bigger role running a global business. I was like, why not? <laughs> That where there's a will, there's a way. I gotta figure out how to make this work. And when it comes to like making things work, what's important though is a company culture that supports and enables you in being able to do that. So what's your advice to women who are not working for a company that has a culture that's supportive? I would say you start with having conversations with your managers. Right, speaking to the HR colleagues and see what are the things you they can do differently. Give them an, an opportunity. Point out some of the things that you notice that are wrong. And during that process, it could be very frightening, right? What if they say no? But the reality is, I see a lot of people connecting here. And if we do this as a group, we can actually make a pretty big difference. And then the second part is, you know, we really own our own life. We own our own career. Nobody should be saying no to us. Nobody should say, hey, you should not go back to work because you have a child at home. It is our choice to do this. So if the corporate culture does not change, it is on us to create your LinkedIn profile 
and talk to your friends about other opportunities, about companies that do have very good cultures where there's an opportunity for you to thrive. I'm going to agree also because I feel there is, um, there is absolutely, there are some real barriers that we're going to have to face and figure out how to overcome. I think, unfortunately, there are also a tremendous amount of barriers we create ourselves because we make assumptions of how things should be and what expectations someone has of us, including our boss, people around us, etc. Um, I can speak from experience that I held back for a while on a job opportunity that my boss and boss's boss kept approaching me on because in my head I kept thinking, my boss is a, this this male, he's in a happy marriage, they have a nanny, I think maybe they even have two nannies, and so does his boss, and like they have, they live close to family, they have like all this support, like if I'm gonna take a job that's similar to his, like I can't do that. Like I don't, I don't have that infrastructure. So I started creating like these like, like thick, I guess like glass ceilings for myself. And it wasn't until I remember vividly I was on a on a run, I was seeing the Golden Gate Bridge, I had like this whole like epiphany thing going on, and I was like, God damn it, no! <laughs> I'm gonna break this thing right now. And so I put on my big girl pants and I call my boss. I'm like, you know what? That job that you approached me about, it is not that I don't want it. He goes, Oh, I thought it was because you weren't interested. I go, no. I am very interested. I think I can do the job. I want the job, but you're gonna have to accept I'm gonna have to do it my way. So here's what I need. And then I laid out my list of like 10 things that had to change and 10 things he had to give me autonomy to do to make it work. He's like, is that it? I'm like, yes. He's like, all right, we can do this. I'm like, here I am, like two years having <laughs> created this barrier for myself and it was that easy to have that conversation. He said, yes, because you laid out exactly what you were expecting and what you needed from me. I, there was something I could react to. That seems very reasonable. And so then we, we took it from there. It was all, not, not all like super easy, I will say, to make it happen. Um, but a lot of it comes back to what Vivian was saying. Like, if you want something, like, you have to start with asking the questions and propose solutions, and you have to own it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's part of the skills of negotiation. And sometimes women find the word negotiation a dirty word. It feels competitive. It feels like if I get something, I'm taking it away from you. When in reality, it's a lot of open dialogues with your managers of what you want. And if you do get what you want, how you can deliver value to him or her. So if you're one of those professional women who are either thinking about becoming pregnant or you are pregnant and you're approaching that conversation with your boss and you have some of that glass ceiling going on and some of those things that are holding you back, you're concerned. There might be some psychological fear of what consequences come about with that conversation. What's your recommendation in terms of having a conversation that can be a productive and hopefully a very positive outcome with your manager? So this is where a lot of my research uncovered there's unfortunately unconscious bias against pregnant women. And that's okay, I'm not saying that's okay, but knowing that can actually equip us with ability to take that head on. So what I recommend generally to, pe to people is, you can share the news with the manager, hey, I'm pregnant. And I know you may be thinking that I may be checked out, but I really want to have my career. I want to accomplish these three things. Don't make certain decisions and assumptions just because I'm pregnant. You address that. You speak directly to them, to the concerns and biases that you think they may be thinking about. Because it's sometimes we assume other people make, take our careers as the number one priority for them. But that's not, that, that is not true, right? People are so engaged with where they are going in their own career. So until you actually speak up and tell them exactly what you want, other people are not gonna know and prioritize for you. So once you've had the conversation around the pregnancy and what's to come, how do you recommend we all start planning for the maternity leave? 
so a couple of things. Obviously, you can you you can start to have dialogues about you know how long you want to take. What is what is allowed from your company's benefits, and if there are additional leave you want to have. And that's really much, really about again a conversation about you know how you negotiate, right? You can do some research on Fair God Boss and the few uh, Fairy God Boss and a few other websites about hey, what are the comparable leaves in your industry these days? And that's in the United States, right? And 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 if you compare, you know, I know at Salesforce we have. 30 weeks of maternity leave um, benefits. Actually, it's parental benefits. So it's not just from women, and it's also extended to any primary caregivers. And that is important because, you know, the, the topic of parental leave, it, 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 the, you know, if it's just maternity leave, it assumes women are taking on more of the responsibilities, whereas in this day and age, it's not so much the case. So you start to understand what are the comparables, right? And talk. you can go back to your manager about the leave. And then you can write out a plan, and a plan about how you plan to transition your responsibilities to other people on your team through the discussions with your manager. But the last piece is really Focus on a re-entry plan. How you're planning to take back some of your responsibilities after you come back. Now, know that things are gonna change. You know, when I went on maternity leave, I wrote down this beautiful document, tr transition plan. Here are the people that are going to take on these responsibilities. When I come back, I assume those responsibilities will be transferred back to me. So this is great, and I share this with my VP, my SVP, go directly to the big boss, right? So everybody has visibility, and HR also saw this. So that's a little bit of like the protection, right? But when you actually come back, I, when I came back, we had a couple of reorgs already. So things changed, but things, things will change, right? Technology, company, things will change very quickly, but at least you have a good starting point to have that conversation. I think you're hitting on something that is so incredibly important. Um, there is nobody who's going to care more about your career than you. So the whole notion of taking ownership, I think is such an important message to send. Your manager, of course, will care about you, but things come up, time goes on, etc. At the end of the day, the more you can take charge of your career and making sure that there is a plan in place, the better. And I think your comment on socializing it with more senior executives is also very important because you are, like you said, safeguarding yourself. I think the, uh, the third element of what you're saying that is such an important message as well is the return to work. Any comment on you know, two reorgs, things happen, I may or may not be coming back to the exact same job as I hope. Um, but again, taking ownership of that re-entry, and again, being the one who's putting yourself in the driver's seat of finding your way back into work is very important. Now, all of this is great if you have a luxury of actually planning your maternity leave, and everything goes to plan in terms of when you need to come back. Then there's the you know, your kid comes three months early and your leave is up when he's minus one week and then you still have to figure out how to make work work. Um, there was no plan in my case because like who expects to have a kid arrive three months early? There was not the exit plan or the entry plan at all. But what I did do, and I'm thankful for having had a, a super amazing supportive manager, um, was having a conversation around, I need you to know I'm committed to my job. Stuff happened in my life right now. I am not a victim of what has happened. I am responsible for a son now. There's a lot of you know emotions that are rolling high, stuff, logistics I have to deal with, bills has got to be paid, and like a whole new chapter. But I need you to know that I'm committed to my job. And then what I also really did was connecting back with the team I have and the people that I work with. And I was being very open about what was happening in my life and including them. And what I'll say is don't underestimate the power of the community you have around you in your workplace. You will find that you have colleagues who will go through 
so much for you that you may not know, and you will find people in your workplace who you may only have had a random good morning kind of conversation with every now and then, who will step up and do amazing things for you. So a plan I absolutely like subscribe to, and I think that is an amazing set of advice. I will also say, don't be afraid of being open with where you're at and reach out and accept the help that people are giving you. There is no such thing as pride in this. The pride should actually come from being thankful for the people around you. So draw a lot of power for being vulnerable and being willing to accept help. And becoming a mother is the time where you open up, you share your vulnerabilities. These are the times you actually build really, really strong bonds with people around you. Like these days, when I walk around on the street, I see a mother struggling with a three-year-old who's screaming and would not be willing to move until she gets that candy bar. I get her. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, you know, you and I, I got you. Or the parent who shows up to work and looks exact, completely exhausted, the shirt is on backwards. I get you. That is what I often look like, and oftentimes it is the working from home with like a nice shirt on top and God knows what on the bottom. <laughs> Uh, but speaking of community, because one of the uh, the efforts you've taken on in your workplace is really establishing a sense of community in the workplace, and it would be I think it would be great for the audience to hear a little more about like how did you come about that and how did you make that happen? And it goes a little bit back to the the supportive environment and creating that if it's not already there. So yeah. In your case, you have helped create a supportive environment at Salesforce. Yeah. So we have. Um, very large women's organization that organize a lot of events and conferences at Salesforce, and then we have a great culture, a culture where if you want to do something, you just pick it up, you do it. So, like I mentioned before, with my first pregnancy, to be honest, I was I was at a different company. I was pretty startled. I didn't know who to go to for advice. I hid my pregnancy. For the first 25 weeks, I didn't want to know. I, I didn't want to tell the executives because I was surrounded by men, and there was no woman at the top that I can go to. So, at Salesforce during my second pregnancy, I actually decided to set up、um, this concept of expecting a work circles. I think Mahima was actually referring to it earlier. So I had this concept of. If we can get a group of eight to ten women together on a monthly basis, who are going through the same experience at work, we have that one common thing that we share. And if we all come together and share our experiences, we build our tribe. And now we all know when we build that tribe, how powerful it becomes, right? Not only do I learn the best practices for, you know. Breastfeeding. When I return to work, where to reserve the mother's room, especially on travel. I I will tell you once I had to travel to Seattle last minute. I forgot the charger to my pump. So then I sent a group,、uh, sent a chat、uh, on our in internal、uh, chatter, and someone in Seattle responded within five minutes. Here's my here's my charger. Use it, and I was like, "Thank God." <laughs>、um, so, anyways, so we set we so so we set up this group of we launched this initiative, and we got funding to do a pilot program, and that's how I met Mahima, and she facilitated the expecting at work、um, circle for the first two pilots, and a hundred percent of all the participants said they would recommend the circle to other people. So now we've launched and scaled around the globe, and everybody in the UK were like, "They're doing this. Can we do this here as well?" And we've had facilitator trainings who are typically mothers, experienced mothers, who feel very, very passionate about helping others. I think there is a, a another great theme and a. And a Fantastic message to send here, and it, it keeps going back to the like taking ownership notion, right?、Um, we are both 
very fortunate to work in companies that are super supportive and companies that are open to driving change. Not everyone has a luxury of working for a company that is that open. Um, I work for organizations in the past that are certainly not that open. Um, but what I will say is you got to get it started. It's like there's a wave, right? And it can start with you. And again, like don't don't create all those barriers. Like it could have been very easy for you to say, well, I'm going to continue to hide the pregnancy. Yes, my company is generally supportive, but there is all this stuff going on. And so I'm just going to play by that. Um, instead, Vivian is this amazing change agent who is just this incredibly fearless person and has started this way of creating communities within the workplace, which I think is adding a lot to a lot of people. But as amazing as that is, you're not unique in the sense that we can actually all do this. Like everyone in here can take that initiative and start create a similar environment within their companies. It may not be easy, but it, you got to get started somewhere. And I think you're leading to just such a phenomenal example of that. Um, I'm going to switch a little bit because you are um, also in a place in your career where you are an executive. And that means that you have a lot of people you are very visible to within an organization. How do you think about your role as an executive and knowing that you have a lot of women and parents in general in your organization and going from, I'm a mom, I'm helping take charge to change things. What do you think the role of executives could be and should be? Executives should really take a more active approach to understanding what parents need. It's part of our job. We need to take on the responsibilities to communicate what our needs are. But the really great leaders, they're aware and they go and ask. They don't need you to go and say, they don't need you to come up and say, oh, I'm having a really bad day. They would be the ones that go to you and say, you don't look so well, what is going on? Having the real conversations, ask the question, and people care. So that's one. And then the second one is, I realized, we're here in this room. Some of the discussions that are happening, the people who really need to hear are not in this room. So it's on us, again, to communicate out what are some of the things that are actually not acceptable. Speak your mind, share it with people. Because if we don't say anything, those, those people outside of the room they don't know what's going on. They're focused on building their own careers, right? So again, it's us having the community really come together and share those thoughts with others. I think I'll add another element to it, which is lead by example. And what I mean by that is it is great to talk about philosophies of parenthood and expressing sympathy, empathy, compassion for parents. Um, but oftentimes what makes it more real if you actually you yourself bring your whole self to work as well. Um, because they will realize that you may be an executive, you're also a mom. <laughs> and life happens when you're a mom as well. And different people have different approaches. Before I joined LinkedIn, I was very much church and state when it came to personal stuff and work stuff. It's like whatever happens in my personal life stays in my personal life, it's like the Vegas rule. Um, but then when I, I started LinkedIn, I applied initially the first couple of years, like the same philosophy, and when all this stuff happened with becoming a parent and you know nothing was as if I thought it was ever going to be, um, I realized that I needed to show my team more what it looks like to go through the transformation and the journey that I was going through and to set an example for them that, you know, we are fundamentally all people, we are all professionals, we all becoming parents in this particular case, um, and it doesn't matter what rank you have, we go through a lot of the same stuff. So I try to keep it real with my team. So I share a lot about my son. They probably know more about my son than my family does, because I share weekly updates every single week, and they have more pictures than they probably ever want to see of a kid. Uh, but they have no, they can't block me. It's not like social media because they just get the newsletters. 
Um, they may be like deleting my emails, who knows, but then they're missing out on all the other good stuff and it's expected they read it. So, um, but it, it's a way to both help them connect with me and as, as an executive and break down the power distance. And if nothing else, we can connect as either expecting parents or parents that are already here and it opens up for more rich conversations. So I think as executives, you can make yourself more accessible to people around you and give them an opportunity to connect with you in a different way and share journeys. I found personally through that, I've heard some amazing stories about both challenges people have on my team, fears they have, or amazing things that are happening in our lives too that we can celebrate together. Um, my personal wish is executives in general will realize that the whole self is such an important piece to bring to work and there are so many who are looking at you looking up to you and you should all remember that too even if you're not an executive you have people you work with who you will be setting a great example for one day you may become a manager and you're setting an example for them or you're doing it for the daughter or the son that you have or everyone else in your network but being a little more open and more inclusive and sharing of where you're at I think it'd be such a powerful driver of the change that you're helping inspire. Um, now let's go back to this wonderful thing that is so actionable and you should, you should all read it. Um, but as I said, one of the things I really love about it, it is it's so rich with tactics. Um, and speaking of tactics, life hacks. As a uh, professional working mom, now mama too, they're little ones. What would be like top three life hacks you can share? You know, one of, one of the skills that I became really good at after I became a mom is this ruthless prioritization. I figured out what's important to me, what doesn't. So the first one is for people who work in my office, they might know this. I wear very similar outfits every single day. <laughs> I have a similar top in black, white, gray, yellow, if I feel like being brave today. <laughs> so that's number one. I don't have to think about, that's my, that's my weekday, weekday work outfit, right? On the weekend, I'll be a little bit more creative, but during the week, I have no time to choose anything else. Number, number two is, so my daughter, my three-year-old, really loves watching videos. And we don't want her to have as much screen time. So we've basically adopted Alexa as our video watching police woman. <laughs> and that works very, very well. And the last one, you know, kind of think of life hacks as like, you know, what are some of the things you have to do to get by in life, right? But I feel like Every day is a beautiful day. So we enjoy life, find happiness in it. And so take vacations, take trips. We'll work as hard as we can when we have to, but take those trips with the kids. They're not necessarily gonna remember anything, but it helps you kind of recenter the family, put those phones away and be together, truly together with them. I think that's such such great life hacks. Um, my list is surprisingly very similar. Uh, maybe not surprisingly so. Um, the first one about ruthless prioritization, I think, is just critical. I always turn around into what's the cost of doing something, and that math equation becomes so easy when the cost is time away from my son. This event is one example. It is a Friday afternoon. I'm giving up time with my son. I'm intentionally making the decision to do that today, but then I balance it out in a different way. That I'm taking something else away from work. On Tuesday, I just came back from a ski trip. I took two days off from work to go to a ski trip because I know I'm gonna load up on work on Friday. And I know I have like a month full of work travel coming up as well. So it's always like finding the balance and the cost of saying yes to something. Um, and it's, it's a big one when the cost becomes time away from your, from your son. So like that happy hour that everybody wants to go to, that sounds like a really great idea. Nope, not doing it. Or that project that your boss would really like to take you on because you happen to be like really good at this stuff. If you want me to take it on, you gotta take something else off. 
just how it works, because otherwise I'm giving up time with my son and I'm not doing it. Um, and then it's communicating very clearly with my team what expectations they can have of me when I'm available and when I'm not. I am super available between these hours, and then you can reach me as much as you want. From 3.30 till my son goes to bed, you need to call me if you want me. And as soon as you tell people to call you versus texting or sending an email, it's usually pretty darn urgent if they actually take the time to call me. Um, but I said there was very clear parameters. Like the second thing, which is also one you touched on, is being present. And so one of the things I learned early on is because you had this whole guilt of like, oh my gosh, I'm spending time on work and there's all this stuff and I'm not spending the time with my son. It's not about the, the amount of time you have. It's the quality of the time that you have with your kid. So really making sure that the time you do have becomes a moment where you're present. So again, going back to the call, my phone is typically in airplane mode or it's on mute or something like that. And so again, I'll, I'll hear it or see it if the call comes in, but other than that, I'm not checking my phone during those hours. It's not happening except for maybe the pictures that go on Instagram and the other places. <laughs> uh, that is, it's, not, it's just not happening. I'm not touching work. So the third thing is being disciplined. Um, like being super disciplined with your time, and it, it's all connected, right? But, but really being disciplined. Yeah. Um, I hope you found some really helpful tactics so far. We have about five minutes left. I want to give you all an opportunity to ask questions. And for the first person who's brave enough to grab the mic, you're going to get this signed book from Vivian. So... Whoever is brave enough to get up to the mic and ask the first question. There we go. <laughs> Hi, we were hoping that for an awesome really brace. motivated me. Um, I'm six months pregnant, and thanks. <laughs> and um, my concern is I'm at a place in my career where I really feel like I've worked so hard to get to, and I'm so afraid that after I come back, despite the number of months I'm away, um, that I'm not going to be able to pick it up fast enough. So what are some quick tips for getting back into the workforce with as much confidence as you left it? Um, and, and also not feeling guilty for like leaving your kid when it's only six months or however many old, uh, months old it is. Uh, so two parts. The first part is, and I've talked to some, interviewed a few women, right? So during your maternity leave, You'll have a lot of time, but a lot of time taking care of a little one. But try to you know, figure out if you can set aside 10, 15 minutes once a week or once every two weeks or once a month to read about your company, what's going on in the industry, stay connected. That'll really help you when you come back, especially if you have a long period of leave. During my maternity leave, I basically checked, you know, news and emails once a week and just for 15 minutes, and it really helped. And it also helped to kind of break away from all the baby stuff, yeah. right? <laughs> kind of makes me feel a little bit sane, you know? So that's the first, first part. And then the second part is, um, sorry, what was the second question? The oh, the guilt. Okay, so here's a really good one. There's actually studies, research that shows daughters of working mothers are more likely to become supervisors when they get older. Sons of working mothers are more likely to assume household responsibilities when they grow up. What does that mean for the future for all of us? A more equal world. That's what you're doing, okay? <laughs> I think about that every day when my little one screams and is like, don't go to work, mommy. But, you know, we're building a better future for our kids. I'll add a quick one to the first point that was coming up because I hear that so often from folks on my team. Like, I work so hard. I'm not really sure I can keep the momentum when I come back. Am I going to lose like the, the track record that I have and be able to apply for the next step in my career? Your money is in the bank, and they're in the bank, and they're safe. Like Whatever you build up to date, that's, that's your record. 
Um, and th those investments are not going to go away. So you need to have confidence in your own skills and your abilities. And if you have confidence in your skills and abilities to take up the opportunities that come at you when you return, others are absolutely going to see you shine in those moments. So just like make like remind yourself that you got money in the bank. Like you you invested in yourself, and uh, like it's not going to get lost just because you take some time off to be mom. Yeah. Next question. Hi, everyone. My name is Devika Bridge. Um, Heidi, Vivian, thank you so much for your wisdom. I don't have little kids, but I look forward to that time in my future. So thank you for your wisdom that I'll definitely remember in the future. My question is around, what is your feedback for women who are pregnant but are looking for opportunities externally? Because I've had a couple of friends who are in that beautiful life stage who are ready for their next play in their careers, but they're automatically disqualifying themselves from even interviewing and putting their name in the hat because they are expecting a baby and thus going on mat leave. So what's your feedback around that? So from my interviews, I actually did interview a few people. They got jobs during their pregnancy. So they went and interviewed. I mean, what's stopping them, right? So they went and interviewed. They didn't disclose the pregnancy because that could actually influence it just puts the company in a little bit of a challenging spot um but i had a, i actually had a friend who interviewed with google when she was about 26 weeks and she got an offer and she told her manager she's like hey you know i'm actually pregnant are you still okay with this and they said, yes, we really value your skill set. We really want you on board. I, re I realize we're going to you know, have to come up with some sort of plan for a few months, but we need you here now. So there's nothing stopping them. Yeah, I, I would add a few more things. Um, so your, your question was, like, what do you advise people on your team or people you work with who are pregnant and are looking at other opportunities? Um, I generally encourage folks who are not even looking at opportunities continue to find their value and worth <laughs> externally, even if they may not be serious about looking. Um, so the first advice would be, if you are seriously thinking about doing something else, you should continue to pursue that something else. Just be really clear on why you're leaving what you're leaving right now. Then there's the other element to it that they're pregnant. So what should they do? Um, well, there's the law, which says companies can't discriminate. <laughs> So there's that thing in place. Um, and then there is, again, like the, the glass ceilings that we're creating ourselves that might be preventing us from pursuing opportunities, whether it's internally or externally. Because there are lots of women, too, who fear that, well, I, I, I'm not sure I can go for that manager job because I'm pregnant. And what if I, there's this whole new thing that's happening and et cetera, et cetera. Um, believe in your skills and in your abilities. If you are able to build your LinkedIn profile or create you know, your story and you're telling it really strong, most companies go for the long run. Like if you, if the company is really a smart one, and I hope you will only join smart ones, like they will see your value and they will take the investment in you and invest in you for the long run because they know that they're going to get that return from you. Like so what? you out for a little bit, right? It's, it's like in the grand scheme of things, it's a blip, right? It's a small, it's a small period of time. You're not going to be there. Um, so I think it's sort of self-selection. Like, if the company doesn't want you because you're pregnant, well, guess what? You don't deserve me. Yeah, exactly. So, totally. <laughs> I hope that helps answer your question to some extent. Yeah, it does. I, I think, you know, just personally speaking with my girlfriends who are pregnant, they're automatically disqualifying themselves. It's, I'm, I'm pregnant, and I'm going to be on mat leave. So even though there is a perfect external position for me, I'm not even going to go for it because... I can't even start the job until I live in Canada now, so Matt leave there is a year. Uh, so they're, you know, they're like they're, <laughs> yes, yeah, they're automatically disqualifying themselves. So, you know, friend to friend, I'm always motivating them to still go for it, but there's that hesitancy that I sense from all of them. So that's what I, I try to bring it down to logic. Like, yeah. what is a job rec? Are you qualified? Like, based on a job rec, with your skills, your background, does a job. Is it something that's going to give something to you as well? If the answer to all those things are yes, I'm like, so what's the problem? Oh, I'm pregnant. I'm like, so what does that mean? And then you start to talk through like the fears and all this stuff. I'm like, 
So what does that mean? So what does that mean? And what are you assuming will happen if you get the job? And so you work through like all those pretty irrational fears. There are certainly some that are very valid too. I'm not going to discount that. Um, but a lot of it is irrational. It's in our heads. So it's trying to find a way to get them out of their own way, out of their heads, and help them see that you can help create a path even if it seems like this might be challenging. So like, I would take the time, really spend spend the time with them, invest in that like psychological journey and get them to see that, look, you are as qualified as anybody else for this job. And I guarantee you, if it's a job that's fit for you, you're probably more qualified than most. You're being so. a wonderful friend. <laughs> yes. Keep asking them, so what? We'll have one more question, and then I think we need to, to wrap up. Hi, my name is Celeste Jalbert. Thanks so much for sharing your experiences today. Heidi, I was particularly encouraged to hear you um, and commend you for modeling to the women and men on your team setting boundaries with your work and your life and time with your child. Um, but my question is actually for those who are perhaps earlier in their career or not as senior and don't feel like they can set boundaries like that. Um, so one, what your advice is for those folks, and two, your advice for the managers and senior your leaders in the room um, about how they can encourage and support their more junior employees to set those boundaries and respect them and then also role model it themselves. Yeah, I think a very key message is you can set the boundaries. The, the fundamental piece here is being really clear with your manager on the expectations he or she has of you. If you have an open line of communication with your manager and you're very, very clear on what those expectations are, for the most part, your manager will empower you to get the job done and then what you need to obviously prove back is that you are delivering on the expectations. Uh, I'm pretty sure, for the again, for the most part, that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how you plan your days and your time. Like nothing comes for free. Like that afternoon or the evenings that I carve off for my son, I'm paying that back sometimes when I'm working from eight o'clock till midnight. Like it's not like I'm only working 30 hours a week but I need to plan my days differently. I still have to deliver, executive or not. And that's gonna be the same thing for more, in, more junior people or folks who are not as far as their careers. You, you gotta deliver on the expectations that your manager has of you, but be very, very clear on what those are. So if your manager says, it's time for OKRs, don't just be like, oh, here's another like list I gotta create, right? Like OKRs are like objectives and, and things you align with your manager on. Like take the time to really be clear on them and align very clearly with your manager on what he wants you to focus on. Because then at the end of the quarter, nobody can fault you for for taking the time to pay attention to other things in your life. And then again, it's being very open about what's going on in, in your life. I guarantee you most people will find compassion when you have those conversations, and especially if they're seeing that you still show up and you deliver in the job you're in. So uh, I, I wouldn't hold it back because you're not an executive. Um, if anything, it probably gets a little more difficult when you are an executive in some cases because sometimes the decisions that you have to make are timely and they impact a lot of people and you have to be very thoughtful. And it really doesn't matter that your son just had a meltdown on aisle five. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, and I would add to that, really be thoughtful about the value you're delivering or delivering from the work. List out the items, prioritize, share that with your manager, right? And, and, and if you open, openly communicate, these are the things that I think deliver the most value to you. And this is how I'm allocating my time. See what that feedback loop looks like. Because sometimes we, you know, especially starting out in the career, we just take what's given and we just deliver them, right? You just check the list. But you realize a lot of the times managers could also get very overwhelmed and they have a lot of go a lot of stuff going on. So if you do the prioritization and present it to the manager, it becomes a very effective conversation. Thank you. I'm going to wrap it up with just a, hopefully what I hope you took away was if the environment you're in doesn't necessarily support you, then be the change agent and help others be change agents as well. Your career is your career. It's for you to own, take ownership of it. Empower others and bring others in. Like help build the community and welcome the community. Welcome the community, because we tend as women to take so much on ourselves and just get things done because we can. 
but the community can really give you the leverage that you need to be able to do so much more. And I would say that the final thing is like to some of the, the things we talked about is if you understand and you're self-aware, you're creating that glass ceiling, smash it. Find that sledgehammer and whack that thing to pieces. If you see someone else in your network creating that glass ceiling, help them find the hammer, have them smash it. If they're not doing it, do it for them. Like really be there for others because that's a way together as women, we're gonna help make the workplaces what they need to be in order for us to be our whole selves at work. And that's how ultimately our companies are gonna win. So thank you. I hope you found this valuable. And whoever came up, the book is yours. Thank you so much, Heidi and Vivienne. We appreciate it. I also wanna just give a quick extra thank you to them because for those of us who don't have children yet, um, we appreciate those of you who are putting it out there and doing the work because it's ultimately going to impact you guys, but it's also going to impact the future mothers in this community. So moving right along, we are gonna start our TED style talks in this part of the presentation. Y'all still with me? Great, okay, thank you. Just gotta do a little energy check. Um, we have an amazing, amazing speaker coming up next. Um, her name is X Aye, which I love. Um, she is a UC Berkeley alumni and she, shout out to UC Berkeley, go Bears. Um, and she's also a US Army veteran and she was actively deployed to Afghanistan. So without further ado, I would like you guys all to help me warm welcome the senior technical account manager at and blockchain ambassador at Microsoft, Ms. X Aye. Oh, well, can we go back? That's like one of the last slides. The slide deck in order? It's not the first slide. Do you guys have your file correct? No, that's like the middle of the slide deck. Have it. Yeah, it's okay. Well, in the interim, I don't want to like have everyone sit here and stare and feel anxious. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is X. Yes, just the letter. It's a little weird. Um, I'm a senior technical account manager at Microsoft, which means I work with a portfolio of companies to help them figure out how to innovate uh, using Microsoft's technologies. I'm also a blockchain ambassador, which means I've been tasked, I was actually the first blockchain ambassador uh, at Microsoft, which means I'm tasked with helping companies and communities figure out what blockchain is, what it can do, and how to understand its value and how they can um, sort of help it transform uh, their business processes in the world around us. Um, I'm also a military veteran. Uh, I was deployed to Afghanistan for a year with the Army. I went back nine months as a contractor, so I spent 21 months total there. Uh, very excited to teach you guys today about some... Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm very excited today to teach you guys about uh, one of the most cutting edge technologies and one of the most revolutionary, I'd say, of our lifetime um, that has a lot of misinformation around it. So today I'm gonna talk to you guys about blockchain, what the value of blockchain is, not just all the technological pieces that make it up, and how it fits into the larger picture of this sort of uh, new technological revolution that you hear everyone talking about. Let's see if we got this ready to go. Don't think so. Anyone? Oh, that's the end of the slide deck for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, I don't know what's happening, uh, but here, I'll just start talking about it anyway. So um, there's a lot of hype about what blockchain is, right? So you hear about it mostly in the crypto space, but I wanna clear up something uh, first and foremost. One, blockchain is not Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency for that matter at all. Blockchain is the technology underneath cryptocurrencies that makes it so that they can work, right? Blockchains were created at the same time as cryptocurrencies by the same guy who created Bitcoin, which can make it kind of confusing, but they're definitely not the same thing. You might have also heard of blockchain as the technological revolution, as a secure distributed ledger with uh, data that's cryptologically enabled, right? Which is definitely true, but that's kind of like me trying to sell you a car by telling you it's got an engine connected to a transmission to an axle and uh, that you need one. Everyone needs a blockchain, right? 
And instead of bogging you guys down with all of the technical revolution and details and expecting that's still the end of the deck. <laughs> and instead of uh, bogging you guys down with all of the details that um, you know make it make you have to have a technical background to understand, I really want to help you understand the business value of blockchain. And in order to do that, we have to understand why we need a blockchain in the first place. First and foremost, all business relies on trust, right? When I go into a restaurant and I pay them my money for food, I trust that that food is not going to have me hurling over a toilet at the end of the night throwing up. If that happens, I probably will never do business with that place again because they've lost my trust. Similarly, if I'm shopping online at a store and my goods never arrived, I'm probably never going to go back to that vendor, right? Uh, if I put my money inside of a bank and then I go into a store and I swipe my debit card, I expect that money to be available to transact. And when we lose trust across parties, we lose business with people, right? Now the problem is that, that blockchain aims to solve is the fact that all of our technologies and our processes to date to manage trust between multiple parties or multiple groups are really inefficient. They require tons of middlemen. Like, if I want to buy something off of one of you, how do we make that deal secure? We add a notary. If it's a really important deal, we might actually add lawyers into the transaction. If it's an even larger deal, uh, we might actually execute the transaction in a court of law. But all of that is just adding another person into the mix. We aren't really doing anything technologically revolutionary. And when you think about stuff like, well, we could videotape the transaction, well, I can edit the video or I can delete it. So there's nothing technologically around that really empowers you to do trusted transactions between parties without you giving up some uh, hope that someone doesn't manipulate the data along the way. So blockchain is revolutionary because it creates a secure, shared source of truth. It's not just some cool revolutionary technology, but it, it specifically serves the value of creating a secure, shared source of truth. And it does that because, one, it's a ledger. So it means it can store data. It's like an Excel spreadsheet on steroids. Because this ledger, it's not just something you go and you all input to on someone else's computer or something that a company owns. The ledger works because anybody who puts data in it or anyone who takes data out of it and writes from it gets a copy of the entire ledger an identical copy, and that copy syncs with everyone else's copy in real time. Now, it doesn't sound very secure, like if we had a sign-up list back on blockchain, right, that would technically mean that everyone, as, as you sign up, that you would get a copy of the whole sign-up list. Now, you probably don't want that. You don't want everyone spamming you, sending you a bunch of email. Well, that's where the crypto part comes in, right? The data that's stored in the blockchain and in these identical copies is cryptologically enabled, which means that it uses crypto cryptography principles, right, cryptography principles, sorry. It uses crypto to make sure that the data is encrypted in a way so that if anyone looks at the ledger, all they see is a bunch of mumbo jumbo. It makes no sense. It's uh, hashed, right? And so beyond being just a revolutionary way to make cool coins, blockchain serves a very particular purpose in business. It makes it so that we can do transactions trusted without tons of people in the middle. And so if you want, you can put that slide up. I'll talk to an example of it <laughs> with that slide that actually works. <laughs> Yes, so let's, let's talk about what that would look like. Uh, I know we talked about the process of buying something and how it's cumbersome. So in the real world, let's look at where blockchain has been applied. The, one of our customers at Microsoft is Webjet. Webjet is somewhat similar to like an Orbitz or an Expedia where you go on their website and you can book hotels and flights with different vendors. They had an issue with their vendors' technological systems. Every so often, a customer would go on their website trying to book a hotel the website would report it as available, but in reality, it had already been booked or the hotel was sold out. Because their systems didn't have a real-time way to share data, they would forever lose customers who had that experience on their website. So enter blockchain. We built a blockchain network where we put all of their vendors in it, and we integrated with all of their legacy data systems that they used to manage their reservations. And we made sure that in real time, if someone was booking something in the website, that it was actually available in the end vendors, uh, sort of like it was actually available at the hotel. No one wants to book a hotel that's not available, right? So that's really, really powerful because previously, even though we have technologies that can do asynchronous stuff, there's so much stuff that can like impact whether or not real time really works. But this also brings value because let's say somebody hacks into the database. 
In a traditional database, someone would be able to maybe change the uh, amount of seats available on flight 288 from 9 to 10, right? And how would you know that that was happening? You'd have to have like some security stuff set up, like some scanning stuff to like make sure you'd have to have a whole bunch of people in there to make sure that the data is not being manipulated in real time. Well, with a blockchain, because everyone has a copy of data and it's all synced in real time, anytime you try to make a change to the network, like update availability or do something like that, it double checks your copy against everyone else's. So if I go in and I maliciously try to say it's, you know, hey, actually there's 10 seats available because I'm like, I work at Orbitz and I don't want people to keep using their websites. I'm doing some like shady hacking stuff. Um, it would double check that against all of the vendor's copies. And if it sees, hey, this doesn't match, it would immediately overwrite it and alert everyone in the network. And that's built into the technology. You don't need a whole security staff to manage that. That's just the way that blockchain functions. But blockchain is just one piece of the larger pie. And that pie is something called ambient intelligence. And you might have heard of artificial intelligence, which is where you use computers to replicate human intelligence. But ambient intelligence is really where the next wave is coming from. Ambient intelligence is where you turn a physical environment into a digital one using artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things and blockchain to power the sort of transactions between them. And you create an environment that becomes sensitive and responsive to what humans want, what they need, what their gestures are, or what we program our business rules to be. So again, ambient intelligence is powered by blockchain, artificial intelligence, and IoT. So let's take a look at what that can look like all paired together. With 3M, who everyone might know is the tape company, we went ahead and we built an actual roll of tape for them. But this tape was unique in that it had QR codes. Raise your hand if you've ever used a QR code. OK, these QR codes are not like the ones you can just go online and download. These were actually secure, so they're like way more expensive. And they're more like a social security number, right? So we built a roll of tape of this secure QR code. And when they were moving their pharmaceutical products, like drugs across the country through different transportation vendors, the scanning, or excuse me, the products would be scanned one by one, making sure that all the pill bottles were there. But the results would go to a blockchain network. And you know who was on the other end of that network? The security team, the trucking managers, the vendor managers, as well as the finance and the billing team. So that in real time, if someone, uh, you know, stole some stuff moving from the truck into the retail store and they closed it out and tried to say, no, actually, I scanned everything, in real time, it would reject that. It would notify everyone, and it would kick off a smart contract to bill that vendor for the loss without anybody in the middle. So you don't have to have someone going and comparing contracts and comparing spreadsheets. Their human intelligence is not in comparing data. It can now be augmented by this technology so that we can spend our time doing things that really matter. Another great solution of uh, ambient intelligence that displays that is Bueller. Bueller makes most of the world's grain products in the world, right? So grain um, has a very unique susceptibility to something called mycotoxins. And mycotoxins are basically what cause food poisoning. They're like this nasty bacteria that gets everybody sick. And what we did with them is we built, you know, we leveraged the QR code solution. So as they're moving their stuff along, you know, they have insight into where it is and making sure stuff is handled properly. But we also physically augmented the machines that produce and manage and, and move the grain through the supply chain line. We used a combination of computer vision, which is where you use uh, cameras and artificial intelligence to literally see the environment, and a combination of AI inside of the machine self-reporting capabilities to know when something was not handled according to fair trade guidance or not handled according to shipping regulations. So in real time, everyone could know when a batch of grains had been infected, when it hadn't been handled properly, and we could be notified all the way down the supply chain line. So if that grain had ended up in a can of chicken soup, the chicken soup provider could know at the same time that the consumer who bought the chicken soup could know. So blockchain, again, is just one piece of a larger pie, that pie being ambient intelligence. But I hope that today's talk helped clear some of that up for you and hopefully uh, clear up some of the boogeymans about uh, technology coming to take our jobs at Microsoft. Our mission is really to empower every person and organization to achieve more. And we're not trying to uh, replace human intelligence as much as we're trying to augment it so we can use technology to do better business with each other. Thank you. That is so amazing. So the one question I have is, how did she 
keep all that in her mind. I mean, it was like she invented everything she just said. X, you are brilliant. Amazing brain, amazing brain, so wonderful. So trust and real-time way to share data. I never even knew that. Anybody know about that? Anybody know what ambient environment was? I feel smarter, right? <laughs> Thank you, girl, thank you, that was awesome. We're gonna keep the smarts going. We have another tech talk coming up. This is a topic on uh, a power chat for aspiring. Anybody wanna own their own business one day? Okay, anybody wanna create business within the business you're in? Yeah, entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs, that's what the conversation is gonna be at today. And we're gonna, that person who's gonna be speaking to us about that is Shakina Williams. Shh, please, Shakina, come up. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. My name is Dr. Shakina Williams. My background is up. I used to be the deputy academic director for the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small businesses. Most recently, I got my dream job working at my alma mater at Babson College. I'm currently the global director of the Center for Women Entrepreneurship. And today, I'm going to talk about the state of women of color small businesses. Women of color are not creating businesses that are backable and bankable at the value that we, we, that we can. There are 28 million small businesses in the United States. 5.8 are owned by women of color, generating $386 billion in revenue, but only employing 2.3 million people. This is not a scalable equation. In a report published by American Express for the state of women-owned businesses, they reported a tremendous growth of women-owned businesses by 186% in the last 10 years. This is three times the amount of non-minority-owned businesses. But I wish I can report that our revenue has increased that amount over the last 10 years, but it hasn't. In 2007, the average revenue of a woman of color business was $84,000, compared to non-minority owned businesses, which was $181,000. We fast forward to 2018, where the average woman of color business actually declined by 33%. It was 64,000. But the average revenue of non-minority owned businesses actually increased by 17%. It went to 212,000. So <laughs> let me address the pink elephant in the room here. Why aren't we building businesses that are scalable what can we do to prepare, to innovate, to network, to gain the knowledge, to build these scalable businesses? I'm gonna tell you how, but first, I wanna tell you the tremendous impact when we do invest in women-owned businesses. What the studies show that if we invest in women-owned businesses, we can, as women-owned businesses, generate four million new jobs in America and $1.2 trillion in revenue. What does that mean? If we generate the same amount of revenue that's currently existing in non-minority owned businesses, we can create 4 million new jobs in America and $1.2 trillion in revenue. Who wants that money? All right. So how do we go about doing that? So in the last six years, we have seen many programs devoted to working with women of color, from accelerator programs, to venture funding programs, to co-working spaces. I am so happy that Babson College, our Women Innovating Now Accelerated Program is part of that ecosystem that's engaging and educating women entrepreneurs to grow their business to be scalable. Another um, a program that I like to highlight that's on this list, and these are very limited, there are more. One owned by a Babson alum, Rich Dennis. Through the new Veteran Fund, 
they have set aside $100 million to work with women of color, to educate and give access to capital. And the next thing that's really important that we're seeing popping up in many cities are co-working spaces. These co-working spaces is making it affordable for startup businesses to work on their business, be in a collective and really creative environment to collaborate with other women that are in starting off their businesses. So what is Babson doing? Babson has always been in the forefront of addressing the gender gap across the country and around the world. We are encouraging women leaders to break down those barriers from the classroom to the boardroom and also in growing their businesses. I'd like to highlight three of our programs that are part of the Center for Women Entrepreneurial Leadership. There are, starting at um, students that are in Babson, all our students, our female students, excuse me, can enroll in our Center for Women Entrepreneurship where we provide mentorship, networking, and coaching to help students in the classroom and outside the classroom to enrich their entrepreneurial leadership skills. Secondly, I'm very proud of our five-month accelerator program that was designed by women for women. We have two sites, one in Miami, love Miami, and one in Boston. In these, in these five months, we work with women that are either Babson students, they don't have to be Babson students at all, people that's working in our, in our local ecosystem, and also alums, to take their prototype to growth. Now, really understanding and honing on the importance of women entrepreneurs, we're using our Diana Project, which is a 20-year-old program that focuses on academic research for women entrepreneurs. We're using this platform to increase the case studies, the articles, and publications around women entrepreneurship. So what is Babson's secret sauce? So Babson for the last 25 years has been known as the number one business school for entrepreneurship. So I'm gonna share with you our secret sauce of helping people either start, plan, or within your organization, launch new ideas. And this fundamental methodology is called Entrepreneur Thought and Action, also known as ETNA. So it all starts with a desire. What kind of impact or what kind of passion are you really excited about? Once you have identified that, there's three basic steps that we bring people through. First, it starts with a mean at hand. So what kind of resources do you currently have to drive your business? Who are you? What are you able to do? What are your skills? And then you move that to a calculated affordable loss. So you're thinking about your time, your reputation, and also money. And then you move on to looking at extending your ideas to your network. And please, as women, we should not be afraid to ask for anybody for help, and also enrolling others in your idea. Once you've gone through these three basic steps, you either have to decide, is this a great idea to continue, or should you pivot and change your idea, and learn from that? and then you start the cycle again. So me and my team, we use this whole ETNA methodology in everything that we do, from strategic planning to day-to-day -day operations. What I wanna do is put a plug in there and invite you all to our practitioner day at BAPS, and if you can write this date down, on June 5th, we're gonna have the first global international conference regarding having a conversation around how are we going to change the landscape for financing women entrepreneur, entrepreneurs in the world. This is very important. So if we go back to the number that I talked about, if we empower and enforce the movement and the growth of women-owned businesses, we can increase new jobs and revenue in the United States. With that said, I just thank you all for your time and listen to me. I'll be here for the rest of the evening. 
and I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shakina. That was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, and thank you for creating a space for women entrepreneurs because obviously it's needed. And it kind of speaks to that same theme, you know, create not just taking our own seat at the table, but creating our own tables. So moving the schedule right along. Y'all with me? Yeah. I'm gonna keep checking because it's getting a little dark outside. So uh, <laughs> all right. Um, next, we have an amazing speaker. This is our, another. We're actually moving back to the keynote, um, another keynote speech. Um, this wonderful Latina holds an LLB and an LLM. Does anybody know what that means? Okay, <laughs> I didn't know either until I looked it up. Um, it means that she has a bachelor's and a master's degree in law, okay? She is the CEO at Wall Breakers. Without further ado, I would like to wel welcome, who's gonna be, she's also gonna be speaking about unlocking access and the key to opportunity. So please join me and give a warm welcome to Miss Andrea Gwendelman. Um, I am going to I'm going to do a brief description of myself further to understand what you know what is a lawyer doing here talking to you about what I'm going to talk to you. So basically, I'm from Chile. I mean, I was born in the US. My father went to UC Berkeley for a PhD. And I was born here in coincidence. And then uh, I, I basically grew up in Chile, came back to go to law school here um, to get my LLM at Harvard. I was uh, a lawyer for many years in the the always in Plimpton in New York and the Export Import Bank in Washington, DC, and whatever. And then basically, I, deci I decided to change professions or change my course. And, um, I started I started some businesses in the last five years, basically. And I started with a community for, for Latinx called Divisible, and now I'm doing something called World Breakers, which was kind of a var variation from that, which finds, trains, and connects underrepresented computer science majors from universities across the country to tech companies. So that's kind of a little bit the, what I've been doing. <laughs> um, so I think the, the, I loved uh, when Ty invited, to, invited me to talk about this, and it was a connection from uh, our Latino community, Loreto Sotoberry, who said, Ty, you should connect to Andrea, and that's how the power of networks are. But um, I, I wanted to talk about um, something that had to, that maybe sounds legal, but has nothing to do with the legal world, and it's called, my, the, the title of my, of my talk is called Trade Secrets. So I think we've heard a lot about this, and I love the topic of soft skills today. It's just so important and so relevant and on point. But basically, you know companies have trade secrets. We know Coca-Cola, we know Kentucky Fried Chicken has seven spices and seven herbs, and <laughs> Google has basically the algorithm that whatever, right? <laughs> so the same way that this, these companies have those type of trade secrets, there are trade secrets in corporations and companies that tell you basically uh, you know, how to behave in a job, how to survive a career, how to thrive and get to a next level. And there's some people that seem to intuitively or instinctively know these trade secrets. They don't need any explanation. But in contrast, there are a number of people and young uh, professionals that come from underrepresented backgrounds that for, for whom those, those secrets seem so much locked in a vault as the Coca-Cola trade secret. So basically, it's very hard. They're very hard to ac ac access. It's interesting that for the, some of the privileged people, the, 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 it seems like you know, knowing how the business are done seems so natural. They seem, it seems like they, they, they just know how to do it, and uh, there's no effort, and it's effortless. And really, it's not like that. It's just that they uh, were in the family and friends and mentors and profession and professors and you know, all, everybody that told them a little bit of, uh, gave them the talk through the years and how the game was played. So we're, if we're ever going to change the playing field for underrepresented professionals, we need to disclose those trade secrets. And really, uh, you know, there's the, 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 those, those, uh, those soft skills and that 
uh, uh, intellectual or emotional IQ, as we call, um, basically are so important or as important to thrive in a job as it is to know how to code or how to create a financial statement or a marketing plan. So you really need, so basically people have been uh, talking or thinking before, I think, before it was, uh, people thought about soft, soft skills as these basically lightheaded skills that really didn't mean a lot. But we all saw the brilliant person that we know uh, that you know, did not thrive in the job or fell through a wayside. And in a way, that a lot of, a lot, for, there are different reasons, but for a, a lot of underrepresented people, maybe it was because they were not clicking. And by clicking, I don't mean that they were kind of weird in personality. By clicking, I mean they didn't get the family and friends plan, basically, that uh, tell you how the, 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 the game is played. And I think I was one of them at the beginning when I started at a law firm. I had no idea of anything at all. And my husband seemed to understand everything, and it never even occurred to me to, to ask him. He was my boyfriend at the time. But it didn't even occur to me to ask him that, but, but, but that's how it is. So, um, so basically, if, uh, basically, we need to start working on those, on those, soft, on, on those soft skills to, to, to make uh, these trade secrets more, more open. So my proposal here is that I'm going to talk about two, four things. But one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about what do I mean by trade secrets. So when I say trade secrets, I mean those, uh, basically the know-how that is beyond the substance of the job. Maybe those day, daily hacks or maybe those uh, strategic decisions that make you gain the skills, get noticed, and basically build your reputation at work. Uh, these are uh, basically the information that allows you to know where the la ladders are and how to avoid the shoots. <laughs> so those, those, those are the trade secrets. And, um, and basically, uh, the, most imp the, the, most, the most important trade, se trade secrets you start going to start to help others is to start mentoring. Mentorship is the trade secret that everybody talks about. But if we're going to basically take an action right now, is instead of waiting for the person to come to us and ask us for help, maybe we can, like in the cafeteria your first day at school, basically go find that person and give them the mentorship and give, give them that, that, that offer them. And so some of the, 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 the things that are part of the, of the mentorship, of the trade secrets are, for example, how much do you have to talk in a conference call? Uh, you know, how critical or, or you know, how, how much critical thinking can you give to, you know, to your, to your manager? Um, how do you network with people of, of power in your, in your corporation without seeming that you're a brown noser? How do you, uh, when you, there's a win, how you take credit by, but still be, being a team player and appearing like a team player? When there's a loss, how do you basically take that loss but still be part of a team? Um, how do you socialize? What are the no-nos of socializing? Well, those, all those are um, what I call uh, the, the trade secrets. And you, there's, a, there's a long list, and you can develop uh, a list as long as you want. But so how do you compile your personal trade secrets? So basically, here, here I, uh, I, I invite you to, to, to use your imagination, and not in a J.K. Rowling type of way, but more like go back to when you were a little bit younger, you know, like when you started your career, maybe at 22. For me, it was three years ago. <laughs> no. So like basically, when you started your career, and go back to there and think like, which one was the best advice you received? What was the worst? Or what were things that you wish you, someone would have told you then like basically change to like how time has have passed and kind of like adequate your advice. But basically go and develop your personal trade secret list. And then now how do you pass along this list? I think in, in our careers and everybody sitting here probably will know that the way that you deliver the message is sometimes even more important than the message itself. So 
for you know millennials that are very much generation generation Xers and very much like others, um, and um, they don't like to be lectured. They like a good conversation. So I think that the approach will be like try to to create a, a natural conversation, uh, discuss this. As you see, I mean, I think a show of a, a sign of respect is how much honesty you can have with the other person. And instead of having pity, basically, and instead of uh, you know, feeling sorry for them, uh, having this empathy where you can put yourself in their position, but also like, basically be very honest and be yourself. Like If you're a warm person, be warm. If you're a tough person, be tough. But, um, but basically try to develop a, a, a relationship where you can start imparting your personal trade secrets and, and share them. And how do, you, uh, how do you know you've done good? Well, I think a lot of times we'll see and we hear that we will see that they have um, basically follow our advice. They have, they're doing what we told them that we were, that, what to do, or they will be thankful. But uh, as many teachers, uh, trade, a trade secret from teachers and even professors, is that you, sometimes you will not know any of the results for a long time. You will not know if someone uh, you know, took advantage of your, of, your, of your advice or not, your trade secrets or not. But at the end of the day, this is much, it's, much it's, it's about them, but it's also about you. It's about creating your legacy as a leader or your legacy as a professional in sharing this information as much as you can. Um, and, uh, I mean, an excellent example was what we saw today, this discussion of these two women about how they you supposed to approach your managers when you're having a baby? I mean, couldn't be a better example for me, uh, for this, this woman uh, telling us that she created a list that she shared with not only with her manager, but with her manager's manager. I mean, those are the trade secrets that I'm talking about that really will make a difference in your career. So as much as information, information as you can pass along that you have learned, um, really is what we're gonna, we're gonna be leveling the playing field because other kids have been doing this for years and years and years. They have accumulated knowledge from family, from friends, from everybody. And it's our duty as a community to help put together everything we know and pass it to the next generation and develop those soft skills that you so smartly basically put us all to talk about today that really will make the difference in our career. So, Thank you very much, and that's it. That was awesome. Thank you, Ms. Andrea, for sharing that knowledge and wisdom with us. Trade secret soft skills we don't pay enough attention to, that emotional intelligence, that ability to be relatable, that ability to be authentic, um, that ability to have um, empathy. Those are all the soft skills that, that unite us as human beings. So it's good to have that as traded skills and traded secrets and sharing it with others as well. The other thing that stood out to me that she mentioned was um, mentorship and offering mentorship. Like there's so many beautiful people in this room today uh, and the intelligence just exudes throughout. And so I would just encourage, and I wanna be encouraged to actually offer. You might have something that somebody wants to learn or could learn from you. So offering yourself as a mentor um, is something to consider. Um, and then we're gonna all build our personal trade, uh, trade lists, trade secrets. We have to have the personal ones put in them in our toolkit. We're gonna keep the conversation going. Is everybody still alive, awake? Yeah. I'm pretty excited right now, y'all, because right about now, um, back to those dinner plates, I'd be cooking dinner, and I got an excuse why I'm not cooking dinner tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'm working, I'm working with beautiful women, so I'm pretty excited right now. <laughs> Okay, we're going to start our next talk. Um, our next talk, this individual that's going to come up and talk with us um, was someone that is very interesting to me. It was fascinating to know that this woman went from being an attorney to being a fourth grade and fifth grade teacher to a president and CEO of her own company. And she's going to talk to us about taking back our na narrative. Please join me in welcoming our founder and president of Baycat, Billy Wang. <laughs> Oh, I understand I'm like a few people away from happy hour. Can I say that? Right? So, yo, keep it alive. How you doing? Yeah. And can we give it up to like these superpower women, Amanda and Lonnie? Like their energy 
from night to day. And I gotta give a shout out to Ty and co-founder. Like this is such a vision. Thank you for letting me be part of this vision. And a shout out to Christy who connected us, who you're gonna get to see. Hi, y'all. All right, I'm gonna keep it real. This is scary for me. My, I got butterflies, plus I wore the wrong outfit today for all you people out there. Like, you know, you're gonna see the mic. Yeah, I, I didn't wear pockets, my bad. So lesson number one, make sure if you're talking, you get something with pockets, you feel me? Okay, anyway. Um, let me take it back. Um, I'm curious, I always like to know who's in the room. How many people actually work at LinkedIn? Be proud, be mighty, ooh, that's a good number, okay. And how many people are, like, this is your first or second job? First or second job in the career, don't be shy, okay. Good number, okay. How many people have their own business? Ooh, hello, entrepreneurs. And how many people are in that, man how many people got manager in your title? Be real, oh, there's a lot of you. Okay, all right. Well, if you were here earlier today, you got to hear Mahima, and I, I loved what she said because she said, if you don't create your own narrative, then somebody's gonna do that for you, right? And dang, Ty, I wish you existed when I was growing up because like, it took me my entire lifetime to figure that out. So if you bear with me, in the next many minutes we got together, I'm gonna share with you some stories because this is about me proving to you that, man, if I could do it and take back a narrative, heck yes, you can, but I'm gonna take it one step further. What if we actually change the economic ecosystem so everybody can take back their narrative? Yes? All right, so, that's me, oh yeah. Here's the story of a lovely lady. Yeah, I'm not gonna sing, don't worry, the whole time, but okay, I'm old enough to know this thing, how many people know about the Brady Bunch? Yeah, all right, okay. So, you know, I did grow up. I won't say if it was reruns, but yeah, you know. Um, I watched the Brady Bunch. I was glued in front of the television set. America's perfect family. And this is the Wong Bunch. <laughs> Here's the story of a lovely lady. Yep, that's me on my dad's lap and my lovely lady, my mom. She's my Shiro, and that's my brother. So when I, you know, you can't help but do this, you must do this, right? So when I think about it, I was like, okay, hold on. My dad was not Mike Brady, he never came home. And when he did, uh, it wasn't a pretty sight. I never saw him kick, kiss my mom on her cheek. I'm like, do Chinese people kiss? <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, my brother never had the grassy yard to play in. I grew up in the concrete jungle, hello. Um, let's hear it for Brooklyn, New York, and New York City. Yeah. So, you know, he didn't have that playground, and he immigrated to this country from Taiwan when he was six years old. So talk about feeling it. He definitely felt it. Felt it. And my mom, well, she was definitely not Carol Brady. Not only did Alice did not exist in our household, <laughs> God bless Alice, um, but my mom worked three jobs in one day. So, you know, when I look at TV and I look at the Brady Bunch, it's like, you, you, it's like there's got to be something wrong with me, right? Um, there's got to be something wrong with me. It, it's not cool to be poor. Like, my house don't look like that, right? You just think that. It's so subconscious. And as you think about that, it's like, so how does that shape the narratives that you have to take back? How much of that comes from your ancestry? and from other people and from media. It is powerful. So when we're here and I'm going, yeah, take back your narrative, let's get real. This is gonna take some work because you gotta really think about how much of it is being told to you that you even believe, right? The imposter sy syndrome is all about that. So we all know the power of media. And of course, when I looked at media, this is what was showing off. Right, I could be a prostitute, that's cool, yeah. Or like, I can't tell you how many times people still ask me, hey, you do kung fu? Like, I appreciate that, but can we please move forward? Um, and that was TV, that was the rest of TV. In my real life, this is what I aspired to be because I actually grew up in the sweatshop with my mom working in New York City. So let's fast forward to today, right? Has it changed? 
Has the story really changed about how we are influenced by everybody out there and what we see? If anything, oh man, let's be real. How many stories do you see a day? How many? And yes, we have great movements, thank goodness. But are the positive stories there? Are the stories of you that haven't been told yet really told? It's like, I want to amplify what's happening here. And how do we turn them into consumable stories, right? That the whole world needs to hear. Let's fast forward now. Black Panther, yeah! Oh, insecure, I know, HBO, right? Um, Coco, right? Yes. And hello, crazy rich Asians. Yet another stereotype for me to break. Uh huh. Not all Asians are crazy. Well, I do call myself crazy sometimes. Uh, but man, do I want to be them when I grow up, right? Um, so why? Why, like someday, I hope I will be alive where we're not screaming off the mountains going, man, look at these box, box office hits. Finally, finally. Do you realize 25 years I've waited for an all Asian cast to be in Hollywood? The last one was Joy Luck Club. And we're talking Asian cast that's not doing Kung Fu, right? That's ridiculous. When is it that we're gonna stop saying that, right? Last thing about this, why are they box office hits and a big deal? Because they're box office hits. Let's follow the money. Let's be real about this. Many decisions were made about how these movies were going to get there. Let me ask you this, how many movies didn't get chosen? Right? How many stories didn't get chosen? This is the ecosystem that we're working with. And when you think about it, that's what I was growing up with. This is what the future is. Again, how many young people really see themselves as the storytellers and not just the creators, not, not just the consumers? How many young people see themselves as the storytellers and not just the consumers? So when you look at industry, 20% women, 20% people of color. And we're talking about these are positions of power, the writers, the directors, right? When we talk about creating job opportunities, how much do we honor the beautiful creativity that each one of us has? Each one of us. And when you think about the school system, how, what leads to these poor statistics? It starts from our public school systems and the lack of resources. Yes, it does matter what zip code we're born, right? So how do we change that? I'm tired of seeing these stories being left out. I am tired. So as I said, it has taken my entire crazy lifetime. And as um, Lonnie said, yeah, I'm the crazy who went from being a lawyer to being a school teacher. I gave up my job after being on Wall Street, being a banker. Um, you know, LinkedIn, if it had pages, noticed I didn't put sweatshop on there. <laughs> it was kind of like 17 jobs later, right? I realized as an attorney that I could actually start a business with a purpose, with a mission. So I thought, hey, I'm a superwoman. I'm just going to do this on the side. Well, that didn't happen. Um, I decided to save up rent, six months of rent. I quit my job. My mother was like, I had an Ifola, right? You crazy? <laughs> <laughs> crazy rich Asians, that's how that comes back. Yes, I'm crazy. And why do you want to help that means, why do you want to help black people and poor people? <laughs> so when you talk about like racism and narrative, you feel me now, right? How, are you getting this, right? How much of that do you own right in here, right in your belly? Every day, every day. Let me tell you the positive story. So I started a business to end racism, one story at a time. It's called Baycat, standing for Bayview Hunters Point Center for Arts and Technology. Yeah. What do we do? <laughs> I believe that the only way we're going to change those stats is to actually bring diverse talent into the tech, media, and creative industries. Because stories are now controlled not just by Hollywood, but by you, social media, and all these industries. So how do we do that? Very business-like. Again, I want to follow the money. Not only did I want to create a school, that has a pipeline and a pathway for young people as young as 11 to 25. Because I know 
When I was 11, I wish there was a tie. I wish there was a this, because then maybe I would have been different. You know, it's never too early, but the pathway is all about, even if you decide to study this, we are seeing the doors closed for young people of color and young women because they don't have somebody to go to from their past, from their family, from their network to make that referral, right? All these discussions we had about how many jobs actually show up by the time they're given away. So that's the academy side. The studio, feel me, I, didn't want, I don't want this charity thing. Please don't feel sorry for me. I'm talented. I want our young people to say that, yes? So I wanted to prove to people that we could be storytellers. And why? Because we have an authentic point of view that needs to be heard, yes? So what if we could prove that we're a business, we're a studio, and that we could produce video just like any other agency, but do it while training our young people on the job so they get to graduate with an incredible resume, right? And they get to also see that their story matters right away and that ultimately they could have a career, a well-paid career. No more, you wanna be an artist, that's nice. Especially if you're a person of color or a woman, right? No, not that's nice, hire me, pay me. Pay me well, right? So that's what this is about. Okay, let me do this. As I say this, and I said, hey, I'm a nonprofit, I do this. What kind of work do you think we produce professionally? You got an image in your mind? Can I show you real? Yes. Let's roll it. Oh, what happened to the video? Being underrepresented in media is really isolating. It just makes me feel invisible or ignored. There weren't enough role models to really make me feel like this was the right path and that I could really do it. When you have nothing, you don't look forward to nothing. So therefore, when you start noticing that there is something to look forward to, it's an amazing feeling. work with hope. There's something about what that does for your soul. <laughs> the arts is really a way for them to engage in civic and public dialogue on topics that young people are often marginalized from. For any child, they need to see themselves in a positive light as a contributor to the world around them. You don't know what's possible until someone kind of shows you a little bit. It's about the heart and the emotion and the people. Whole communities benefit from diversity in ownership, diversity in leadership, and I think it's one of the things actually that makes the Bay Area great. It feels like so many people have so many bright ideas no matter where they come from, and we're better together than we are apart. Being who you are, your culture, your values, your upbringing, that is the best part of each one of you. It took hundreds of people behind the scenes, actually an amazing crew, to do that. And I want to be clear, it wasn't 11-year-olds making this, but we did have two teenagers star in Black History Month's last year, Golden State Warriors music anthem theme. I wish I had time to show it to you, right? The whole point is imagine your life being different and having on your resume that you got to work on Super Bowl 50. You got to work with the Golden State Warriors at a young age, 18 to 25-year-olds. That's how we work. So you see why our graduates are diverse. 100% of our young people that we train are passionate about what they do and they are talented. This is how we change the game. We have an 80% placement rate and they're getting jobs here. By the way, LinkedIn people notice your logo's not on here yet. That's how we roll. Airbnb, yes, I know you were here before. Thank you very much. Okay, so there's so much more to tell, but you get what I'm talking about. 
there's a way to take this and just like embrace it and say, we're gonna just change the narrative all over. Um, so let me do a proof point. Um, this is Iman, he's like one of my sons. Um, he grew up in the Bayview, toxic waste dump, right? Because you got the sewage treatment plant, the Superfund site, and SFPUC. And I get it, you gotta grow up in a neighborhood where those services are. This is national, every city has this issue. So he had asthma, had trouble going through school. He was passionate about film. He stayed at home, so he watched a lot of TV, right? <laughs> so consumer of television. Well, his mother did the research, found us, put him into Baycat. This is him about 12, 13 years old. He did his first TV show. As you can see, trying to teach adults how to pop your collar. <laughs> <laughs> then as we fast forward, you know, he was passionate about this. He decided to go to school, City College, dropped out, couldn't make it through, went to go work for Trader Joe's. Is it gonna be a reality that he's gonna be a filmmaker? Well, we hired him, seeing his talent, to actually work on a gig. And that changed the day, right? Because it's like, is this gonna be a dream or is this gonna be reality? We're a safe place. You get to do this with us and we're gonna keep you on schedule. This is a real deadline, real projects. But this is where we will coach you and mentor you through this, because we know you can do it. So he joins our internship program, a 16-week program. His first job out, yes, he got his dream job that is Buster Posey looking over his shoulder. <laughs> I'm like, dang it. I don't get on Instagram like that. Like, how does that happen, right? So dig it, you know, he gets his first job, he's making minimum wage, he's on call like 10 to 60 hours, so talk about having the struggle. There was a conversation before about not just recruitment, but retention. So we stay with our young people even after they get placed. And I talked to Iman after his first year. Hey honey, how was it? Like tell me, how was it? He's like, it wasn't easy, I have to be real because I didn't know how to balance that and I need to bring money home and I tried to keep my Trader Joe's job, but that blah, 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 right? Uh, not blah, blah, but like heartfelt pain, we know. So I said, okay, so guess what? We go to the director of HR at the Giants and I asked the same question. I'm like, well, how did it go with Iman? Tell me, and by the way, that year they hired three people from Baycat, okay? One person said, mm, I'm out, they, this ain't for me. Another kept going, and I'll uh, mention maybe that, and then we have Iman, okay? So this person, director of HR says, oh my God, are you kidding me? I want 100 Imans. How do we get 100 of them? And I said back, I said, here, look, let's be real. Here are the challenges, and if you're real about diversity and inclusion, and you're real about Imans, hire him again. I know that's not usually what happens in this field. You go through production assistance, you go in, you go out, that's it. So I said, take a chance. So his second year in, he got to go to an Emmys award. Wow. Yeah, he's texting Miss and he's like, Mama Vili, I know I don't, you know, I, I, I got to do this. These aren't my Emmys yet, but one day I'm gonna get my own, right? Can you imagine, like just the narrative change at that moment? Yeah, that was last year. He got his Emmy, I know, it's pretty amazing. So when you, and that's him with Danny Glover. Yeah, yeah, cause you know, he filmed the retirement of Barry Bonds' number. I mean, yeah. So, okay, then he gets to mentor the next generation. Hello, right? Changing the system. This is how we do it. And when you talk about this, like there's Angela, Stella, and Ginger in there, they're just young women waiting, you know, and they're taking those next steps. So how many beautiful, talented, diverse young people of color and women are out there? Tons. And just to finish this off, oh, th those are the beautiful people I was just talking about. I could tell, uh, tell you about their story. We're actually gonna be 15 years old this year. We've educated over 4,000 people. We've launched over 200 careers, told over 1,000 stories. Our stuff is in film festivals. We've done over 500 projects. We've benefited actually over 300 nonprofits, because our favorite thing to do is to amplify the stories of people doing amazing work out there. Because then guess what? More dollars come in, more clients come in, the whole world benefits. So we're turning 15, we love your help. I know we're getting to time, and let me just say, this is what keeps me up at night. 
last semester we had 14 positions. Last year we created 50, 47 jobs. We had 14 positions, over 100 people applied. Our youth program, over 100, we turned away 200 applications. I can't raise money fast enough right now to see the need for our young people be filled. Employers, yes, if you're a diversity and inclusion person, I want to talk to you, because to the extent this is trending, this is time for action. We need to put money into this on a big level. Yes, not just for me, but programs like us. That's what keeps me up. So you, your call to action as I wrap up. Um, there is a video, but I'm going to skip through this. Um, it's women. Do you want to see it? OK, it's really short. Can I do this, Ty? Really? Can I? OK, real quick. OK, play the women's video. Please do it. You have done this before. You have done this before. Nobody has worked harder than you. Nobody. You have put in countless hours of preparation. You are strong. those women in there my mom's picture is actually in there you know so as you think about telling your story right take it do it this is so imperative do that immediately and it might take you years to figure it out but know you're not alone if you ever want to call me up my name is Vili Wong put me on LinkedIn please do it all right but very importantly share the story of who you are going to be not what you came from Honor that, just like I have. I think that's important. We have to remember where we came from. But what is your narrative for your future? Do that. Share your story. Lift up one woman around you. As women, and having been in the, in the legal world, I know you look up to women hoping they will bring you over. Yes, that doesn't always happen. And I don't care what your title is. For all of you who raised your hand and this is your first job, there is another woman by your side behind you, in front of you, wherever that needs you. So lift up one woman around you. Last but not least, activate an ally. My beautiful husband is in the audience, and he's one of my biggest allies. So thank you. I love you, Luca. Um, and you know, they may come in all shapes and sizes and genders and everything. So don't assume. You know, And some of those that don't fit the picture of the ally are actually the ones that we need to bring into play, right? And of course, amplify those that are your allies. So remember the Brady Bunch? Here's a story of a lovely lady. Here's a story of lovely ladies. Ladies, yeah. Let's take back the narrative together. More conversations like this need to happen. Thank you so much for the honor of talking with you. Yes, thank you. Ms. Billy, thank you so, so, so much. Such great energy. A friend of mine that's tuning in on the live stream texted me and was like, Billy got good energy, give her my business card. So we gonna chat. <laughs> um, so we're gonna move the agenda along because we are running a little short on time, but I just wanted to take a quick second to do one thing. First of all, acknowledge everyone who is dialed in on the live stream. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you guys for your time. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying, those of you watching from YouTube. Um, I also just want to 
another thank you to the audience. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for, you know, being present. Um, I hope, I know you guys are enjoying this and I appreciate you guys rolling with us. So next on the agenda, let me flip my little page back. So all of these people coming to the stage, it's gonna be kind of rapid fire, so stay with me. Um, all the people coming to the stage are committed to investing, uplifting, and supporting women of color. So I invite you to hear about the organization's missions. And I also challenge you to think about how you can support their initiatives, how you can participate, and how you can connect with them. It's important to note that they will all be at the network re networking reception after um, the final keynote speech. So make sure you connect with them, meet someone new. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce our first external partner, uh, Mr. Jesse Martinez. Come on up here. Hello, how's everyone doing? Good evening, hola. My name is Jesse Martinez and I'm very grateful to be here. Honored to be part of this conversation. So thank you, LinkedIn. Thank you, Ty, for having me here. And so, unfortunately, I don't have any fancy videos. So Mama Vili, I need some help. <laughs> and so, uh, so I'll start with my journey first, just a few minutes here. Uh, so born and raised in Houston, I'm a proud American Latino. Um, the first Martinez to graduate from university. And so uh, my mom was very proud of that accomplishment. Uh, both of my parents came over from Mexico uh, when they were young. And so when we think about my mom's journey, which I highlighted there, she's doing some VR, is uh, she was 18 when she made her way to Texas and really to look for a better life and to provide a future for her, for her children. And so my mom only had a second grade education, but she had the passion, determination, and the will to give us that platform, to give us that foundation that makes us who we are today. So I have a, a younger sibling, uh, my brother Eduardo. So I'll start, um, so I'm a little older than most of you here. And so I've been in San Francisco over 20 years and I actually came out here for a startup in 97. And so I was employee 27 and we were funded by Sequoia Capital and we were one of two pioneers in the web hosting services space. Well, in less than a year, we went from a startup to part of a public company, trained at $35 a share. And so that was my introduction to the world of tech, startups, Silicon Valley, and stock options. I wish I would have known what I know now, back then, I did okay. But that was really the foundation for me to build the rest of my journey while I've been here so far, and being able to create other platforms to help empower others. And so my first one is really, I'm gonna talk about a few different things. Uh, Latino Startup Alliance. So I started that as a need. So in 2010, I was looking for resources as a Latino tech founder, couldn't find any. Realized that there were other community-based organizations providing such services. So I did several Google searches, couldn't find anything. So that became the foundation for Latino Startup Alliance as a meetup group here in the Mission District of San Francisco with six people. Fast forward, now we're over a thousand members globally. So it's just growing organically. And that really became my personal platform to meet others, to really do some important work around diversity and inclusion. And earlier, one of our speakers, uh, Andrea, she's actually one of my mentees when she first started Be Visible. Uh, next is uh, Dev Mission. And so during this pathway again, I met Leo Sosa in 2011. He was working at a nonprofit. We did a few uh, workshops around building a web page and also building a mobile app with Black Girls Code. Fast forward, we started a new nonprofit which is focused on diverse youth, ages 16 to 24, here in Valencia Gardens, and we're also at Bayview, Bayview Hunters Point and Western Edition. And so how do we empower that generation of those living in affordable housing? Because we believe that there's talent everywhere. In addition, we started uh, Latinos in AI. So a little over a year ago, uh, we put it out to the universe asking, well, who is working in AI? And to much surprise, we had people raising their hand from around the world. We're now over 100 plus members, Every, everyone from Google Brain all the way down to a number of researchers across all continents. So very beautiful and amazing experience to see people raising their hand across the world. Which then that led to uh, Dreamers in Tech, one of my students, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, had this idea and wanted to really provide a platform for how do you help those dreamers that want to work in tech? And so we're working through that right now. And then lastly, we're just launching uh, 
a global organization focused on those working in blockchain and crypto. And so again, who's out there, who's working in the universe, and how do we build that community? And also X, I was up here earlier, on one of her advisors as well. And then lastly, uh, Career Force, which we've had the honor and privilege of being hosted here at LinkedIn. And so Career Force is my startup, so that's actually my day job. And what we do is we work to uh, help students find career paths and to tech. And that first journey that we created was, how do you become a certified Salesforce administrator? We provide the training, the curriculum, the pathway, and, the, and then also help with placement. Actually, we have one of my students in the audience back there, Lorena, you raise your hand. She's part of our first cohort. And so when we look at, okay, well, it's great that we have all these amazing programs providing coding, programming, developers, et cetera. What about those non-technical skills? And so this is that first pathway. In addition, we'll do a pathway around customer success, also sales, and then a path into becoming a recruiter. And so that we believe that we can actually move the needle by focusing on these industries and providing that support and network for our students. And so, uh, as it says, you know, transformer here, her 2019, we want to transform careers so that we can transform lives one at a time. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Amber, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about Black Girls Code. Yeah, all right, we got some supporters in the audience. Thank you for all your support. Um, Black Girls Code was founded about uh, seven years ago by a woman named Kimberly Bryant. She was really inspired by her daughter, who she would tend to uh, coding camps and really into gaming and electronics. She would take her daughter to all these camps, and her daughter was the only girl and the only girl of color. So she was really inspired to start Black Girls Code. Since then, Black Girls Code has expanded and grown rapidly. Um, we're in 15 cities throughout the U.S., also in South Africa, Johannesburg. Our program model consists of teaching girls basic computer programming in a culturally sensitive setting. We really thrive off of volunteerism, so if there's any folks in here that are really passionate about our mission, which is to teach a million girls to code by 2040, um, understanding that representation amongst black women in technology is, is there is a lack of. Um, so we're planting seeds that the future of technology has a different face, really creating future uh, Coders, future ambassadors, future um, CEOs. Our, our new hashtag that we're going into Black History Month with, so please follow us on our social channels, is Future Tech Boss. And we're really passionate that these young girls that we're developing will be the future of technology. So um, I'm really happy and honored that LinkedIn shared the stage with us, and we hope to see you around. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at Transformer Her uh, as a partner. So my name is Mariana Abreu. I'm originally from Brazil. I've been living and working in Silicon Valley for almost, almost seven years. So uh, I'm also um, head of design at Woman of Silicon Valley. and. Lead, design, lead designer at YouTube and Google. So I, I would like to tell you a little bit of the story of Women Silicon Valley. And pretty much this is a spin-off and um, a spin-off and interview series that happens is really similar to Human of uh, New York. And, and it, it features resilient women and also gender queers uh, in tech especially those who are of color. So that's pretty much our focus. We host all the interview, we host and we publish all the interviews on Medium, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram as well. Uh, we believe that if you can't see it, we can't be it. So we, we have at least like uh, 300 people already featured telling their stories for other um, almost seven uh, thousand um, followers across all the platforms that you host. So all these 300 people stories, it helps to inspire uh, other women like 
uh, us to be inspired and be it. Because um, at least it's, it's, it's hard to be it, so, so these stories, it's mean to inspire us. Um, we also try to showcase all people from all levels of their career, because then we can have a good representation of uh, all these stages. So we have from students to CEOs talking about their stories, telling about how, uh, what are their uni unique challenges in their lives and their career and work. One more thing is that this is Black History Month, and in, or in to honor that, we will be featuring about 30 people, women, uh, bla uh, black women, and, and if you are interested, or if you know someone who are interested, please come to us. Uh, it's, uh, I will be here, Mariani, we have also Leah and Raquel on the back. You can talk to one of us and we will uh, make sure you do the interview with you. Uh, also, if you, it also includes gender queer, so I just want to make sure. Um, yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. We have all the contact here in the slides. Uh, please uh, uh, sign up, follow us, come and you see and read the stories, and also participate of it, share your stories. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I know, really, we are in between you and happy hour. We'll be quick. Um, thank you all for being here. My name is Christy Specht. I'm with the city and county of San Francisco, specifically under the Mayor's Office of Economic and Workforce Development, which is a really long title of our department, and specifically under a team called TechSF. And TechSF um, was an initiative of former Mayor Ed Lee, um, and it is it was created to build pipelines for people who are local talent to find work in tech. And our larger goal is to link talent to opportunity. We do so in a couple of different ways. One of those ways is to fund community partners. You may recognize PS, I'm so happy I got to go after Billy because <laughs> she is the business. Um, so Baycat is one of our providers. We fund these programs to provide mentoring, work readiness, education, training, skill building, apprenticeship, anything you can imagine to move into the tech space. These are people who grew up in San Francisco, have moved here, maybe immigrants, refugees, or people who are deciding to make a change in their career, and they want to move into tech. These are not necessarily your CS grads from Stanford, I'm sorry to say. That'd be pretty cool, but you know what? They got all the other things. So um, we, we do that as well, but we also work with companies. And we work with companies to link companies to our talent as well. So one of the things that I would love to do is to chat with any of you out there if you are interested in finding local talent that has grit, that's from San Francisco, that's diverse, that is San Francisco through and through. I'm getting the red flashy lights, so I'm gonna you know, pass the buck. But <laughs> thank you all, I'll be at the happy hour. I would really would love to connect with you. Um, enjoy the rest of you know, these chats, thank you. Thanks. What's up, how's everyone doing, good? Good? Okay, the energy's high, the energy's high, I like it. Um, cool, so my name's Troy Cozy. Um, I am uh, the leader of programs in growth at a company called Strive. Um, and I'd like to tell you, tell you a story. Um, but before I do that, I'd love everyone to close their eyes. I'm dead serious, please close your eyes. Imagine yourself fresh out of college, in the, your first job. And in that first job, your first annual review with your manager. And imagine the conversation goes a little bit something like this. You know, uh, we, we just love having you on the team. Uh, you bring so much joy uh, to, to the team. Your, your, your smile is infectious. Your laugh is contagious. Um, but we've gotten a little bit of feedback from some of our other peers uh, and your peers that say, uh, you know, when you speak so much in team meetings, um, it's difficult for others to get a word in. 
Um, it comes off as a little bit aggressive. Um, and we just think that uh, there's an opportunity uh, to communicate more kind of diplomatically. Open your eyes. It didn't feel good, did it? Th that is the first piece of feedback that I heard when I was fresh out of college. Um, and, but I, I invite you with a quick question here. Raise your hand if you've heard that feedback or anything similar in your life before. Exactly, exactly. Now, um, I felt a lot of things when I heard this feedback, angry, upset, frustrated, confused. But most importantly, I was kind of brought back to a story um, of growing up with my mom. My mom, black woman, beautiful black woman, um, always taught me uh, that in the professional setting, it's often to be to, to, to better to fit in than to stand out. Um, raise your hand if you've heard that before. That became the chorus and the soundtrack to my professional career. So you can imagine how frustrated I was when I heard that piece of feedback. So spent the next, you know, call it four years getting really good at making sure that I wasn't aggressive, that I was letting other people speak. Uh, fast forward, you know, three years, another company. Actually, I used to work at LinkedIn, so that company is LinkedIn. Another manager. Um, and that piece of feedback he sits me down, it looks a little different. It sounds like this. You know, Troy, we really love your energy. Uh, we really love the joy that you bring to everything. It's really contagious, but um, you know, we want you to speak up more because uh, we need you to demonstrate that you have a point of view. Um, and you not having a point of view uh, shows that it lacks uh, a sense of urgency that we value at this company. Raise your hand if you've heard that feedback. Right, right. I love doing that exercise, and the reason why I love doing that exercise is because I always notice that 90% of the people who had their hands up the first time also had their hands up the second time. So what does that tell us? Does that tell us that groups of affinity are genetically predisposed to react to feedback in an extreme way? No, probably not. Um, I think it tells us that uh, the, there is a very narrow band of behavior uh, that's acceptable in the workplace for people with different backgrounds and diverse backgrounds. Um, yeah, sure, give it up. Um, and what I've noticed in particular, um, at that point I kind of made it my personal decision to make sure that I never heard that again. I wasn't gonna let the dualities of these two pieces of feedback define the guardrails of my career. So with that, I went on this journey to find out how can I be the most authentic leaders possible. I joined this organization called MLT. LinkedIn was really, really, my MLT family, okay, shout out, shout out. Um, my, uh, my MLT family helped partner with my LinkedIn family to send me to this program that was transformational. I was with a group of 40 other people that looked, smelled, talked, walked, breathed exactly like me, experiencing the exact same challenges I was, emerging leaders in their respective organizations, um, and really creating a, a platform for a shared conversation. And through that, uh, I, I had the most transformational eight days of my career. So what did I do? I came back to LinkedIn Invigorated and tried to create that exact experience at LinkedIn. And with the help of a lot of beautiful, talented people, many of which are in the room right now, we created a program called LEAD, LinkedIn's Engagement and Development Program. Woo -woo, all the leaders. And I did the exact same thing. Now, uh, with that same idea in mind, I want to bring you to present day. Um, I work at a company called Strive, and our goal is to make sure that everybody achieves their professional potential. Now, through that, I've created a program called Leadership Circles. You can see it on the screen here right now. Leadership Circles are a five-week immersive program, curated learning experience that really uh, anchors itself on three kind of key ideas, uh, curriculum and classroom, executive coaching, and community, all to help emerging leaders in the Silicon Valley elevate and propel into the ranks of leadership at the organizations. So I'm super excited here today because I want to invite all of you guys to click the button, if you can, to at least download it right now um, and apply because we have a February cohort that we want all of these faces in. Uh, we have a uh, underrepresented minor minority cohort and then we have a women in technology cohort um, where we always layer the nuance of uh, a race and identity on top of professional development. So the hope is that you know we can partner together and I can help make sure that the dualities that you guys experience in your experience does not define the guardrails of your career. Thanks.
Hello, Transform Her attendees. My name is Marlies Copado. I am the VP of Women of Alpha. I am excited to partner with LinkedIn today to introduce to you the San Francisco professional chapter of Alpha. Alpha stands for the Association of Latino Professionals for America. Initially, Alpha was founded to support finance and accounting professionals. But as the mission evolved, so did the, so did the outreach in professions. Our goal now is to develop Latino leaders. We have about 90,000 members, 46% professionals, 54% student memberships, 46% professional alpha chapters, and 160 student alpha chapters in the United States. Alpha has been serving Latino leaders for about 45 years. The Alpha San Francisco chapter offers monthly events to social network as well as offer professional development. Our biggest event is Women of Alpha. Women of Alpha is a space for women to gain access to resources, skills, network with Latina executives through different types of workshops and panels. And it is my goal with Women of Alpha to develop more Latino, Latina leaders. As we know, we don't have very many Latina leaders in leadership positions. There is a huge disparity there. And Women of Alpha program is designed to empower women to become leaders. I invite you to attend Women of Alpha in October. Please join our, engage with our community. We will be here. Um, I have some of our board members here. We have Loreto and myself, and we're happy to answer any questions regarding the Alpha San Francisco chapter. And I hope to see you at Women of Alpha in October. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Holland. I am head of finance for Black Tech Women. We, hi, <laughs> we have some members in the house. Um, we are the premier community for black women in the tech ecosystem. Uh, we partner with great companies like LinkedIn, Box, eBay, Google, and others to uh, provide training, uh, job opportunities, as well as a global network for our members, of which there are over 3,000 uh, in major cities across the United States, as well as overseas. Uh, we've grown organically in the last two years, and um, we've created a community of really phenomenal women that support one another, uh, whether that be through career transition, um, you know, fellowships, uh, startup life, wellness, things of that nature. Um, and we're really excited to keep growing. Um, and, you know, we want to see not only more black women in tech, but we want to see black women stay in tech. Um, and so that is our main goal. Um, and you can follow us at Black Tech Women on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn to learn more about what we're up to um, and to really learn about how to become a member. I'll also be around uh, during happy hour uh, if you have any questions. And I want to thank Transform Her, Ty, and the entire team for having us. Um, and I look forward to meeting all of you. Uh, thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Rocio Van Europe, co-founder of Latinas in Tech, and we have and Gretel Pereira, I'm the other co-founder of Latinas in Tech. Nice to meet you. So we're going to start with a short story. 15 years ago, I started my career in tech. 15 years forward, I haven't had a manager, an equal, or any other person above me that looks like me, that is a person of color. And that wasn't fun, and I don't think that's okay. 
Fortunately, I found Gretel. <laughs> One day, five years, almost six years ago, and we went out for coffee, and we share the same interests, the same passion. We both work in tech, and we had so many friends in tech that we started inviting more and more and more. And all of a sudden, we're over 5,000 women in not only the Bay Area, but now many other cities in the US and outside the US. So we have a chapter here in San Francisco, in the Bay Area. We have Austin, New York, Sacramento, Los Angeles, Miami, and Austin, of course. <laughs> we also have Mexico City, and we're about to open many more. Gretel. Um, well, like Rocio said, we've been working on this as a, f we call it our full-time passion, not our full-time job, unfortunately, but we're working on that. I work at Groku, and um, thankfully, they're s very supportive of this. And basically, what do we stand for? We've grown, and we have this wonderful community. Um, we really want to move the needle and create and get more women not only to enter tech, more Latinas to enter tech, but to stay in tech and grow in their careers. Uh, we all know the numbers, we've seen it, whatever, about Latinas, we don't need to, but we wanna, what we, uh, like Rocio said, we started meeting so many talented women and our idea is to share those stories. And we do it through the three different pillars that we have. So we wanna create a community, which are the 4,000 women that we have um, and the different chapters that we now have to expand. We wanna build the career through leadership sessions, workshops, we have training, um, different, different, um, well, di mainly different tra uh, training. And then we want to build that connection between tech companies and all of our amazing Latina technical talent. So we host different recruiting events where recruiters can come and meet our Latina talent and vice versa. We have a career hub where we can um, share jobs and girls can post your profile. So we will be at the happy hour today. Um, and I think there's many of our Latinas in tech here. So we're really excited to see so many of our girls. Woo -hoo! Um, and we want to meet all of you today at the event. To, there's a lot of volunteer opportunities. We want everybody to be involved in more partnerships. So thank you. Wow, so amazing. I, I didn't know that so many great organizations live right in our backyard. So how many of us learned something new today? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so glad we still have our win. There's some great networking and socializing happen. We have our individuals at, here at LinkedIn that are going to bring us home. Uh, just to close out, I want to personally thank everybody. I've met and seen so many beautiful people today. Thank you for the energy. Thank you for appreciating my energy. And I hope that we can continue to connect moving forward. Bringing us home are going to be um, talking with us as our VP of Global Operations at LinkedIn, Lekha Doshi, and our VP of Learning Solutions at LinkedIn, Mike. Terezin. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Derrison. Hi, my name is Leika Doshi. So we're going to bring you home and open up and provide the intro to your cl closing keynote. And before we do, Lake and I just wanted to say a few words why diversity and inclusion means so much to each of us and a little bit about our journey. So for me, my diversity and inclusion journey began about eight years ago. As a member of the global senior sales team, we recognized we had some diversity challenges across the board. We saw one pocket in particular, which was senior women. We only had 15% of our leadership were senior women. And we decided we wanted to do something about it. So uh, we left. We said we're going to go do something about it. We committed. And three years later, guess what that number turned out to be? 15%. <laughs> so. Uh, all that effort really didn't, uh, we didn't really move the needle. And so, but we had a breakthrough at that point. One of the ways we had a breakthrough was we had a, someone come through and facilitate and pull stories from our female population and learn about what their experiences were. And some of them were really inspiring and positive, and some of them really hit hard. And I remember a few of those stories, it just hit me like a, a brick. As, as a senior leader, I felt responsible for, for this culture. And at that point, I said, no more. I'm personally going to commit, like, like for real, and that I'm going to encourage, I'm going to become a white male ally in a very serious way. And thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So, I'll, I'll share, uh, I'll share a couple uh, examples. I've got many more, but I'll share three. So one thing that uh, it's kind of crazy to realize at that time, I was mentoring pretty much all men. So no, that's not going to happen. So today, I'm proud to say, pretty much every mentee and sponsoree I have is a female or a male of color. So 
Thank you. If anything, I may need to move the, swing the pendulum a teeny bit back. <laughs> so, um, the second story I want to tell you is I get asked to speak on various uh, panels. And so there were three uh, times, or maybe even more, but I can remember at least three, where I was asked to speak. It was an all-white male panel. Not going to happen. So I rejected those uh, invitations, and I tried to use my, my role as a white male to explain to other white males why this is not a good idea, and we should get some more diversity and bring other speakers. And I helped source some other diverse candidates to speak instead. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then the third one, but perhaps most important, is you know, to really drive change when you're uh, leading a large organization, is to instill that same intensity and that leadership in your leaders. And so I started to then really bring that intensity to my directs and hold them accountable. And more importantly, hold them accountable to hold their people accountable. And I'm proud to say these efforts, but not just mine, but of the whole global sales leadership, my peers, we moved that uh, from 15% of our senior sales leaders, um, of women were 15%, it's now 35%. We've moved that needle. And then in my group, thank you. <laughs> Uh, in my group, LinkedIn Learning Solutions, we're now just about at 50% of our managers are female. So we're making some progress, and now we want to bring, and I want to bring that same commitment and that same intensity for underrepresented minorities. Thank you. Mika. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, as I was introed earlier, I lead the global operations team here at LinkedIn, and I've actually been at LinkedIn for about seven years now. I actually started as an individual contributor. And just recently, I was promoted to VP to run a 700-person organization. And thank you. <laughs> and, and my uh, journey at LinkedIn has been fantastic. And diversity has been so important in that journey. Diversity is not just the right thing to do. It is the way that we are going to win at LinkedIn, and we know that. And we, if for us to achieve our vision, we have to, have to reflect our member base and the global workforce. And so diversity is such an important pillar to our talent strategy. I am so proud of the fact that I have the opportunity to lead the business leadership program. It's a rotational program uh, for high performing, high potential undergraduates who um, are going to be the future leaders of this company. But when this program first started, less than 5% of incoming class came from underrepresented minorities. And that number is now shot up to over 30%. And I am committed to making sure that number continues to increase because by doing so, we will have a more balanced and diverse slate of future leaders here at this company. And I will commit to this audience that we will get that done. And then as an, on an individual level, I, uh, you know, I've had an interesting journey here. It's been great, like I said before, but it's hard. It's complicated. As women navigating this, um, this map and this ladder is really hard. Um, and it gets harder as you become more senior. You know, I, uh, you know I, I, as I think about all the great leadership traits uh, that are often quoted, it's, all, it's always around being authoritative, decisive, you know, and it's at odds with being a likable woman, right, being warm and inclusive. And over the years, I've learned to listen to feedback very patiently, even if it comes with bias. And I have made it a personal mission of mine to educate folks that are providing that feedback to show them that they do have some biases, but to do it in a way that is tactful, that is um, not gonna embarrass them, because it's not about that, this is about changing behavior, right? And so that's how I've learned through this um, journey of mine here at LinkedIn. So as we close out Transform Her, I would love to put a challenge out there for all of you. I would love for you to think of what is going to be your personal mission to propel diversity, inclusion, and belonging in your own community um, and network. 
because you, you guys are in so much power to do something. And um, the next person that we're going to bring up here has done just that. Clara, Carolyn Clark is an esteemed author, broadcaster, and journalist. She's worked at uh, Black Enterprise magazine since 1993. In 2005, she co-founded Black Enterprise Women of Power, which is now a syndicated TV show and also the largest um, uh, conference for women of color in the US. She graduated from Smith College and then she graduated with honors from Columbia School of Journalism. She also spent a year at Spelman College. <laughs> she, uh, so we, we pride ourselves here at LinkedIn to find out information that's not on your LinkedIn profile. And uh, you guys will be uh, surprised to hear that Carolyn also comes from a very famous lineage. Uh, she was adopted at a young age, but she f later found out that her biological mother is actually the daughter of uh, Nat King Cole, which makes her the granddaughter of the famous musician. So please join me in welcoming Carolyn to the stage. Thank you, Vika and Mike, and thank you, Ty, and thank you all. Um, okay, so this is like a make it work moment. So let me just start by saying um, I sat through many of these talks today. They've been really wonderful. I especially wish I had seen the women who spoke about coming back from maternity before I had kids. That's a little late for me. Um, but um, after all these wonderful TED Talks, I have to say um, this is going to be a red talk uh, because I have a lot to share and I did not have time to memorize it. Um, also, there will be no slides or visual props, big props to those who came with those. But you should keep your ears peeled because there will be a little quiz at the end and there are prizes. You see my little bag? It's the prize bag. So this is your big chance. I know it's, it's been a long day and all that, but this is your big moment to sort of work on the, uh, the vanishing and underrated art of listening, just listening. That's all you have to do, sit back and relax and listen. When I was first invited to speak to you today about courage and careering, I have to say I was really, really honored and very, very eager to say no. Um, because until very recently, I really just did not view myself as the courageous type at all. A few things made me change my mind, starting with my friends, Valerie Coleman Morris and Jamel Simon. Jamie is in here somewhere with her eyes popping, like, why are you bringing my name? There she is. She was my Spelman College roommate. Um, people talk about the value of having a personal board of directors. If you have a group of brilliant, thoughtful, honest, want the best for you, ride or die, take no prisoners, girlfriends, you're really covered no matter what you need. And they will often give you the courage that you lack. Jamie and Val did that for me one day when I was kicking myself for playing it too safe. Stop it, they said, practically in unison, in that black mama tone voice that makes you freeze. <laughs> you take huge risks all the time, you just don't own them. I listened, listened, hint, hint, and took their words to heart. Another one of my girlfriends, Shonda Rhimes, also propelled me here today. Don't be too jealous, we're only BFFs in my head. <laughs> Sometimes, though, that's enough, right? Sometimes that's enough. We all want to get close to the powerful to be mentored, but let me be clear, you can be powerfully mentored by someone you've never met. That's what happened when I read Shonda's book, Year of Yes, in which she committed to 12 months of saying yes to everything she would normally say no to. It sounded crazy, but it launched my own internal revolution. I called it my year of yikes. <laughs> it began with the decision to move to Oakland, leaving life as I knew it on the East Coast. I'm a born and bred New Yorker, so this was huge. But it was an act of self-care, to be honest. 
After a series of painful transitions, I needed a change of pace and a new vision for myself that didn't include having to get a new job. Proposing that I work remotely given black enterprises culture was not a light lift. I was confident that I'd be able to leverage my position and track record, pays to have a stellar track record, successfully. But fully, but fully stepping into that shift took an enormous leap of faith and all the badass boldness I could muster. When my 23-year-old daughter challenged the very sanity of my decision, gotta love kids, I masked my self-doubt and assured her we would both be fine. When my boss and CEO asked how I was gonna handle my New York-based job from the Bay 3,000 miles away, I masked my uncertainty and literally said, no worries, I got your job. When my stunned team greeted my announcement with confused faces and questions I couldn't answer, I masked my anxiety and then set out to make it work. Luckily, it has worked so well that 18 months later, I'm still here with no plans to leave anytime soon. <laughs> While I credit Shonda with giving me the guts to go, I have realized since that I had a template for my year of yikes all along, left by my mother, Vera Clark. Her death was the worst of those transitions I mentioned earlier. But her blazing example is in some ways more alive for me today than ever. Born in Harlem, the second of five children and the first in her family to graduate from college, my mom had never been on a plane, but in 1952, she traveled alone to Europe on a student visa for two months. The thought of it still blows my mind. She developed a brain tumor shortly after returning in her 20s, the treatment of which left her infertile. But on she went, marrying my father, getting her master's in education, and adopting a baby. Lucky me. When my dad, a chemistry professor, got a job teaching at the University of Liberia in West Africa, she quit her job, grabbed me, and gamely moved there running a nursery school from our home, mainly so I could make friends. A few years after returning to the States and her career, my mother suddenly went blind in her 40s and sank into a deep depression. Eventually, she regained the vision in one eye. It was enough to reclaim her passion for books, the arts, travel, and her career in New York City's public schools. In retirement, she led the Bronx Reading Council, a fierce advocate for literacy, and continued to teach English as a second language to immigrant children in need. Throughout it all, the challenges kept coming, including the death of my father three weeks before their 50th anniversary. For the first time ever at the age of 75, my mother faced living alone. But she never once backed down, asked why, or cursed her fate. She soldiered on, game for every adventure, with optimism and, yes, great courage. When my son Carter spoke at her funeral, he referred to my mother as a survivor, and even in the midst of my ragged grief, I almost laughed out loud. My mother would never have referred to herself as a survivor. She would have never called herself that or anything mighty or pseudo-boastful, even if it was true. Unlike Shonda, our girl, or you or me, my mom was not from a generation of women who ascribed much to labels. In her time, your life, your work, your impact on the world spoke for themselves, often when no one was listening. In response, you didn't make a fuss, create a hashtag, or post self-congratulatory video updates with applauding emojis on LinkedIn. You just kept going, and in my mother's case, being unfailingly true to yourself. I doubt she ever reflected on the fact that simply showing up every day as exactly who you are can be a stunningly brave and revolutionary act in itself, especially when you are a woman of color, moving in places where there are neither many women nor much color. She never thought about her legacy beyond her grandchildren, 
and despite its splendid pain and glory, I never saw her fully step into her story or own her truth. I've come to realize that in modeling myself after my mother as I charted my own path, I didn't own mine either. I had plenty of self-awareness, I was deliberate and intentional, but I didn't think I was doing anything worthy of much noise. So I went about it quietly, too often feeling lucky just to be in the room. I rarely talked about starting college at 16 or getting a master's degree in journalism with honors. Thank you, Leica, for mentioning that for me. <laughs> I never discussed what it was like to be the only woman of color in every single newsroom I worked in before joining Black Enterprise, or how it felt to publish my first book at 35, then be unable to promote it because of a crippling anxiety that struck me after 9-11. It didn't occur to me that choosing to spend most of my career working in a family-owned business, owned by the family I married into, was risky or even interesting. Choosing to work there after my marriage ended, in spite of lucrative offers to leave, risky and interesting, don't begin to cover it. You think it's tough to navigate in a large corporate setting? Shrink it way down and place your in-laws at the top, then we'll talk. <laughs> Early in my career at Black Enterprise, never wanting to seem as if nepotism was the reason for my rise, I often overcompensated, not seeking raises or promotions despite taking on more work and responsibility, sidestepping opportunities so that others could advance, allowing colleagues to get the credit I was due. I was actually flattered when my father-in-law, Black Enterprise founder Earl Graves, started calling me the company's secret weapon. Of course, he meant it as a compliment. But I set out to be a lot of things in my career, most of them not requiring a spotlight, but I never set out to be anyone's secret anything. And yet, I never pushed back. I didn't want to make waves. I didn't want to seem ungrateful. I didn't have the courage. I didn't own my truth. Like my mother and many women, as life kept calling, I just kept answering, nailing it, blowing it, and sometimes faking it till I made it, but never pausing to fully recognize my true value, no less summon the courage to own it. Even though, and here's the irony, as Leica said, I lead a brand called Women of Power. Exactly four weeks from yesterday, over 1,200 women will gather in Las Vegas for the annual Women of Power Summit, where the most powerful women of color in business will network, celebrate each other, and have courageous conversations about everything from negotiating and branding to gender, race, and politics. I hope Many of you will be there. There's truly something magical about the summit, and it is my proudest professional achievement to date. I led the team that created it, and leading its evolution over the last 14 years has been a blast. When we launched Women of Power in 2005, it was bold and new and much needed, and there was nothing like it. We established a theme each year, and one of the first was Own Your Truth. I can still remember the vibration in the room at our opening gala when I said it. Own your truth. Back then, it was novel and felt weighty with meaning. Now it's a catchphrase, a book title, an episode of love and hip hop. We say it so often it sounds cliche, but we still do it too rarely. Andrea talked earlier about trade secrets. This is the ultimate trade secret. Owning your power has lost none of its power. It's still the most courageous and transformative thing you can do. It took my year of yikes to make me see that throughout more than a decade of leading the summit team, 
becoming the face of this empowering brand and promoting its mission by encouraging other women to embrace the fullness of their contributions and their worth, I too often denied my own. In fact, I didn't fully own my truth for the first time until a few years ago when I wrote a memoir called Postcards from Cookie. What prompted that was this extraordinary situation of meeting my biological mother, not having searched, and discovering that she was not only the sister of an old friend of mine, but she was Nat King Cole's daughter. It took that to make me step into the light. That's my truth, and I'm offering it to you now as a cautionary tale in what not to do. Don't leave it to your sisters, or as my mother did, to your daughters, to excavate your story and extract its hidden power. Own every bit of your truth. That means understanding who you are and what you bring so you can articulate it courageously and clearly with grace and gratitude, not to brag or diminish others, but to make sure the record is kept straight. Especially at this moment, in your roles as women and women of color in tech, in Silicon Valley, on the outer edge of a divided America whose greatness to some seems to lie in our actual demise. Owning your truth will take enormous courage, but it will also make an enormous difference. And not just for those within listening range. Telling our stories doesn't just shape how others see us. It shapes how we see ourselves. And how we see ourselves is everything. That's where our secret superpower lies. Owning your truth will require you to be more resolved and resilient than you or our girl Shonda or my mom ever imagined. But it has never been more important for women of color to openly and boldly share their stories themselves and own their truths than it is now. Just ask Kamala Harris or any of the women candidates who ran for office in 2018. Ask Stacey Abrams, whose year has borne stunning testimony to the enduring truth of words spoken by Frederick Douglass in 1857. Power concedes nothing without demand. It never did and it never will. These women know that if we don't pursue careers and fields where our true passions lie because we don't feel welcome or see others like us, we will continue to feel unfulfilled and those fields will be crippled by our absence, whether anyone ever acknowledges it or not. These women know that if we don't demand equal wages, we will continue to be undervalued and underpaid 63 cents on every white male dollar in 2019. These women understand that if we don't boldly fight for fair and respectful treatment, we will continue to watch the spirit-crushing hashtag MeToo ticker rise. These women know that if we don't claim our place in history by telling our stories our way, ourselves, we will continue to be largely invisible in spite of our triumphs or to be marginalized in ways that will defile and diminish who we are and what we offer as women of color have been throughout time. What actually happens when we own our truths? Backstage Capital CEO Arlen Hamilton says enough is enough and launches a $36 million fund devoted exclusively to black female find founders. That's what happens. Olympic gymnastics champion Simone Biles becomes the most dominant athlete of all time in the same year that she admits having been a victim in the worst sex abuse scandal in women's sports. That's what happens. Queen Bey takes over Coachella and sings the Black National Anthem, and that music festival will never be the same. That's what happens. Michelle Obama releases her book, becoming the first woman to ink such an enormous deal, sell out a multi-stadium tour, and score one of the best-selling political memoirs of all time. That's what happens. Ava DuVernay joins the $100 million earnings club, 
In response to the victory, she tweets this truth. Lovely room to be in, but can't wait for more sisters to get here. That's what happens. You see, owning your truth doesn't just change you. It heightens your ability to change the world around you. So make like Shonda and just say yes. Or make like me and scream from the top of your lungs. But don't shrink, hide, or back away. Own your inner warrior. Own your scared little girl. Own your truth. It's not a cliche. It's the most courageous and powerful and beautiful thing you'll ever do. God bless you. Okay, so. I promise prizes. Okay. I promise prizes. I was born on Christmas Day. I'm big on gifts. So, so okay. This is the big listening test. Big test. Okay. See us in a Christmas bag. This is, this is how we do it. Um, where did my mother go in 1952? First hand up. Yes. Where? Europe. She did. Here's your prize. Thank you. Why, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, who said power concedes nothing without demand? Yes. Yes, he did. Okay. Um, what year did Women of Power launch? What year did Women of Power? Yes. Yes. Ding, 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 ding. Oh my God, my gifts are falling apart. Okay. That's my first book. Enjoy it. You had to listen, now you have to read. Okay. All right. Um, how old was I when my first book was published? 35. Oh my God, seriously? <laughs> seriously? That's messed up. Okay, the prize was a book, and here's the prize. You all get to go on Amazon and order it. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so now I have to, now I have to ask one more question. Only one, you have to raise your hand, that's no fair. Okay. Um, uh, what country did my parents and I move to for my father's job? Um, um, yes. Liberia, yes! This is, okay, this is the book that you all get to order on Amazon. Here you go, come get it. This is my memoir, Postcards from Cookie. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, I have one more prize in here, and it's falling apart, so I'm going to leave it in the bag, and the last person gets the whole bag. Um, okay, uh, I don't have any other questions on the page. Um... <laughs> Um, when is the summit? I know, when is the summit, but I didn't tell you that. Which, by the way, the summit is February 28th to March, there you go, to March 3rd. February 28th to March 3rd. Blackenterprise.com, go register today. Okay, last question. Where is the summit? Oh, seriously. <laughs> This is such a woman, such a woman thing. Such a woman thing. You still have your hand up to answer what everybody just answered? Where, what, what, what hotel is the summit at? No, I didn't. Ha, ah, see, hard question. <laughs> it's at the Mirage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. What a wonderful day has been. Let's give another round of applause to Carolyn Clark, Chief Brand Officer, Women of Enterprise, bl sorry, Black Enterprise Women of Power Summit. So thrilled to have you here, Caroline. And all of you, so thrilled that you were here with us on this journey today. We hope that it has been of service to you. 
We hope that you will take action. I just want to share a couple of things to recap because I'm going to ask you to actually take one step forward in that movement to change your trajectory of your life. And that's to take an action and make a commitment to taking that action on, guess what, on LinkedIn. <laughs> so this is the participation moment where you take out your phone. And I'm going to read some things to recap, and maybe that will spark something for you. But I want you to look for yourself and your life. What is something that you learned today that you're going to do differently as a result of the time you've spent here? So we learned a lot, a lot. So you've got a lot to pull from. And I'll also share my commitment, too, which is to make more asks. That's something I'm going to do, and I'm going to commit to posting that on LinkedIn as well. Hashtag transform her 2019. You want to use that when you post. So here are some things. Speak your mind. Lead by example. Share who you are and be accessible. Ruthless prioritization. Take vacations. Practice self-care. Check in with others. Smash the glass ceiling. Learn the trade secrets. It pays to have a good track record. Be brave. Move in tribes. Have the conversation. Be visible. Reframe the narrative. And own your truth. Okay. All right. So I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all of the amazing people that made today possible. So I have my paper here because I don't want to forget anyone at all. So forgive me for this, but I really do want to express the gratitude because it's meant a lot to me to have you all here. I want to thank our amazing media productions team for keeping us jamming and making us look fabulously lit the whole time. Thank you so much. I also want to thank our heroine, Jenna Dempsey, for her tireless effort and attention to detail in making this event come to life. I want to point out that the behind-the-scenes effort to produce Transform Her is a 100% volunteer effort. Each of the volunteers on the Transform Her team participates in addition to their day job. So I'm beyond grateful to the Transform Her team. You know who you are. I know you, and I love you. We, can't, we love you. I'm, chan I'm channeling Amanda. I love, I love you. I, I love that. Okay. Okay, so I want to thank I want to thank them for their blood, sweat, and tears. Hopefully, there wasn't too much like blood and tears, right? Any, anyway, <laughs> sweat is okay. All right. So I also want to thank my Transform Her co-founder Ezra Zimbler. Ezra, I know you're watching on the live stream. I wish you were here. Ezra is one of the best allies that any woman could wish for. He was a white man within the leadership team of our black inclusion group. He couldn't be here today, but I know he's watching and sending his well wishes, and it couldn't have been possible without his significant effort. I want to say, also want to thank my family and my husband, Brian, who is in the audience today. He knows firsthand what it looks like to work on an event like this, and I love you, Brian. Thank you so much for supporting me. Okay. Finally, thank you to LinkedIn creating the space for this conversation and our diversity, inclusion, and belonging team. It is LinkedIn's top priority, in case you did not get that today. So I want to thank you all, and I want to have everyone come up and continue the conversation. We're going to do some networking. We've got some food, some drinks. So look forward to seeing you all there, and also look forward to seeing you at the next Transform Her. Thank you so much. <laughs>